Good morning. Good morning. I would now like to call the May 16th, 2022 meeting of the Community and Public Services Committee to order. And I will start by acknowledging that the place on which we are gathered today is the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory. And we thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, including the Cree, the Dene, the Soto, the Nakota Sioux and Blackfoot peoples. And we also acknowledge this as the Métis homeland and home of the largest concentration of Inuit south of the 60th parallel. This has long been a welcoming place for all peoples who come from around the world to share Edmonton as a home. Together we call upon all of our collective honoured traditions and spirits to work in building a great city for today and for future generations. I'm going to start with a roll call of committee members. Councillor Jans. Here. Councillor Tang. Good morning. Councillor Wright. Okay, we'll come back to Councillor Wright. And I see Mayor Sohi has joined us as well. Good morning. And we are, good morning, Mayor Sohi. And we're joined by uh, many other councillors. I'll try to catch you all. Uh, Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Principe. Good morning. Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Councillor Hamilton. Good, good morning. Councillor Paquette. I see him, but I cannot hear him, so I'm sure that'll clear up in a moment. Yeah, good morning. Take a bit to get settled. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Rice. Good morning. And I think that's all. Good morning. My mic is working now, I think. Very good. All right. Uh, well, thank you all for joining us today for, these, uh, for this very important conversation. Uh, I would take a motion to adopt the agenda. Perhaps I'll move that because I have it in front of me. So I'll move that we adopt the May 16th, 2022 Community and Public Services Committee meeting agenda with the following changes. 6-1, additions of 6-1, Safer for All Strategy, Community Safety, Wellbeing, Inclusion, and Anti-Racism. 6.2, Community Safety and Wellbeing Strategy. 6.3, Community Safety and Wellbeing Methodology and Results. And 6-4, Connect Edmonton Next Steps, Community Safety and Well-Being and Edmonton's Healthy City Goal. Please vote on adoption of the agenda. Yes for me. Thank you, Councillor Tang. And yes for me as well. Thank you, Councillor Wright. And we're just missing one vote. Mayor Sohi? Yes for me as well. Thank you. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That is carried. Uh, approval of the minutes. I take a motion for approval of the minutes. So moved. Thank you, Councillor Wright. And those are the minutes of the April 25th, 2022 meeting of this committee. Please vote. Yes. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. And we're just. Yes, for me as well. Thank you, Councillor Wright. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That is carried. Uh, protocol items. I am not aware of any. Seeing none, we'll move along to selection of items for debate. Uh, I will start while the speakers list come up uh, with 6-1, 6, 6, 6 and 6-4. Uh, Mayor Sohi? Just give me one second. Uh, okay. I would like to select uh, six, six, six point six. Six, six. Yeah. Uh, takers for six point five. Oh, you are. I'm sorry, there, Councillor. Councillor there are speakers. There are speakers on that. So there is. Uh, yep. Yep. Councillor Jans is going to select it, Mayor Sohi. Oh, got it. And that's all the items. So thank you. Uh, to my committee colleagues, uh, re vote on selector for debate. There are none, so we'll move to requests to speak. Uh, now, I'm going to... Oh, just a second.
Yeah, we'll move to request to speak. That's fine. So I'll move the, that the Community and Public Services Committee hear from the following speakers and panels where appropriate. Uh, item 6-1, uh, Haroon Ali and Shalini Sina. On items 6-2, 6-3 and 6-4, uh, Pilar Mart Martinez from the Edmonton Public Library, Punita McBrien from the Edmonton Downtown Business Association. Uh, number three, Joseph Gabran from Gabran Enterprises. Uh, uh, number four, Les Hagen from Action on Smoke, Smoking and Health Organization. Number five, Haroon Ali. Number six, Pamela Brown. Number seven, Luis Hugo Franceschetti from Bridge Healing. Uh, number eight, Han Leong from the Chinatown Transformative Collaboration Society. Number nine, Charlene Oborowski from the Edmonton Police Foundation. Number 10, Stacey Zadi from the Downtown Recovery Coalition. Number 11, Tanya LaRiviere from the Accessibility Advisory Committee. 12, Funmi Omole from the Women's Advocacy Voice of Edmonton. Number 13, Catherine O'Neill from the YWCA Edmonton. 14, Sharif Haji from the Africa Centre. Uh, 15, uh, Hanson Shu. 16, Ayesha Efron, Irfan, pardon me, from the City of Edmonton Youth Council. 17, Elaine Jones from Edmonton Public Library to answer questions only. Uh, 18, Deb Rhodes from Edmonton Public Library to answer questions only. 19, Stacey Levitt-Wright from the Jewish Federation of Edmonton. Number 20, Shalini Sina from the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee. Uh, and 21, Laura Cunningham-Shepley from the Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues. And on item 6-5, uh, Elaine Solez from the Friends of Skona Rec, uh, Katrina Semenuk from Friends of Skona Rec, Jeff Papineau from Friends of Skona Rec, and Kim Clegg from Queen Alexandra Community League. Please vote on hearing from those speakers. We're just missing one vote, Councillor Wright. Uh, yes, it's not coming up, the votes for me, so I'm a yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. Uh, now to the clerk. I believe there's a request. Uh, the agenda calls for uh, 6-2, 6-3, and 6-4 to be heard together and to be dealt with, um, I believe this first item is bi of business. I, there's a request to add 6.1 to that as well. Is that correct? That is my understanding. The presentation for the items is encompasses six one, six two, six three, and six four. So, do we need a motion to? I guess we do. So, yes. I'll move that we hear item uh, six one along with items six two, six three, and six four together. Please vote. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Wright. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that is carried, and I will note that the two speakers uh, registered for 6-1 are also registered for 6-2, 6-3, and 6-4, so uh, they'll have their opportunity at that time. Uh, we also have a request uh, for time specific for item 6.5. Um, given the number of speakers we have on the first four items collectively, I think that's going to take most of the day. Uh, so let's revisit the time request, time specific request at 1 o'clock, pardon me, at 1.30. There's been time reserved for tomorrow to continue the meeting tomorrow. We haven't changed orders of the day yet, but that's a possibility. Um, perhaps we can do something to uh, allow those speakers to speak at a specific time. But I'm reluctant to do that right now because I don't want to see us bouncing back and forth between items. I'd like us to do the first four items, have our conversations, and get that to uh, a point of what's going up to Council next week and, and come to some final decisions on that. Mr. Chair. Your mic's probably on your computer. There you go. Mr. Chair, would you consider moving it as a time specific for tomorrow morning then? So then the, I believe the guests could then go home and come. Well, I'm, I'm, we might get to it today. Okay. That's all. And so we'll, let's just see where we're at at, uh, at noon, if we could. Very good. That then takes us to items 6-1 through 6-4, and uh, there's an administration presentation to be made. So over to you, Mr. Um, Corbett. May I, I apologize? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Councillor Inquiries would have been next up in our... Oh, 
Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Councillor Wright does have an inquiry. My apologies, Councillor Wright. I jumped ahead of you. Councillor Inquiries. Councillor I, I, I do, and I'm just trying to find it in my um, emails here. I'm sorry. Um, can I actually postpone that till, till later on until I do locate it? Yeah, we can come back. Yep. Yes, thank you. Are there any other Councillor Inquiries? Very good. Mr. Corbell. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel, and good day, committee members. And I think it has to be said, go Oilers. Uh, joining me today in the delegation is Salima Ibrahim, Ibrahim, our City Chief of Staff, Jennifer Flamin, our Deputy City Manager of Community Services, and Lisa Kardosh, our Acting Director of Community Initiatives with REACH Edmonton. I am pleased to present the Community Safety and Wellbeing Strategy to committee today. Before we discuss the strategy, I want to express my appreciation. We released a lot of information last week and the timelines for you to review the material were shorter than I would have liked and this meant extra effort for everyone and I appreciate that you dug into it and ready to discuss today. Now to the strategy, it is developed based on a combination of research, a review of existing data and reports and input from community members and service providers. The community safety and well-being strategy is a citywide comprehensive plan to building a safe city and an inclusive city guided by Connect Edmonton and our city plan. It provides a roadmap to support a more connected and coordinated approach to safety and well-being, and a model for collaboration, planning, and action that helps determine how we respond to the current and emerging issues in our community. This roadmap, if we get it right, will allow our city to be stronger and more stable. It can give all Edmontonians a chance to improve their quality of life, it improves livability and cohesion, enhances economic competitiveness and productivity, and will build a more resilient Edmonton. At its core, the strategy envisions that each person at Edmonton feels like they belong, that they are connected to the land and the community, and that they have the opportunity to build a good life here. People want to live in a community where they thrive and belong. As it stands right now, this is not always the case. There are barriers that prevent people who call Edmonton home from achieving these connections. These barriers are rooted in systemic challenges that prevent equitable access to resources such as housing, safety, and community relationships. Community safety and well-being is important and this strategy supports safe and healthy communities through a strategic, community-based approach to address root causes of social issues. This approach recognizes that safety and well-being cannot be addressed in isolation by any one organization or any one sector. The CSWB is a system-wide strategy and approach. It provides city with a working roadmap to be inclusive, connected, and more coordinated, and is comprised of three main elements. First, a proposed framework consisting of seven pillars that set the focus of measurable actions, investments, and partnerships to achieve the city's incremental, moderate, and transformational outcomes. When properly resourced, the framework will allow more people to feel safe, empowered, and supported as individuals. Second, an intentional approach for working with members of the Edmonton community to identify priorities, potential actions, or investment opportunities, some of which you'll see today. Third, an evaluation framework built on moving the dial on system-wide outcomes, measuring progress or not, and then using that measurement to adjust the plan as we go. Its success is, shared, is a shared responsibility in a larger ecosystem. This ecosystem includes, but is not limited to, community involvement and advancement, social services, business sectors, and other orders of government. We recognize that this strategy needs to continue to evolve to meet the changing needs of our community. This is part of a broader commitment as our efforts to become a more compassionate, inclusive, and inclusive city will be ongoing. This is not easy work, but it's very important work. The challenges before us are significant and the problems are complex. What we are proposing is broad and it is about a long-term change in our communities. The strategy lays the groundwork for administration to work with community partners, so social service providers, and other orders of government together in a coordinated and a collaborative way to promote the safety and well-being of all people in Edmonton. The strategy builds on existing municipal and community strengths and assets while also addressing gaps and challenges that particularly affect the more vulnerable members of our population. 
The strategy identifies specific goals and objectives that we hope to achieve or make progress in over the short to medium or to longer term. It is also adaptable, allowing us to respond to emerging needs in our communities in a more proactive manner. As we build for a city of 2 million people and welcome people from around the world into our city, Edmonton, Edmonton needs to adjust to changing demographics, needs, and desires. As part of the city plan, Edmontonians identified six guiding values to articulate how they want to experience their future city. They want to belong, live, thrive, access, preserve, and create. This strategy highlights ways to achieve those experiences for everyone. Further, the strategy is aligned to the strategic goal of Healthy City in Connect Edmonton, where the goal is for Edmonton to be a neighborly city with community and personal wellness that embodies and promotes equity for all Edmontonians. The strategy is aligned to and supports the longer-term outcomes identified in Connect Edmonton and the city plan. We are here today looking for the committee's support to recommend approval of the committee community safety and well-being strategy to council. In addition, we are seeking direction on investments on select business cases and funding allocation for imminent action now in this fiscal year. Before we get into the details of the strategy, I just want to show you some of the council direction and decisions that have shaped our work. This is a culmination of work that started in 2020 with public hearings. They were a really important conversation that administration and Edmontonians needed to hear. From that, City Council stood up a task force. Since then, you have seen multiple reports come Council's way, including the Safer for All report and the response the Edmonton Police Commission and Administration developed to it. Since our first response, the Edmonton Police Commission and Administration have done further work on the actions which you, you will see in the response we provided to the Safer for All strategy in one of these four reports. Since then, much more has taken place, such as Council's first motion on developing an anti-racism strategy, which we brought to you in February. I also want to underline that work in community safety and well-being is not new. This business, this is a business we have been in and operationally uh, every day, whether it's working on issues like problem properties or working with partners on developing after school programs. What is new, however, is a system-wide strategy and interconnectedness for CSWB. We are also pleased to have two senior executive advisors in the city manager's office now dedicated to advancing the anti-racism strategy and the indigenous framework and the calls to action in the truth and reconciliation report. All of this and much more have now been built into our community safety and well-being strategy. The broader strategy reflects over 80 different voices from approximately 40 different organizations. Informing and engaging the community throughout the planning process was a critical piece of developing the strategy. Administration met with Edmontonians, people with lived experiences, accessing social and health services, the business community, educational institutions, service providers and service planning tables to make sure we listened to as many diverse perspectives as we had in the time available. The conversations included walking them through the proposed strategy, getting feedback on whether community could see themselves in it and inviting feedback on the pillars, both in terms of how they were defined and whether we were capturing the work appropriately. If the strategy is approved by Council, we will be engaging further and deeper. We also acknowledge that many of the people we spoke to are marginalized and don't usually have the space to speak to these topics. Therefore, there is a level of urgency to these conversations, which I appreciate. I also want to tell organizations, all of you, that we have time. Your voice is important and should the strategy get passed, we will have time for more fulsome discussions that will continue to adapt the strategy. We know we haven't been able to talk to everyone and we will continue to invite people into our conversations. This is very much intended to be an iterative, agile and equitable approach. One that, city, that is city led, but community driven. This timeline is also intended to give a preview of what we are thinking for next steps post May 24th. We aren't working on CSWB in isolation. This work obviously folds into broader work and funding considerations and so we are being mindful of that as we start to develop our next four year budget cycle and that work is already underway. 
The CSWB report details the robust, robust strategy to address the seven most significant systemic issues that people in our city face. This report is cross-referenced with a report that defines our larger goal of becoming the safest city in Canada by 2030 and a report that details the methodology guiding our approach to that. I'll now ask Ms. Ibrahim to discuss our response to the Safer for All report. Thank you. The Safer for All strategy report responds to two motions. One, working with the Edmonton Police Commission to review the Safer for All recommendations to develop a joint strategy to enhance community safety and well-being. And number two, working with ARAC, the Edmonton Police Commission, and additional BIPOC stakeholders to, to provide actionable data points and outcomes with respect to the 14 task force recommendations. When these motions were made, the narrative of community safety and well-being centered primarily on the work of the task force. In our discussions with other partners, both internally and externally, it was apparent that the definition of community safety and well-being was much broader and needed to be defined to be better understood. The community safety and well-being task force was a valuable in input into administration's safety and well-being response. It has spurred conversations about our programs and services, our policies, and our role as a municipality in making Edmonton a safer city for all Edmontonians. Specific to the motion about actionable data points and outcomes with respect to the 14 task force recommendations, the report offers two attachments. Attachment one outlines City of Edmonton administration's initiatives and actions since the task force report was published in Q1 2021. The attachment references work across the organization that relates to the task force recommendations. While there are too many to list within the presentation, work spans across the administration and includes initiatives such as the Community Outreach Transit Team, Recover, changes in hiring, training and recruitment practices, diversity on agencies, boards and commissions, the zoning bylaw renewal and the public washroom strategy. In total, there are 21 distinct initiatives that we have highlighted in the attachment with 68 specific actions and outcomes. Attachment 2 is a coordinated response from the Edmonton Police Commission and the Edmonton Police Service and provides commentary on all recommendations offered by the task force. Finally, the report outlines the conversations conducted with various agencies and organizations over the past several months. In response to the task force recommendations, conversations occurred with organizations such as the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee, Bentero Traditional Healing Society, Oil Street Community Services, the City of Edmonton Youth Council, and Homeward Trust. We also met with mutual aid organizations such as Bear Clan, Boots on the Ground, Harm Reduction Support, uh, and Water Warriors YAG. Overall, these conversations are about making Edmonton a safer city and building relationships with our partners in the community to achieve this role together. Conversations with each of these groups looked slightly different. For example, with ARAC, initial discussions took place in December 2021, requesting feedback on our engagement process, feedback on our questions, and how ARAC wants to be engaged. Discussions were then paused till April, as we acknowledged the significant work that that committee took on to bring the anti-racism strategy to life. However, it does become clear to us that through this process, conversations uh, and clarity requiring what co-collaboration actually looks like do need to be developed. I will turn it back over to Mr. Corbold. Sorry, Mr. Corbold. Sorry, thank you. Um, the graphic on this slide, which we walked all the city council through and a number of stakeholders through, outlines the seven pillars of the proposed community safety and well-being framework. This framework has been informed by city council direction the task force recommendations and community conversations with over 80 voices representing very diverse organizations. We have used Connect Edmonton defi to define our larger goal and the city plan to show us the way to get there, which is why they are highlighted on the top of this slide. These seven pillars are anti-racism, reconciliation, safe and inclusive spaces, equitable policies, procedures, standards, and guidelines, with emphasis on equitable, preventing pathways into poverty and finding pathways out of poverty, crime prevention and crisis intervention, and finally, well-being. Although the framework is city-led, community collaboration takes place within each pillar. This means in order to advance the strategy and partnership with community, an iterative, integrated, and equitable approach must be taken with each pillar. 
The CSWB strategy is meant to be dynamic and adaptive to evolving, to evolving community needs. These pillars influence, influence each other in many ways, so we need to address them with a system-wide approach that is underpinned by Gender-Based Analysis Plus. To accomplish this work, the City is going to be working with all of its stakeholders and partners who have a space in the CSWB ecosystem. A full list of, of who we spoke to can be found in Attachment 5 of the Strategy Report. However, this is the first of many conversations to come. These pillars cover many action items which can be carried out by administration, our partners and together with community to achieve incremental two, or two years or less, moderate the next three to four years and transformational five years and beyond outcomes. They are outlined in attachment two of the report and I will review them shortly. Outcomes will be achieved through actions that were tested against six principles, including safety or well-being focused, equity based, person-centered, community-led, data-informed, and trauma-informed. Broader transformation may take several years, but we believe it's possible. Many of the actions are already underway. Recent examples include our work on minimum standards for shelters, outreach workers in the transit system, and homeless and the homeless, homeless encampment response. Other actions are new, and we will always collaborate, be inclusive, and engage. Over 80 leaders in the community and community members were consulted during the development of this strategy. This is a very healthy start to a process that will continue as the strategy evolves to respond to changes in community needs. Administration collaborated with many individuals, some representing their personal lived experience and some representing organizations. The breadth of these partners provided diverse perspectives and experiences from across Edmonton. Should Council approve the strategy, conversations with community partners must and will continue. We will continue to walk alongside our community partners in defining the needs and actions of the strategy. We must continue working in collaboration with partners in the community to eliminate racism, make clear progress towards truth and reconciliation, improve equity, and end poverty. When more peop people feel safe, empowered, and supported as individuals, everyone in the city will benefit. Any decisions, any programs, and any actions we take are intended to accomplish the long-term outcomes uh, to the pillars, which are listed on this slide. These long-term outcomes have been tested, refined, and validated through several rounds of conversations with community partners. It is important that everyone can see themselves in the outcomes, and if we are going to move the dial on these pillars, it requires everyone working together in the same direction. The City is working on launching a public-facing dashboard to track progress against the framework, and this dashboard would be released in Q4 of 2022. The community safety and well-being strategy will rely on a methodology which, which puts community at the center of the work. Uh, the, meth the methodology is very comprehensive and is primarily threefold. First, root cause analysis. What we know is that the community health is integral to crime prevention. We need to back up our methodology to better learn and unpack the root causes that places people in a vulnerable position. These vulnerabilities can include such things as equitable access to housing, job skills training, access to places to develop a sense of community and belonging, and language. By understanding these barriers, which are essentially the root causes to the systemic issues we are seeing, we can better develop a framework that makes it clearer what initiatives we need to invest in to address poverty, disempowerment, peer pressure, substance abuse, and other root causes of social disorder, crime, and violence. It is critical to highlight that social challenges are full community challenges, not solely the city's responsibility or purview to resolve. It will take all of us pulling in the same direction to move the needle and the, tackle these root causes. An interjurisdictional scan. This includes extensive new research and reviews of existing programs such as REACH and Recover. The scan examined Canada's six major cities along with some municipalities in the United States that have demonstrated success in the CSWB space. This component has been uh, pointing to two important considerations. That Edmonton is a leader in the space within Canada and that data collection in the space is still in its infancy across North America. Answering this motion in a way that says if you invest so many dollars or so many millions in this program, you decrease calls to police by 30%, as an example, 
is really difficult and just isn't available today. So we will invite Council to hold us accountable to the incremental, moderate and transformational outcomes that we have proposed for each of these pillars. Those were identified through logic models and change narratives. Each pillar in the CSWB strategy has a logic model that describes incremental, moderate and transformational outcomes. Next steps on logic models will be to further refine them. A dashboard is currently under development and will be released in, to the public in Q4 of 2022. The dashboard will display the progress towards outcomes, including the 2030 goal to become the safest city in Canada. A couple of other things I'd like to bring to your attention. We plan to use socioeconomic factors as part of our evaluation. These factors are monitored to track progress over the mid to long term as well as provide opportunities to course correct when we need to. Factors identified as directly related to outcomes in the CSWB space will be included in the dashboard and are also reported in other channels like the City Plan and Connect Edmonton for example. Many of our partners use and report on these same measures. In the methodologies report we will also be sure to align the work with REACH with sorry with REACH that has been doing work in this space. They have a robust methodology and are examining potential social returns on investment. In Edmonton, we are fortunate to have an example of this work in practice, and we have Lisa Kardosh, Acting Director of Community Initiatives from REACH here with us today. Lisa has been kind enough to share information with us and has volunteered to be part of our delegation here today to walk us through programming at REACH and the social value investing in intervention. I'll now turn it over to Lisa. Thank you. Um, on behalf of everyone at REACH, I want to thank and congratulate City Administration for putting together this comprehensive report. REACH is Edmonton's Council for Safe Communities, and we're thrilled anytime community safety is highlighted. REACH has the ability to be responsive and nimble in bringing organizations and community together to tackle community safety related issues, like our unfunded neighborhood work in Macaulay that has been expanding to many communities across the city. And we've been able to support innovative prototypes like Recovers So Loss. As an organization that the city created ahead of its time, that was the only entity of its kind for years and is now being emulated in other Canadian cities, I wanted to share some things that REACH has learned over the years. One is that intervention is essential to improving safety and well-being. The report mentions that the crisis diversion um, collaboration that REACH convenes and coordinates and that's perhaps our most recognized, publicly recognized initiative so I won't talk too much about that but you have, if you have questions um, I'm happy to address those. 24-7 Crisis Diversion is an intervention based program and there's no doubt that trauma informed intervention and harm reduction measures are essential for creating safer communities. Intervention is critical for short-term solutions that places like our downtown core needs as businesses and the overall eco economy recovers from impacts of COVID-19. Well-trained police are also crucial intervention. Police can provide a natural place for social supports to intervene as we are starting to see through the Safer Way Out project. We also know that intervention programs often come with a higher price tag and cost to the public than prevention-based programs. Two is that we know prevention works. The Community Safety and Wellbeing Report smartly points out that we need a combination of both prevention and intervention programs. It's well established that prevention pr works and REACH has seen this as evidenced in evaluation from programs like All In For Youth and the OST and OST Bridging Together initiative um, where out of school time community based programs were funded year round to support newcomer children and youth. If you look at the two SRI figures on the slide, we can see that there's greater social return on investment on the prevention program, which is in the, which is the case, in this case it's bridging together, um, meaning that society saves more as a long-term investment. REACH has been working for the past 12 years to make Edmonton a safer city, and we know that this must be done um, by working with one another, with communities in the center of solutions. Everyone knows that negative life experiences like attending a high delinquency rate school, living in a neighborhood with high levels of crime, or having high A scores increases the chance of delinquency later in life. And that we need to continue 
uh, to invest further into programs that address these. The more exposure a youth has to social programs upstream, the less cost to the justice system and society downstream. Three is that we know to evaluate and be data informed. We try to be data informed in everything we do and we know that evaluation methods like SROI, developmental evaluation and knowledge development are all important to show impact. And sometimes it's a blended approach that works best for the program. We've invested in a data engineer who leads data-based development at REACH and has supported the city and community collaboratives like ELIP. Four is we know that we need to work together. Improving community safety and well-being is complex with many intersectionalities, so we support and participate in national networks like Canadian Municipal Crime Network and international movements like Peace in Our Cities. In fact, Working collaboratively was one of the main reasons REACH was created, to be the backbone support or the coordinating body for collaboratives, a role we take on time and time again. If you do want to hear more about the work of REACH, REACH is doing a lunch and learn for counselors on June 9th, um, and we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Behind each of the seven pillars are business cases and logic models. As noted, we conducted an environmental scan and hosted community conversations to inform the desired outcomes for each pillar. Given the time we had, the long-term outcomes on a previous slide were tested with community stakeholders. Those conversations informed administration's efforts to build logic models that outline the resources, the activities, partnerships that are needed to achieve these outcomes. Logic models describe incremental, two years or less, moderate, next three to four years, and transformational, five years and beyond outcomes. The models recognize the same changes can be expected to occur immediately while broader transformation may take several years, but it is possible. The logic models are intended to reflect the equitable approach for the framework where adjustments can be made to actions in order to adapt to changing social conditions and community needs. In the process of building these logic models, certain gaps were identified. There are some key areas where we need to take action in order to make progress towards the outcomes that were identified by community. We also developed business cases to outline the actions which would be most effective. To be clear, we discussed the longer term outcomes with community. We did not discuss logic models and these detailed businesses, business cases as yet. These reflect our best advice about where the city can act within our areas of responsibility. As we go forward, we will be discussing more logic models and additional elements with community and we will be discussing how to evaluate the results we achieve together so we can adjust as necessary. The evaluate, evaluation framework provides a framework for monitoring and reporting on the CSWB activities. It includes indicators, measurable pieces of information for the outcomes in each pillar and how indicator data will be collected. Now this next slide shows just a representative example of what a dashboard might look like. The logic models and business cases, if approved by council, will both be key to inputs that inform the creation of the dashboard to track our progress on the identified outcomes. You will recall that as part of our work that we did with COVID, we used specific measures of vaccination, unemployment, transit ridership, pedestrian traffic, recreation activity, development permits, and building permit value, and pulled the, all that together into one single com composite measure of our COVID recovery. We would propose the same approach here, measuring our results on each of the seven pillars and pulling those results together into a single aggregate community safety and well-being measure to help us track our progress. The data that will inform these scores can be sourced from a mix of internal city data, stats can, socioeconomic data, data from our partners uh, at the Government of Alberta. We can include measures uh, like socioeconomic indicators, crime severity, feelings of personal safety, income equality, poverty rates, or numbers of drug poisonings. Work is underway to identify the best measures to use and we propose to have a preliminary information online by the end of the year. Using this dashboard, we are prepared to publicly report how we are moving the needle on this file and to create a shared understanding of our progress on community-defined outcomes. And we also uh, we intend to demonstrate uh, complete transparency in the data through this process. Now, the community safety and well-being work is supported through various funding sources. Community safety and well-being services are currently supported through the city's existing operating budget, includes services provided through community safety, 
bylaw enforcement, housing and homelessness, community and neighborhood capacity building, and of course Edmonton Police Services to name a few. In addition to this, administration is continually exploring other potential sources of funding. This would include grants from other orders of government. For instance, through the federal government, we have leveraged and will continue to leverage the Rapid Housing Initiative funding to help with supportive housing. And we are currently discuss in discussions to secure funding through the Building Safer Communities Fund to assist with some of our CSWB initiatives. We continue to work with the province to assist in this important area of work. Previously, the city has leveraged funds through the Provincial Municipal Stimulus Program to rehabilitate and upgrade existing affordable housing buildings. Finally, we do have funds available for the CSWB ecosystem through EPS funds held in financial strategies. As of today, 8.4 million of these funds are available in 2022. As part of the strategy presented to you today, administration is recommend, recommending the use of these funds for 10 specific business cases, all of which have citywide impact. The use of these funds are for a combination of one-time and ongoing items, which would exhaust funds from 2022 while still providing council with flexibility for funding in future years, depending on how future budget discussions unfold. And of course, if council approves the strategy. Funding decisions for CSWB purposes for 2022 should be limited to the 8.4 million available in EPS funds within financial strategies. Funding decisions for 23 to 26 should be done alongside the overall 23 to 26 budget deliberations later this fall. Now this table on this slide provides a glimpse of some funds used towards community safety and well-being from the EPS funding reallocated to financial strategies. Many of these funding decisions were approved by Council in the Fall 2021 Supplementary Operating Budget Adjustment Process, although others were recently approved after recent discussions on problem properties at committee uh, last month. Funds have been allocated towards important partners and initiatives such as our Anti-Racism Strategy, Transit Safety Plan, End Poverty Edmonton, REACH and Recover. I must emphasize, however, that the investments shown here uh, through funds held in financial strategies repre represent only a small fraction of total funding and work that the city contributes towards the CSWB space. Just to name a few other examples, Council recently allocated over $860,000 towards homelessness and encampment response strategies, doubled down on the intergovernmental advocacy for a compassionate and comprehensive solution for drug poisoning, and as I mentioned earlier, secured supports from other orders of government including funding announced earlier this year towards rapid housing projects in the city. Council put aside nearly 22 million from the police budget that has been slowly drawn down. We have 8.4 million available to allocate and the business cases provide council with a range of initiatives to use these funds. These business cases are based on recognition of community needs through conversations with community or are in response to concerns raised in the Safer for All report or in the case of the Indigenous Framework, represent administration's internal efforts. The 10 business cases outlined as part of the recommendation are listed on this slide and in attachment three of the strategy report. These business cases will help bring the strategy to life and implement action on the ground. They are based on Edmonton's needs, desired outcomes, action potential, uh, and potential actions, and learnings from other jurisdictions. The cases listed on the slide are the ones that administration identified as emerging priorities that will solve immediate needs and are directly related to the 2022 budget and the available funds of 8.4 million. Each business case includes a brief description and a justification section that outlines the expected benefit and the rationale, as well as details on cost, whether the investment is incremental in nature, moderate or transformational. And some business cases have multiple options. I'll now ask Deputy City Manager Flamin to dis discuss implementation. Thank you. For the recommended business cases that are approved by Council, funding will be allocated quickly to roll out the actions in these business cases as we implement this work over the course of 2022. In addition, we will continue ongoing conversations with community partners to refine our approach going forward. Administration will also use the direction provided by Council to build subsequent proposals for the 2023-26 budget discussions. Administration will collaborate with our partners to develop a dashboard that tracks our progress towards the outcomes identified for each of the seven pillars in the Community Safety and Wellbeing Strategy. Our plan is to launch this dashboard in the fourth quarter of 2022. 
In two days, you will also hear about administration's response to the topic of police funding. We are happy to take questions on that on Wednesday. Today, we are here to request your endorsement of the strategy and the business cases only. In summary, we are here today seeking that the Community and Public Services Committee recommend to City Council, one, that the Community Safety and Wellbeing Strategy be recommended to Council for approval, and two, that the adjustments to the 2022 and 2023 operating budget for the recommended business cases be approved using funding from the Edmonton Police Services Funds within financial strategies. Thank you. We sincerely thank the many community partners, staff, Edmontonians, and those with lived experience that have come forward to inform and develop this strategy. We're looking forward to working collaboratively alongside the community to accomplish our shared goals and continue to enhance safety and well-being. We must continue to take action so that more Edmontonians can live, belong, access, create, preserve, and thrive in our city. In alignment with the city plan and Connect Edmonton, we need a robust strategy that coordinates our efforts with partners to create lasting change, and we look forward to your comments. While this is a strategy, we are continue to action many things every day. We continue to do so, and the next glimpse of this you will receive next week at Council when we present updated actions on LRT safety. Today, though, is about longer-term strategy. Now, I must express apologies, but we continue to feel intense pressure about the need to consult and collab collaborate, and so I want to express some apologies on the timing of the release of this report. We try hard to collaborate on pillars and actions within pillars, but co-collaboration is a two-way street that requires both entities to be active and collaborative at the table. The intense pressure to consult is combined with an intense pressure to meet very aggressive timelines. And because we need to act with urgency in our community safety and we cannot wait too long to be implementing. As city manager, I alone accept full responsibility to, for the decisions on the report release last week. I had a deadline to meet, but I wanted to the best report possible within the timeline available. Staff have been working day and night, seven days a week, during doing their best to get this right, in often challenging circumstances with some partners and sometimes at great risk to their own psychological safety. I sincerely apologize to anyone who was inconvenienced by the timing of report completion and release last week in relation to this meeting today. And with that, we would be happy to continue listening to those who chose to speak today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Corbold, for that presentation. We'll now hear from speakers. Uh, I'm going to first ask the clerk if we've, had, if we've had any further registrations. None no? that I'm aware of. Okay. So we have our list of 21. Um, we have a combination of uh, in-person and remote. So we're going to ask that uh, those of you that are in chamber today to speak to come down to the front row uh, of microphone uh, cubicles here, including where Mr. Crowbold and his team were just sitting. Uh, in what order? I'm not sure. Uh, I can read them off. Maybe I'll do that. So in, in seat number one, uh, Pilar Martinez. And number one is stage left. Uh, seat number two, Panita McBrien. Seat three would be Les Hagen. Seat four would be Haroon Ali. One. Okay. Okay, sorry, Ms. Madam Clerk. Uh, five would be Pamela Brown. Six would be Hon Leong. Sorry if I'm getting your name wrong. Seven will be Charlene Oborowski. Eight will be Stacy Zadie. Nine will be Elaine Jones.
10 will be Deb Rhodes. And that's all we have in, pro in person. And we'll be bouncing back and forth. I, while you're getting seated, it's really great to see so many people here. Uh, it's fantastic. <laughs> Feels like old times in a way. So. Okay, so uh, let me uh, just uh, provide some uh, clarity and instruction on speaking. So speakers will be heard in one panel. Each speaker will have five minutes to present. Uh, the clerk is going to run an official timer here in council chamber. And for those of you here, you'll see the timer lights on the podium at each end. Uh, green for the first four minutes, yellow for the fifth minute. Red means your five minutes are up. Uh, if you're participating virtually, you may wish to use a timer of your own. Uh, when everyone in the panels had a chance to present, members of council may ask questions of you or other panel members. For this reason, you may wish to remain in the meeting until all questions have been asked. If you're participating virtually, please remember to mute your microphone when you are not speaking. Uh, and of course, unmute it when you are speaking. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please reach out to the office of the city clerk using the contact information provided in your confirmation of registration or at city.clerk at edmonton.ca. Uh, I'll just as a, a note to those in uh, chamber today, as Edmonton transitions from provincial mask mandates in the city temporary mask bylaw, we ask visitors to council chamber to be kind and respectful to each other. You can wear a mask to protect yourself and those around you and please respect people's personal decisions around wearing masks. In the event of an emergency, please follow the clerk's directions to evacuate. City staff will direct you to your muster point. With that, we will begin. I'm going to be relatively strict on time. Um, and I would ask that we really try to focus comments today on the reports before us today. There is a conversation on Wednesday about uh, the police budget, just to state it plainly. So uh, specific comments and questions that are narrowly on the police budget or the police formula, that's a Wednesday thing. Today is the reports in front of us today. So there's a lot of overlap but let's try to, to narrow our conversation so we can get through our conversation today. Uh, with that, uh, Ms. Martinez, you are first. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much and good morning everybody and, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to supporting EPL's role in Edmonton's uh, community safety and well-being. And I too would like to commend Mr. Corbald and his team for the, uh, their work on this initiative. EPL is a vital educational, cultural, and social institution with extensive reach throughout our city, a fundamental welcoming public learning space and community hub for Edmontonians of all ages and from all backgrounds, EPL strives to support all citizens, including the littlest, through its community-led approach, building relationships and fostering social connection and well-being of Edmontonians. Next slide, please. EPL actively strengthens community safety and well-being. A focus on early literacy is one of EPL's key strategies to support literacy and lifelong learning in Edmontonians. One research study says poor reading skills correlate heavily with lack of employment, lower wages, and fewer opportunities for advance advancement. Significantly, worse reading skills are found among prisoners than in the general adult population and deficient readers are less likely to become active in civic and cultural life, most notably in volunteerism and voting. Another research report states, because high quality early childhood programs promote healthy development, they can generate savings by obviating the need for more expensive interventions later in a child's life. Next slide, please. Children need a strong start. The first five years is a critical time for developing a positive attitude towards learning and the skills needed for reading and success in school and life. Researchers have found that vocabulary and communication skills at 22 months predict educational quali qualifications at age 26. That's why support in early childhood is the best investment society can make to produce the highest rate of return. Next slide. COVID-19 has had a significant impact on our children. Research is showing concerning trends in disengagement, absenteeism, depression, anxiety, developmental delays, and learning loss. 
effects are uneven. E children who were already disadvantaged or struggling fell further behind. Everything EPL is hearing from Edmonton schools, Alberta Health Services, and other community partners underscores both the need and the urgency in addressing these health and literacy concerns. Next slide. EPL's Sing, Sign, Laugh and Learn is offered in partnership with Alberta Health Services Early Intervention Program. Designed for parents and caregivers and their children ages zero to three, this program is based on research and best practices in health, child development, communication and literacy. It's an inclusive class that helps all children develop vocabulary and communication skills, including children with developmental delays. The International Early Learning and Child Wellbeing Study found that children from even the most socially deprived home can thrive when they have sustained access to high quality, responsive learning environments. Since 2017, Sing Sign Laugh and Learn accounts for nearly one third of EPL's in-person program offerings and nearly half of our program attendance. Data trends from over seven years show that as we've increased class offerings, attendance increases follow. It is a highly cost-effective program at just over $3.90 per attendee per class with an exceptional rate of return. Next slide. The sooner EPL has the resources to meet the needs of all Edmonton families for community-based early literacy programming, the better we can set our youngest population for success. Well-being isn't only about preventing bad things from happening, it's also about ensuring good things happen. An additional $200,000 annually will allow EPL to expand its popular and highly regarded Sing Sign Laugh and Learn program, minimizing long-term negative impacts of COVID and increasing opportunities for Edmonton's children to develop into resilient, productive and educated lifelong learners. Next slide. This exceptionally cost-effective initiative is an investment in Edmonton's future, its youngest children, and would be a strong demonstration of the overall intention of the community safety and well-being strategy. If we are looking for transformational change and long-term sustainable impacts to address systemic barriers, investing in early literacy yields the highest rate of return. Next slide. More strong early literacy programming is needed to help more families in Edmonton thrive. However, EPL is also facing some immediate challenges with safety and security in several of our inner city branches, particularly the Milner branch. Milner experienced more incidents in the first quarter of this year than any other quarter on record, with a 79% increase compared to the first quarter of 2019 and a 40% increase in the rate of incidents averaging 5.8 incidents a day. We are experiencing extraordinary increases in physical altercations, property damage and theft, and customer distress. And that's when a customer needs medical or other support, has experienced an opioid poisoning and other type incidents. Like our downtown partners and members of the Downtown Recovery Coalition, EPL is dealing with urgent and pressing problems that need addressing. As a member of the Downtown Recovery Coalition, I also want to speak to the need for additional immediate support, which was communicated to Council a few months ago. Thanks, Madam, uh, Ms. Martinez. Sorry, uh, time's up. Okay. Maybe Thank some you. questions for you. Thank you. Uh, Ponita McBrien is next, and uh, after that, we'll have Joseph Gebran, who I believe is joining us remotely. Ms. McBrien, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to start, uh, sorry, my name is Panita McBrien, I'm with the Edmonton Downtown Business Association. Uh, I want to start by fully uh, supporting the community safety and well-being framework uh, and commending uh, Mr. Corbold and Ms. Ibrahim and, and the whole city manager's office and city administration for the work that went into this. Um, it's comprehensive, it addresses many of, or if not all, of the factors that we know lead to uh, the challenges of community safety that we're facing today. Um, what I do want to take some time to speak about today, though, is what we see as a very serious gap in the short term, two very serious gaps, in fact. Um, in the strategy, uh, microgrants are really identified as the only mechanism to address uh, short-term action. Um, and, and you're going to hear a lot um, uh, as the day goes on um, from several business owners and Edmontonians who are 
directly impacted by some very serious community safety challenges today. Uh, and they deserve to feel safe and, to f and free to exist peacefully and to make a living uh, in our downtown and in our core neighborhoods. I think we all agree on that. So the two major gaps um, that I want to talk about are, one, um, is a visible human scale law enforcement and outreach presence that deters harmful behavior and holds individuals accountable for harmful and criminal behavior. And two, is spaces for individuals who are in crisis, primarily those using meth, when they're causing harm to themselves and others. Those are the two gaps. Without those two things being addressed, frankly, yesterday, um, we're, we're in a very, very challenging situation in our core business districts. So the business case from administration for the short term is microgrants. Uh, microgrants can indeed be powerful for fast, low barrier solutions. In fact, um, many of you I think are aware, we just had a really big win in funding uh, an overdose response team with our partners at Boyle Street Community Services for downtown through the downtown vibrancy strategy, microgrants. So they are, they are a powerful tool for, for acting fast where we need to. We are developing a program, um, our new Downtown Safety Ambassadors program, which will have a different name. Um, but I imagine it's the kind of program that would be well suited to a microgrant. Um, but I just want to point out a couple things. Uh, one, the minimum amount of funding we would need to support and make this viable uh, is, is $150,000 to $250,000 in year one. Um, I don't know what micro grant means in terms of dollars, but I, I just hope that that council and administration is keeping in mind that the scale of funding that we need for solutions like this is, is pretty significant. Um, the other thing with a program like this that could be funded through micro grants is that it is absolutely essential to have law enforcement be a part of these solutions. Um, we can't we learned this firsthand through a prototype that we ran at, for a, an outreach program last year with Boyle Street Community Services and REACH and NET. Um, it, we can't keep our outreach workers safe if we're sending them out on their own. And so there are additional law enforcement resources required to match and ensure the, the success of these kinds of programs. Uh, briefly on community outreach transit teams, uh, I know we're not talking about that today, but it is a great model for the transit stations. I think based on what we're learning from other jurisdictions, what we want to see out on our streets, it's something we want to see um, pairing law enforcement with outreach. Um, but there are some serious downsides. Um, one, uh, from my understanding, the scaling up and expanding of that program has not moved quite as fast as everyone had hoped. Two, I don't know that we really have a proposal for what that's going to look like on our streets outside of transit. Uh, and three, uh, there's serious downsides to having those teams removed from patrol for extended periods of time because they're doing casework. So there's hours and hours where these teams aren't actively visible in transit because they're taking folks to appointments and to, to get support. So again, the scale of, of what we need here is, is pretty significant. That's all I, I wanted to share today, um, really those two key gaps, visible human scale law enforcement and outreach presence, and two safe spaces for people who are causing harm. Uh, I don't want to hear again from a business owner or an Edmontonian that someone got picked up because they were wielding a knife and then dropped off three blocks away. So I'm hoping we can have a very serious focused discussion today about what council is willing and able to do to address these very serious concerns in the immediate future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McBrien. Uh, next we have Joseph Gebrun, or Gebrun, apologies for that, who's joining us remotely, and followed by Les Hagen, who I don't see here, so maybe joining us remotely as well. Joseph. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to speak with, with us today. Uh, my name is Joseph Gibran. I'm born and raised Edmontonian, and I'm a local entrepreneur who has owned and operated four McDonald's restaurants over the past six years. One in Kingsway, two in the downtown core, and one in the central west part of Edmonton. Throughout my lifetime of experience in my home of Edmonton, I've never known it to be a place where safety and is, has become an overriding concern. That is until I began doing business in some of these areas especially the Kingsway area. Uh, I felt compelled to come forward today, as I know there's been much discussion on community safety, well-being, and all of the strategies that I've heard about are wonderful strategies. 
and are very important, and I look forward to seeing them come to fruition. Um, one of the things that I felt I needed to talk about was that between then and now, between the time these come, come to fruition and now, um, Edmonton is an unsafe place, very unsafe. And we really need to ensure that um, proper support to Edmonton Police Service is there while these transitions are being made. I know that the city, city council, all of us are frustrated and would like to find a better way to forward. Um, but let's remember, there's, between the short term and the medium term, there's the immediate, um, there, there's now. Um, um, we want to look for permanent solutions. Um, and one neighborhood, the Kingsway area, is, has especially difficult social and safety challenges. Um, we've done, uh, me and many other businesses have done significant partnering between EPS, um, many social agencies, religious organizations, our BIA, uh, and um, as we worked forward, it was felt that a beat patrol was actually needed prior to COVID, and then that um, funding was unfortunately re allocated and since that time safety and sec the security in the area has degraded significantly um, I am uh, a member of my BIA we've worked very hard with Reach Edmonton and the crisis diversion team we've actually provided the capital necessary to provide two vehicles for the crisis diversion team my team and I have spent time in shelters and understand and learn what they're going through we provide financial and kind support to those shelters We've trained our staff and um, we work with the 24-7 crisis diversion team tirelessly. Um, we work with the police service on multiple projects to try to improve safety in the area. Um, and I just need everyone on the call to understand, and building on what Panita just said, that in times of crisis, the only people who actually can help us really quickly are EPS. Um, um, as an example, uh, in the first quarter of 2022 alone, that's the first three months, we've had over 360 calls for urgent support to Edmonton Police Service in, in our neighborhood. That's just my business. That doesn't include the neighboring businesses. This is far too many. It's not safe. These are Edmontonians, whether they be my customers or my staff that are being threatened by what we have happening in, in the neighborhood. Similar experiences happen in many other businesses in, across the city. Um, it's important that council ad and administration consider these kinds of consequences, please. Uh, one such example is the recent closures of uh, washrooms in the LRT and uh, stations. And I know keeping them safe and clean comes at a cost, but when they were unilaterally closed, the problem was not solved. It, it, it was instead immediately displaced upon unsuspecting surrounding businesses, many of which are even less equipped to deal with these issues than is the city. All the vandalism, danger, and safety issues literally moved to nearby businesses. Um, these lead, uh, and our businesses are struggling already to overcome COVID uh, it, um, closure issues. And when we add to that the costs of WCB, vandalism, repair, uh, staff turnover due to safety, it really makes our, our ability to operate impeded. I would just say thank you for listening. I'm happy to share and participate in any way. But please, um, while we're waiting for this strategy to come to fruition, we need to increase our police presence to help us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jebron, Jebron, and apologies for your getting your name wrong. Uh, next is uh, Les Hagen. Is Mr. Hagen with us? I am. Thank you. Uh, uh, you're next, followed by Haroon Ali. Go ahead, Mr. Hagen. Good morning, Chair and Committee members. My name is Les Hagen, and I'm the Executive Director of Action on Smoking and Health and an adjunct professor at the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta. Based in Edmonton, ASH is one of Canada's leading tobacco control organizations, and we've been contributing to the quality of life in this city for over four decades. We commend City Council for making public health a top priority during the pandemic, and we encourage you to continue doing so. 
The past two years have challenged many governments and jurisdictions around the world, and Edmonton did not escape the enormous impact of COVID-19. However, this is not the first pandemic that has affected our city or country, and it won't be the last. For many decades, Canada, Edmonton, and Alberta have been grappling with a chronic disease pandemic that continues to rage. This pandemic is placing an enormous burden on our quality of life, our economy, our healthcare system, and our vulnerable populations. To this day, non-infectious chronic diseases such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and lung disease account for 80% of the total illness burden in Canada. This means that 80% of all hospital admissions, medical procedures, physician visits, and drug prescriptions are the result of chronic disease and injury. A large portion of these illnesses are completely preventable and they have common risk factors, including tobacco, commercial tobacco use, unhealthy eating, physical inactivity, mental and physical trauma, and other forms of substance misuse. These illnesses are also contributing to health inequities since vulnerable populations are at greater risk of contracting chronic disease. We commend, commend the administration for developing a new community safety and well-being strategy to help make Edmonton a safer, more inclusive, and more caring community. We appreciate your efforts to promote a safe and healthy city. As this initiative moves ahead, we encourage council to address further chronic disease to address to further address chronic disease and the result of health inequities in our city. You've heard many times that the hallmark of a caring society is its willingness to look at its vulnerable residents. I agree with this assertion, and I believe that we all need to do more to improve the quality of life of our vulnerable populations. As mentioned, commercial tobacco use is a major risk factor for chronic disease in Canada, and it claims the lives 50,000 lives annually, which is greater than the total death toll of COVID-19 to date. City Council has taken numerous steps to reduce commercial tobacco use over the years, primarily through the expansion of smoke-free places. These efforts should not be underestimated, and they have helped to reduce and prevent tobacco use and to protect children, youth, and non-smokers. Strong public evidence reveals that smoking restrictions are a very effective means of preventing and reducing tobacco use, protecting non-smokers, reducing health inequities, and improving the overall quality. One final step is required to optimize public smoking restrictions in Edmonton. We urge City Council to expand smoking and vaping restrictions to include all public recreation spaces. Several Alberta communities have already taken this step, including St. Albert, Beaumont, Lloydminster, Cameron, and Okotoks. The public places bylaw and its restrictions on smoking are symbolic of City Council's efforts to reduce the burden of chronic disease in our city. We encourage you to make this stop an early action item in the new community well-being strategy. Perhaps City Council can create Canada's first smoke-free national park and demonstrate national leadership on this issue. Smoke-free parks promote healthy living, reduce social modeling to children and youth, and can help to reduce litter and water parks resulting from cannabis smoking. This initiative would also reinforce the City of Edmonton Park strategy, which is appropriately titled Breathe. The reduction of commercial tobacco use is one of the biggest public health success stories in recent times, and we can all take pride in this societal achievement. We need to continue our efforts to reduce tobacco use and vaping, particularly among youth. Thank you for your continued leadership and for your commitment to improving community health and well being. Your actions can make a world of difference. Thank you, Mr. Hagan. Next, we'll have Harun Ali, followed by Pamela Brown. Awesome. Um, great. Uh, my name is Harun Ali. I'm a university student at the University of Alberta. I am studying political science. Uh, first off, I want to say a massive thank you to administration and those in the city manager's office for creating the strategy in consultation and collaboration with many different organizations across Edmonton. I know that these type of discussions are often hard, but are needed, so I want to express my gratitude. I would like to speak in favor of the community safety well-being strategy. The community safety well-being strategy has seven pillars which, pillars, which are good pillars, and will help guide the work that our city does over the next few years. The business cases that administration have provided are also excellent proposals to spend the money that has been withheld from EPS. I also appreciate the transparency that the city and administration is showing through the progress updates. 
Business owners deserve to feel safe and deserve to work in an environment that is safe. Uh, we all want that. Uh, however, what I would say is that community safety community safety has been a problem for our city. And while, while addressing systemic issues by continuing partnerships with community service workers and police are good strategies, we also need to recognize that some in our community have harmful relationships with EPS and have harmful relationships with police in our community. And understanding as well that we need to make sure that not only, not only do business owners feel safe, but as well as our community feel safe, walking outside, interacting with police, interacting with the community as well. So I would argue that programs like the BEAT program aren't helpful, but instead what we should be doing is expanding crisis diversion programs, like the COTS program, which is a phenomenal program. And I would also agree with Panita here, what's called saying that while that program hasn't rolled out as much as we want it to, we should be increasing funding there. Though those type of programs work, there's proven data that shows that they work as well. I'm not arguing against community safety. However, I'm saying that policing is often reactive, not proactive. And while we need to have programs that are addressing the current issue of safety, the long-term solution cannot be increased police presence. The Community Safety Wellbeing Task Force had multiple good recommendations and current counsel to review it. I'm also not a business owner, as you can tell. <laughs> uh, so I, 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 would, I unfortunately do not know, and I cannot, cannot speak to that. But what I, what I can speak to is me as a university student in the university station, where ha there have been multiple incidents of where students often don't feel safe down there. But once again, the common consensus, and this is something we've actually been discussing at Student Council uh, for the Student Union, is that we want more programs like the COTS program. We don't want to see more police presence, especially when people don't feel safe. Uh, well, lastly, what's called, I would like to speak to a few recommendations of the business cases that have been proposed by administration. Uh, the Integrated Call Evaluation Dispatch Center has been something that myself and many community members have been championing for, for years now. And I hope that throughout that the center that we can ensure that we're sending the right person to deal with the right crisis, is to make sure that we actually have responses that are appropriate. The extreme weather response is also another good step. Uh, the extreme weather response is also another good step towards ensuring that we have supports that are available to access the supports. Because once again, I was a big fan, especially during the pandemic when we opened a temporary shelter. I was a little disappointed in July when we closed it, and I was also very disappointed in November when we closed Camp Pequenian. Uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. We need to make sure that our community has supports and they have environments where the people feel safe to actually get the supports that they need. Lastly, the drug poisoning response is also another great initiative. Our city has been facing a drug poisoning crisis, and it, this unfortunately stems from a lack of provincial support, and I'm pleased to see that the city of Edmonton is trying to, f uh, what's called, um, fill in the gap that our province has left for us. In short, I'd like to offer my support and urge this committee to endorse the strategy to city council. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next we'll have Pamela Brown. Uh, is Ms. Brown here? Very good. Thank you. Followed by um, Dr. Francis Getty, although he, we may have to bump him to the end. I mean, he may not be available quite yet. Uh, but uh, please go ahead, uh, Ms. Brown. Mr. Mayor, esteemed councillors, June 1st, 1982 was a very big day for me. My first day as an employee of Edmonton City Centre. This was the place to be, to work, to take in entertainment, and to party. It's now 40 years later and I'm retiring in June. I'm saddened to be leaving Edmonton City Centre because it is my community. I grew here and was rewarded with many opportunities to serve. Some of those opportunities occurred because of disturbing events on our site. Fearing for the well-being of the security team led me to search for ways to strengthen their mental health as they witnessed and responded to ever-increasing numbers of traumatizing incidents. This search led me to the distress line where I became a keynote speaker at one of their breakfasts then to sitting on committees, one for the development of Living Hope, the City of Edmonton's suicide prevention strategy, and another for United Way Edmonton's Community Mental Health Action Plan. At these committee meetings, a germ of an idea began a conversation that led to support from the Imagine Institute and the United Way Edmonton in developing a program to protect the mental health of our staff, now known as Compassion to Action. Through these and other initiatives, it became evident that societal mores were in a state of unrest that many Edmontonians were suffering and therefore security management at Edmonton City Centre needed to modify practices to remain relevant. Our security model changed from enforcement to community engagement and we found that our security team grew stronger in character. They had permission to be themselves and act with empathy and compassion. 
The number of interactions with positive outcomes increased, leaving only a small number to become enforceable responses. Because of these initiatives and with the support and guidance of so many, I was honoured to receive the Lieutenant Governor's Circle on Mental Health and Addictions True Compassion Award. I love Edmonton. It is truly a world-class city with a small-town feel. However, two years ago of lockdowns highlighted uh, Two years of lockdowns highlighted what we chose not to see, especially in the downtown core. Before COVID, the challenges were somewhat masked by the working populace. Now with the challenges of crime and disorder so very evident, that working populace is afraid to return. The downtown core is, as one of our security team stated, broken and failing to thrive. So before I leave, I'm here to say that I support the Edmonton Community Safety and Wellbeing Strategy but with one ask, act now. We are at a pivotal moment. Waiting much, no much longer will not attract investors, will not help the downtown residents, businesses or workers, and certainly not the citizens so desperately in need of support and protection. Private organizations such as Edmonton City Centre are forced to step up to do what the province and city appear unable to do, battle crime and disorder. We recognize that as a community member, we do have responsibilities to the community, but we are first a place of business. The sad fact is that our attentions to assuring our tenants' safety will come to naught if they are afraid to walk the sidewalks, use the pedways, or use transit. Increasing policing staffing is not the sole answer to the societal challenges the city is facing, because all it really does is displace the people seeking safety in those areas as well as those involved in crime and disorder. And it is likely to cons uh, too late to consider that option because it appears that the police officers are overwhelmed and in the unenviable position not, of not being able to satisfy anybody. It is my fear that the next big wave of resignations will be seen amongst those who work for EPS and EMS. Unfortunately, there will be very few to replace them simply because those on a career path to policing cut their teeth in the private sector security with many of the best and brightest now rethinking their chosen careers. At the tender ages of 20 plus, they have seen enough. I worry for this city. In my 40 years, never have I seen downtown Edmonton in such dire straits. Never has there been such a loss of hope or confidence in recovery. It is losing its small town feel and is on the brink of losing its world class standing. Please act now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have Dr. Francis Getty. I'm not sure if he's had a chance to join us though. Uh, so uh, we'll come back uh, to him. Uh, so we'll move on then. Uh, Hon Leong is next. I'm sorry if I've mispronounced your name, sir. And uh, followed by uh, Charlene Oborowski. Please go ahead. Good morning, Your Worship, Mayor Sohi and Venerable City Councillors. My name is Han Leung. I'm a member of the Downtown Recovery Coalition, and I'm also the chair for the Chinatown Transformation Collaborative Society. I'd like to begin by saying thank you for proclaiming May 10th as a National Day of Action Against Anti-Asian Racism. Councillors Ann Stevenson, Karen Tang were in attendance, and at the spring celebration we saw Tim Carmel, Jennifer Rice, and many others. Chinatown is encouraged by the new council and new leadership that has been moving in the right direction to make Edmonton the safest city by 2030. We hope that this council can succeed in areas the previous council could not. We have faith in this council and renewed hope in your leadership. Now this weekend I was reminded why I love this city. The buzz and the excitement from the Oilers game was amazing and everyone in our city felt invincible. I met some of our out-of-towners at the game from Lethbridge and they were admiring how tall the buildings were in downtown, how you had to look up when you entered downtown and the grandeur of the Ice District. Feeling invincible, I decided to go into Chinatown after the game for a snack. There's a place I love called All Happy Family Restaurant. Well first, I wanted to go to Saiwu but realized midway they were not open. On my way back to All Happy, I was appalled by the encampments and how bad things have gotten. Mountains of soil donated clothing, trash, jaywalking in the streets, rows upon rows of tents set up against fences on 106 Ave, even gang members on bikes cruising around. Everyone in Chinatown knows it has never been this bad before. Even my friend Georgina, who's managed and lives in the hall block for many years, told me she's scared Georgina is the toughest nails woman and not scared easily. She told me how she regularly gets threatened for her life on walks. Even her dog was threatened to be killed. We don't even get to walk dogs safely anymore in Chinatown. 
Through one calls for income and so on from 700 in 2019 to over 6,200 in 2021. And what are the businesses and associations to do? Just pick up and move? We already did that twice. Once for Canada Place and then again to North Chinatown. This is called systemic displacement and this is unfair. Chinatown can be a distinct tourist destination, just like Corytown in San Francisco. Yet Chinatowns are disappearing across Canada. Now I went to All Happy Restaurant because I really like the fried beef noodle. So I know how bad I want to get it. And I'm willing to ignore the lack of safety and security to get there. But what about those gentlemen I met from Lethbridge? Would they come into an area where 93% of businesses experience vandalism or property damage for fried beef noodles? Throughout downtown and surrounding areas, daytime robberies are happening. Storefront windows are being broken. Entire businesses destroyed by arson. Chinatown is begging for more police enforcement. Foot patrols for hotspots. 24-7 day and night police with the goal of improving response times to criminal activity. Businesses get broken into two or three times a year and we've had four fires since the Miller Pub went up in flames. We can't continue to allow our businesses to die because we as a city cannot enforce bylaws and safety. We are ground zero for social disorder in the city. What you see on the LRT is just a glimpse of what we experience in Chinatown. If Edmonton is a city for Edmonton, for everyone, does that also include Chinatown? Or are we expendable? And if we are expendable, how long before downtown is expendable? The other day I was notified that a letter had been sent to the owner of Pacific Rim Mall to remove an encampment that had popped up on his property. Who do you even call to do something like that? He was told to remove the encampment or face a fine of up to $10,000 or up to a year in jail. I feel like we're putting the wrong people in jail. Not only is Chinatown doing their own litter cleanup, playing for, for its own security, installing shutters and security gates, we also need to remove encampments. When did it become the business owner's responsibility to manage encampments? Is it not trespass? Is this not a criminal activity? There are things only the police can do, things only beat cops can do. I will not ask my private security to remove an encampment, and they should not be expected to perform this work. We need more police and funds allocated to interdisciplinary programs to address these complex issues like encampments. My speech today is not just a plea for help, it is also a warning. It is a concerned citizen of this fine, beautiful city in front of you. I can see what happened in Chinatown happening in downtown. We need to protect our Chinatown, and we need to protect our downtown before the situation gets worse. People looked at downtown as an indicator for how thriving and vibrant a city is. Those gentlemen from Lethbridge will look at the towers downtown and compare them with all the magnificent cities they have visited. What does it say about your city when people look up to see promise and a city's future, and then when they look down at the street level, they can see a lack of safety and security? Will they come back to visit? If downtown continues its current trend, they will not be visiting Earl's for steak or woodwork for drinks, just like they don't come to Chinatown anymore for beef fried noodle. But there's hope. This council gives me so much hope and has shown up. You have important decisions to make and motions to push, agendas to further. Being the chair of the CDC in such a young organization, one of the main things I wish I had was a strong, able group of volunteers, people willing to make the dream happen. But we don't, and so far the work has been hard. But you look at this room today, the work you do needs help and guidance, and you have volunteers. The Downtown Recovery Coalition, the DBA, the CDC, and many other organizations are willing to do the heavy lifting. Please look to them so we can all lift up this city together and not just make it the safest city, but the best city to live, work, and visit in the world. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Next, we have Charlene Oborowski, followed by Stacey Zadie. Good morning, Mayor Sohi and councillors and Edmontonians in the room. My name is Charlene Obrowski and I am an Edmonton, Alberta-based entrepreneur, a, more, a member of the Edmonton Place Foundation and a member of the Downtown Recovery Coalition. I would like to t talk to you today about the CSA program, the Community Solutions Accelerator, a program that is in place to solve social issues. How this came about, the accelerator has looked at at the challenges that the community has, the key problems with homelessness, drug overdoses, domestic violence, and so forth. We looked at the history and what has been done to address those challenges, and we realized we didn't like the outcomes. We, needed to, we, we felt we needed entrepreneurship and a creative approach to help solve these problems. So we partnered with the Alchemist programming based out of Silicon Valley. We also partnered with Alberta Innovates and other Alberta partners for funding. We also looked towards our law enforcement, the Edmonton Police Service, who is an able and willing partner, which is key to use large data sets for solutions. Essentially, we thought, let's build a better mousetrap. 
We can't keep adding resources, time, people, money. Let's change the approach. Our primary object objectives of CSA program is to create a better experience for Edmontonians and Albertans by one, diminishing harm to individuals, two, disrupting, mitigating, and decreasing crime and disorder, and three, creating new opportunities for social and economic prosperity, including better health care outcomes for our most vulnerable. Some examples of what's possible is predicting domestic violence earlier for early intervention, empowering homeless people with tools that predict needs and match solutions, technology-based addiction management reduction solutions, solving cold cases on missing people, gamified platform to provide racial bias awareness and corrective solution, proactive mental health and wellness platforms for individuals and businesses, business entities, predictive tools to enable law enforcement to help offenders of certain crimes go through rehab instead of putting them through the criminal justice system. Two of the companies in the first cohort of the Accelerator program are as follows. One is Anima. It's an AI, to, an artificial intelligent tool that helps practitioners identify and assess childhood sexual abuse through self-figure drawing. So this is a quick uh, solution for detecting violence against children. A second company is uh, based out of Vancouver and it's called Brave Technology Co-op. And this is an overdose detection and response with more than 100 uh, prevented fatalities to date. They have three technologies. They have an app, they have Brave buttons, and they have a Brave sensor that serves, to, serves differently to detect overdose. Our first cohort was put together in this spring and our second will begin in September. So far we are seeing AI assist uh, with solutions. I would encourage you to reach out to us, learn more about how Edmonton Police Foundation, Alchemist, Alberta Innovates, and partners like TELUS, ATB, Motorola, the University of Alberta are getting to the root cause using AI, tech, and data. Ultimately, the digital solutions generated by this program will create positive social impact, improve lives, and create and nurture a more li livable city and, it, and an investable city and share our solutions worldwide. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, we're going to circle back to Dr. Franceschetti next, uh, followed by Stacey Zadie. So, Dr. Franceschetti, the uh, floor is yours. Five minutes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And uh, thanks for being so accommodating. I'm, uh, I'm working in a merge right now at the Royal Alex, so it uh, makes sense that I get a few minutes to share this vision with you. First of all, I want to thank you for putting it on the agenda. And I think that you'll see that this is a solution to a problem that we all share. Uh, when I come to work in emergency at the Royal Alex, one of the busiest emergency departments in Canada, my morning shift started at six and there was no fewer than, you know, seven patients that were experiencing homelessness. And so the new model that we're proposing called bridge healing or a Siminakochi in Cree, which means to try again, is very simple. I ask these patients two questions. Are you experiencing homelessness? And two, if yes, would you like a chance to start over again? And if they were to say yes, I'd be really motivated. And I've been asking patients for two years if they would. And they've all said yes, they'd like the opportunity. Then in partnership with Jasper Place Wellness, uh, we've come up with a model that's rather innovative. 12 units, a three-story building, fits on a single city lot and the 12 is a magic number because that creates an instant community that these individuals can with wraparound services as harm reduction, mental health support, a medical clinic, identification, food security, literacy, job uh, employment and retraining opportunities. Over the course of 28 to 30 days, we believe we can move these individuals uh, that were previously experiencing homelessness onto a path of recovery from either mental health or a path of uh, recovery from harm reduction and to give them an opportunity to actually get reintegrated back in society with a sense of hope and a sense of purpose. For some of them, the stay is as simple as waiting to get uh, social services to repatriate them back to 
maybe one of the First Nation communities or another community in Alberta that they came from. The beauty of these buildings are they're built very economically, they're net zero in terms of efficiency, and they're finished off by Indigenous women learning the trades as well. So trades such as painting or plumbing or becoming an electrician or drywaller. And so at the end of the day, it's a very innovative way to identify someone that's at their lowest point in life. If you're experiencing homelessness and end up in our emergency department, um, that's, that's a crisis for you. And instead of being discharged to a shelter or discharged back onto the streets, if we give you the opportunity, and this has not been done anywhere in Canada or North America, as far as I know, uh, to be given the immediate opportunity to find a place to stay and be provided that wraparound, wraparound service. You know, uh, a, a good friend of mine that I just recently met that used to be homeless said, you know, folks that are experiencing homelessness are addicted to chaos. And so the goal of bridge healing is to break that chaos. So our social workers here are totally excited at the opportunity of showing there's a new way to do it. For $67 a day, no cost to the individual, we're able to provide them the wraparound services in these purposely built buildings that will help them reintegrate back into the community so that the community is proud to be part of the solution as well. So I can tell you that after 30 years of being an emergency physician, I'm embarrassed that it took us this long to come up with this idea. But through the uh, great will and support of students at Nate that have helped us and various foundation and various donors in the city, I think we've come up with a model that Edmontonians will be very proud of and that we can fast track according to the needs that are out there. So instead of trying to take encampments down, let's reduce the demand for encampments by reducing the demand of patients that we discharge from healthcare facilities. It should be prohibited to discharge any patient from a healthcare faci facility into homelessness, just as it should be prohibited from discharging anyone from incarceration or a drug and treatment program to homelessness. We should come up with this model and support it and this modest investment, uh, we can have a proof of concept up by July of this year and show that this is the best way to take care of individuals when they present to us asking for help and that are homeless. So I, uh, I really wanna thank council for the opportunity of presenting. And uh, I hope that we're able to collectively work together with the community, with these individuals that wanna get their life back together and uh, as Asimina Kochi says, help them to try again. So thank you, Councillor. Thank you very much, Dr. Franceschetti. Uh, next, we have uh, Stacey Zadie, followed by Tanya LaRivia. Mayor Sohi and Council members, thank you so much for uh, letting me speak today. Um, my name is Stacey Zadie. I am one of the owners of Remedy Cafe. My husband, Z, uh, and I have been running the cafes for 21 years. We have 10 cafes within the city. Well, one is in Short Park, and we have another one coming soon. Um, Remedy is a family-owned business. Uh, we believe in community, welcoming everybody, encouraging individuality and, and equality. I have come today to represent businesses in the downtown core. Remedy Jasper has been open for nine years, and I'm deeply concerned about the safety and security of my staff and the staff of all businesses in the area. Um, I'll let you know, you know, sort of what's gone on in the, in the past uh, year. My staff have been spit on, they've been punched in the face. Um, they've, there's been sexual and ethnic discrimination. We've had an armed robbery. We've had theft, verbal abuse, verbal abuse, and it just continues. My staff in the last two months have witnessed a dead body across the street on Jasper Avenue. Um, you know, they witnessed a stabbing and you know that, you know, right in front of the cafe, which was very traumatizing for the staff. Uh, <clears throat> we've also had, I've got lots of videos if anybody wants to see them of the interactions we have with the population coming into our stores. I had a customer walk out of a store, hug her friend. Somebody came up behind her and hit her in the back of the head. Does anybody want to go downtown? I don't know. Do we want to be there anymore? I don't know that either. Um, we've started closing at eight o'clock. 
uh, through COVID, we did that as well, but we would love to open our hours till midnight again. My husband was so proud to be able to have that cafe open until midnight. And, you know, with it being open to midnight, then, you know, we were part of that downtown community. We were helping, you know, people in that core could come in and really enjoy themselves, and it was a great time. It's not like that anymore. You know, all the business, you know, you look at your, if that's happening in Remedy, what's happening in the other businesses that are around there? The things that nobody, that I haven't seen, that I haven't talked to anybody, I'm, you know, really kind of caught up in my own little world and I don't really know what's going on. I am very empathetic with them. I understand where this is coming from. Um, you know, if you look at the landlords trying to cope with buildings that are, are defaced with graffiti, feces, and urine, we have a cleanup probably once every two weeks in our back entry. My staff have to walk through there. We have deliveries through there. There's needles on the ground. It's, it's, it's not a safe business. Um, you know, I've heard there's a talk of, you know, building a park downtown and, you know, doing some revitalization, revitalization to the area. What would be the point if there's nobody there? Um, I really feel uh, that many of the businesses were on our own. Uh, we're losing our empathy, we're losing our patience, and we need help now. Um, I met with uh, the beat team, uh, the beat team in our area. We've got three beat team cops. Actually, one, of, one just got a partner, so I'm happy we've got four. Uh, those four, <coughs> those four um, uh, constables, you know, there used to be 60 in the city. Now we've got 18. Um, we need a present on the street. We need, we need beat cop guys on the street. We need cars going by. I, ha you know, these guys are so good. I, we can call them on their day off, and they will direct us on what to do and who to talk to. Like we can, there's no problem with that. You know, they're very busy dealing with houses. Like maybe there's a house, uh, you know, a drug house that they have to take down. They don't have time to be walking around in our area which has decreased in size as well for, uh, for where they actually patrol. Um, you know, people say we don't need the police, we don't need um, beat cops. I need them. All the businesses downtown need them. We need that presence um, so we can survive. You know, we survived COVID. Can we survive this? I don't know. It's getting, it's getting difficult. Um, just in passing, I'm really grateful to all the programs that are happening in the city. Um, I want to put uh, flower pots outside of our streets. I want to, uh, without getting them going through the window. You know, I want it where people can walk down and, and just see, we can see people walking and we're happy, happy to have people there. Um, maybe we can get the treatment centers downtown that we need and everybody as a community can work together. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Tanya LaRiviere, followed by uh, Funmi Amole. Good morning, Your Worship, Mayor Sohi, City Council, and to everyone here. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. My name is Tonya Riviere. I am the current chair of the Accessibility Advisory Committee. For those who may not know, the Accessibility Advisory Committee, or AAC, is a council-appointed committee. We provide advice and recommendations. The council aims to improve livability, inclusiveness, and accessibility for people with disabilities. I will be brief today. We are here to express our support for this community safety and well-being strategy. I would like to thank Salima Ibrahim and Jennifer Badri for connecting with the AAC and implementing our recommendations at this point into this framework. To start with, we would like to commend those involved in creating this framework and for recognizing, and I quote, the removal of systemic barriers requires transformation of thinking, interacting, and being time and time again. We as a committee and as individuals experience attitudinal barriers. It is the first and often the hardest barrier to overcome. And the refusal to acknowledge and unwillingness to participate in new thinking will continue to sustain the inequalities that exist in our system, resulting in sustaining unhealthy and marginalized communities. From the perspective of the AAC, this framework identifies key elements to addressing systematic change, and we would like to see this strategy approved by City Council. If it is, we look forward to contributing to its development. A few of our key items are affordable and accessible housing, 
This is the foundation of each of the pillars identified in this framework. Simply put, we need to start building housing for everyone and make that a priority. We will not achieve community safety and well being if the basic need of shelter is not accessible to everyone. Affordable and accessible transportation. Among housebound persons with disabilities, one in five say it's due to lack of accessible transportation. It is imperative we address the correlation between disability and poverty income inequality and the built environment. Universal design as a fundamental component contributing to well being, which would align with the Edmonton Police Service crime prevention through environmental design framework identified in this report. The AAC can take immediate action contri to contribute to this framework, including contributing to recover Edmonton's urban wellness plan identified under the pillar of well being as we represent a marginalized community and reviewing council's policies and bylaws identified in the report as impacting this framework to better support our future contributions. Shall this be approved? I wanted to genuinely thank everyone who worked on this thoughtful and important framework. Thank you for respecting the perspective and suggestions of the Accessibility Advisor Committee. And thank you to council for the opportunity to show our support and invested interest in this framework. We look forward to further engagement and contributing to the well-being of all Edmontonians with disabilities and all Edmontonians. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Funmi Amole, followed by Catherine O'Neill. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Funmi. Um, I'd like, I'm the newly appointed uh, chair for WAVE, and I'd like to say a big thank you for the opportunity to speak to the community safety and well-being framework being presented today. Um, WAVE has been introduced to the framework as presented, and we can, we can identify that the pillars of this framework aligns with our priorities. Uh, some, of the framework, some of the pillars that resonate are the equitable policies, procedures, standards, and guidelines for safety and inclusive spaces for women and gender diverse folks. Uh, pathways in and out of poverty, crime prevention, crisis inf intervention with a gender sensitivity lens. Particularly, safety and safe and inclusive spaces for women and gender diverse folks. A lot of our com of community members today have spoken about safety in our city, especially in our downtown core. We have heard from our networks uh, that women particularly feel unsafe and gender diverse folks feel unsafe and excluded uh, in infrastructure and accessing services, especially for gender diverse folks when it comes to experiencing homelessness and being able to access those services because they don't have any specific ones directed towards them. Um, we at Bay are looking forward to working closely with administration in developing this framework further uh, to have a women focused lens and a gender diverse focused um, lens as well. We look forward to advancing the work and moving the dial on safety and well being for all Edmontonians. Thank you for your time. Have a great day. Thank you to the speaker. Next up is uh, Ms. Catherine O'Neill joining us remotely. Hi everyone, good morning. Uh, it's great to be here today to speak in favor of, uh, of this proposed strategy. I am really thrilled to see those seven pillars. I think it's very ambitious, but it also uh, just are these guideposts for moving forward and building a safe and equitable city for everyone. I am the CEO for YWCA Edmonton and we have been operating in Edmonton since 1907. So for 115 years, we've been working with governments at all levels in our community on just building a more equitable uh, uh, community for everyone. And we've done everything in the housing space, childcare space, counseling service space, advocacy space, as well as the disability services space. And at the end of the day, our, our guiding principle is always gender equity. So when I look at this, this strategy, not only does it uh, look at the short-term concerns, but also has that long-term vision. And I think it's really important as a council 
to always being reminding yourself about that long-term vision. Yes, there are many urgent uh, challenges facing our community. We've heard them today, but to keeping our eyes down the road to really, really solid ways in, in building infrastructure for our community to ensure that this work is leading us somewhere. Um, and I'm not going to talk much further because I think really the next few steps, particularly the implementation of the strategy are essential and our organization is very committed to this work and will be a, a partner uh, along the way. But um, I do want to talk about, before I wrap up quickly, about the fact that really going to the community is going to be essential as part of the strategy, strategy not just depending on the police and council and politicians and even social service organizations like ourselves, but actual community members and, and talking to our community leagues, et cetera. I, for example, last year, the YWCA worked, um, did a, launched a grassroots project called Searching for Izena, and it was a grassroots project. It cost only $10,000 to do. ECF funded it quite quickly, and we had hundreds of volunteers help us do that work to talk about the history a female leadership at Edmonton City Hall and the importance of having um, gender diversity um, at our leadership tables and in our community. So these are, you know, it speaks to the power of our residents of our community and the willingness to help do this work. So very exciting time. And I'm really just, again, very excited that the city uh, is, is spending so much time on this and that, that it uh, is so ambitious. So again, good luck, and we will be with you along the way to help with the implementation of this work. Uh, thank you. Next, we have Sharif Haji. Oh, that's to answer questions only, unless you had comments, Sharif. Okay, moving along then. Next, we have uh, Hanson Shu. Oh. Sorry. You can you come back to me after? I'm not sure who that was. Oh, Sharif. Oh, did you have something, uh, some comments to offer, uh, Sharif? Yeah, I do. Okay, please go ahead. You have five minutes. Thank you. Oh, so how much, how much time do I have? You have five minutes, sir. Okay. Okay. Oh, uh, good morning, morning. Your, uh, your Worship, uh, Mayor Sohi and uh, Councillor Cadmel, as the Chair of the Community and Public Services Committee. And I wanted to also acknowledge all the other councillors in, in attendance this morning. I speak to you today wearing various hats. We all wear many hats when it comes to community safety and well being. One of the hats that, that, that I have is talking to you as a leader of an organization that helps to amplify the voices of African Canadians living here in Edmonton. The membership of the Africa Centre is diverse. It represents various countries, languages, different identities, and uh, different beliefs. But they all choose Edmonton to be their home and build a new lives and contribute to the multicultural fabric of our society. Another hat that I that, that I wear is as a father, a husband, a partner, and children that are visibly racialized, but broad of their heritage. At the same time, these are my children who try to navigate this world and some of the hateful views that still resonate for some in our city. I blow this council and the administration who have bravely stepped into this space to try and help our city to be an anti-racist city. And the final hat that I wear is my own identity, Somali Canadian, a black man with an accent and all the stereotypes and biases that if you did not know me on the first meeting, you may draw a certain picture of me. I say all this in my introduction in order to frame and center what's really at stake in the conversation of safety, inclusion, a sense of belonging, and a well-being discourse. I hope that we can, be, we can begin to move through all bureaucratic bickering, cross-sectoral uh, gamemanships, and political rhetoric. When I came to Edmonton, I studied at the University of Alberta, and I would like, uh, and I walk around 
campus. And I remember walking into the historic Gladrag Arena and seeing the code on the walls. What stuck with me is, it says that it's amazing what you can accomplish when no one cares who gets the credit. The incidents of hate we see in our city are impacting people's perceptions, psychology, our ability as a community to thrive. We cannot ignore that we got here, maybe because of other things that happen around the world, such as the tragedies in the United States. However, we have to look closer to ourselves. These experiences are happening every day to indigenous peoples and their communities. We have to push enough whose budget, whose jurisdiction, who gets the credit. I call on yourself, all leaders of institutions in Edmonton, to unlock the potential within the community. Look to racially led organizations to help. Take some risks with racialized community organizations. That's how change management works. Yes, we may do some things different. We may do it in our own time, but these are proven programs, community driven, but they still continue struggling support. They continue struggling fundings. They continue struggling sustenance. This is the lives of racially uh, uh, led community organizations. When it comes to an ongoing funding uh, compared to other institutions. Examples, I'll just pick one example. There was an award-winning uh, an award-winning program called the Rajo program that's linking and bringing Somali and African Canadian youth in Edmonton public schools. Uh, two weeks ago, he was given an award at the Rice Awards event. Yet, due to the funding cuts, now the staff and volunteer of their time, they the, the staff volunteer their time using EI to keep their good work alive. I'm not involved in this delivery, but I continually hear how important and impactful such programs are. We need to balance community safety and well-being conversation. The here now issues, we must tackle issues such as homelessness, the opioid uh, poisoning crisis, while at the same time, we need to address the long-term social cohesion challenges that will continue to grow as Edmonton grows and becomes more diverse. Let's invest in people and programs that set us up for a success. Edmonton to be an anti-racist city, it requires some changes. And those changes require some, we have to take things differently. I agree we need to leverage, but leveraging doesn't mean continually how we do things, how we have been doing things and expecting a different result. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. All need to take Thank some you. risk. We will be successful with this endeavor. Thank you for listening to me and the Africa Center stands ready to help and do the heavy lifting ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Hanson Shu, followed by Ayesha Irfan. Hey, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Hanson Shu, and I am a member of the City of Edmonton Youth Council uh, or CYC for short. Um, and I am also one of the co-leads in the CYC Community Safety and Wellbeing Initiative. Um, so for more context, this initiative began in January of 2021 with the goal of bringing a youth-centered perspective to the Community Safety and Wellbeing Task Force Safer for All report. Um, so this initiative was special to me as an element of our initiative also encapsulated the operation of Edmonton Transit and having commuted uh, on transit throughout high school to get to work and to get to school. I'd often experienced times where I felt unsafe, so I was passionate in finding uh, a group of peers within the City of Edmonton Youth Council that had a shared interest in upholstering community safety and well-being. Uh, one of these members was Aisha Irfan, who um, also co-led the Community Safety and Wellbeing Initiative with me and we'll later discuss uh, at this meeting how we believe there is room for improvement when it comes to engaging youth perspectives on community safety and well-being. 
Uh, I want to give a brief overview of what our initiative entails and illustrate our experiences in liaising with the city manager's office throughout our work. Um, so for the duration of our initiative, uh, my group and I conducted qualitative and statistical research and gathering Edmonton youth perspectives on community safety and well-being through disseminating a CSWB survey for Edmonton youth, um, consulting with community organizations, taking notes from non-statutory hearings, and examining policies enacted in other Canadian cities as comparative case studies. Um, in May of 2021, we had compiled our research into five youth-based recommendations on improving community safety and well-being, and we had sent these recommendations to the City Council in the forms of both an official letter uh, and a video in May of 2021, uh, which was almost one year, exactly one year ago. Uh, although we'd like to thank the work that the city administrators have been doing to hear our voices and concerns, we strongly believe that more can be done to engage Edmonton youth in the creation of a community safety and well-being strategy. Um, in terms of our own CSWB initiative, my group did not receive a response from the city manager's office regarding our five recommendations until late April of 2022, um, which was nearly a year after we had first released our recommendations. Um, my team and I are very open to feedback as we all believe that open dialogue is an incredibly important building block of any municipal policy work. Um, and as such, we believe that when consulting youth groups such as ourselves, uh, we think it's important to provide enough time for Edmonton youth to digest and understand new updates. Uh, so Edmonton youth are not overwhelmed with providing feedback on the spot. Um, we think that this would benefit both uh, Edmonton Youth and the city because we know that the city intends to conduct proper engagement with all parties involved um, and I strongly believe that there is a desire to engage within uh, this framework of collaborative decision making and that the city should indeed strive for this uh, in a more timely manner both in the present and in the future. So I wanted to share these experiences of my team and I because I think that it's important to acknowledge that youth engagement can improve immensely um, and I uh, strongly urge the Committee of um, Community and Public Services to keep this in consideration today. Um, and yeah, with that being said, I would like to end my time. Thank you. Next, we have Aisha Irfan, uh, followed by Stacey Leavitt Wright. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Aisha Irfan. I am the policy chair on the City of Edmonton Youth Council. And like Hansen, like Hansen mentioned, the co-lead on the Safety and Wellbeing Initiative last year. Today, I will be speaking and echoing Hansen's sentiments pertaining to the youth perspective on community safety and well-being. As Hansen said, it is imperative to include and consult with youth. It is imperative to include and consult with youth within the makings of reports such as this one. This can be demonstrated through consulting with youth groups that aren't just limited to the city of Edmonton Youth Council. While making strides and efforts in consulting youth within matters pertaining to community safety and well-being is the first step, we are also presented with a bigger question. What does continuity look like? What happens when Hansen and myself or other youth within the community who are dedicating their time to this work decide to leave. How will the recommendations we made last year continue to shape the conversation surrounding community safety and well-being? How are we ensuring that the work we are currently doing will continue for years and years to come? In our recommendations, we highlighted the significance of incorporating youth perspective as youth want to be a part of these conversations. And we know City Council wants to hear from us. The question is, how? Alongside reaching out to different organizations, it is critical to keep the barriers that youth face in mind in order to participate within these conversations. I know two years ago, I personally wouldn't have been able to make it to a meeting like this because I didn't own a device and rely on the library for all of my communication. Furthermore, the timings of these consultations and committee meetings can be improved to be accessible to youth as Hanson and I are currently here during what are school hours for most youth. Additionally, being someone who attends a high school located deep within the north side, I've seen the disparity in how information is spread to certain youth groups. 
it is critical to ensure that youth voices from all parts of the city are at the table while accounting for accessibility. As my time comes to an end, I want to reiterate that we are extremely thankful for a council that listens. However, listening is only impactful if it is followed by action. We thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, on our list, we have Elaine Jones and Deb Rhodes, both from the public library to answer questions only. Correct, okay, thank you. Uh, so that takes us to Stacy Leave It Right, followed by Shalini Sina. Thank you, Aisha is a, a, an inspiring act to follow. Uh, I wanna begin by thanking this committee for the opportunity to speak with you today and to uh, both Andre Corbeau, John Dowds and Salima Ibrahim for meeting uh, with members of our community a few weeks ago, myself included. The proposed community safety and well-being strategy is broad and ambitious, and we appreciate the complexity and interconnectedness of the many issues it's seeking to address in the seven pillar framework. I will admit that with the Oilers playoff game and our community's film festivals distractions, I was able to read through but not study the entire document at great length since it was released last week. As I noted in our meeting, but I'd like to highlight today, there's a few areas that we have of concern with regards to the community safety and well-being methodology and strategy, both in our how our community experiences and is captured and uh, how it may be addressed. Our community is traditionally seen as white facing. However, there are many members with an intersectional reality and they're not clearly included in conversations and grants because they're not seen as BIPOC. The intersectionality should be noted as are many Jews who are LGBTQ+, Asian, Black, and Brown. In fact, a majority of the world's Jews are considered BIPOC and they can easily feel marginalized from the committees and more that are being spoken of. Anti-Semitism is a unique and pernicious form of racism. We hope that the independent body being formulated is taking this into consideration as the membership and its linkage to council and city activities has not been made clear yet at this time and we understand it's currently under development. When we spoke with the city manager's office, we flagged that our community's experience of anti-Semitism, both in formal reported and unreported incidents has not been captured in previous reports. In the last two weeks alone, I've had three incidents called into my office from parents and schools. Children facing Hitler salutes in the hallways of their publicly funded school or the erasure of Israel from a world map in elementary classrooms. Furthermore, the EPS has recently documented hanging of far-right neo-Nazi propaganda above local roadways. The proliferation of hate and hate symbols has been growing in our city just this weekend alone on the side of the Ukrainian Congress building. Having a clear definition of anti-Semitism as a starting point to capturing accurate data and in providing an anti-racist lens to policy and procedure, whether in city human resource policies and practices or in standards and guidelines being developed. Furthermore, the definition of anti-Semitism should be based on the adoption of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, the gold standard adopted by municipalities and countries worldwide, including our federal government in its anti-racism strategy with a commitment to combating hate and extremism. Should it not be the Jewish community that determines what is and is not anti-Semitism. While I will not go through each pillar one by one, there are many opportunities for further involvement and collaboration, and we're hopeful that a diversity of voices and perspectives will be brought forward, including that of the local Jewish community. We welcome opportunities to bring awareness and training to city council and to the city manager's office. It will be our honor to further advise and collaborate on making Edmonton a safe and inclusive city for all. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Shalini Sina, followed by Laurie Laura Cunningham Shepley. Thank you very much. My name is Shalini Sinha. I am the chair of the City's Anti Racism Advisory Committee, and I'm speaking um, informed by those experiences and also just as a person myself. I was first excited um, in July 2021 when this motion was made. ARIC members and members of the public had spoken to council many times, accumulatively many hours, resulting in a key concept finally being recognized, that the most marginalized and most impacted by decisions be involved, centered, and part of decision-making, which Councillor Paquette then articulated as collaborative decision-making. We would like you to hear our voice when we say it is not our experience that we were collaborated with. 
Yes, we received a 20 minute presentation in April, which did not show us any material in advance, which gave us highlights rather than a whole report and which asked us to collaboratively review what they had already done and show them any gaps. At best, we can say we were informed in a limited capacity. And I appreciate that many others who've spoken today are very happy with their level of involvement. And I might ask you to think about how when there's no expectation to be involved at all and you're proactively reached out to and given a 20 minute presentation, you may feel very happy about that process. But Eric was named in the motion as a collaborative decision-making partner. And, we, and I heard in the presentation that we were named several times. And I'm here to share our experience of the report, some ideas on this, but also to try and be heard that we were not, we did not experience that collaborative uh, decision making or even collaborative involvement. Um, we have been told that there are many different de de definitions of collaboration and that this needs to be looked at. But th to this, I would say that the City Corporation prides itself on its values of leading from learning. We have worked very closely with city administration in the last year and more. Um, if they are confused, the city corporation has a public engagement section. They now have their anti-racism advisor to senior executive. And previous to our experience was with the social diversity and social inclusion that there was more communication and involvement. Um, when we keep putting out these excuses for not um, involving us, then the labor comes on us to come back to you to try and have our voices heard. And I appreciate that we're at risk of sounding uncooperative, um, you know, oppositional, unhappy all the time when we're trying to present that our experience is different to what we're hearing being told. And we're hearing this being told in the press conference and today and in the report, and we'd like you to hear that. One more thing. When we worked on the strategy, the anti-racism strategy, I was told repeatedly by administration that the work on community safety and well-being was on hold until that work was done so we could come back and work on it together. And that is the message I shared with all the folks who asked me, who worked on the strategy with the Youth Council. I shared that information and then we all came back to be presented this and, and weren't included. Okay, so coming to the strategy, there are a few points I'd like to make. First, there are seven pillars named here and we are bringing forth a perspective that there should only be five pillars. The strategy needs to be reorganized. The first two pillars named, anti-racism and reconciliation, should not be pillars but guiding foundations above the whole. And so those two pillars should be moved in your visual, they're on the side there and they start. They should be moved to a banner on the top. Anti-racism and reconciliation need to inform the work in all the other pillars. We also need to stop siloing anti-racism and reconciliation. We need to move to start in a direction that weaves the relationship and partnership between these two movements. When we talk about addressing root causes, we need to treat individuals as human beings. We need to understand how trauma and generational trauma have created a cascade effect into difficult, violent, and sometimes criminal behaviors, sometimes violent. And this is only informed by webbing in anti-racism and reconciliation into the foundations of the strategy. And finally, um, I will notice that most speakers today, not all, but most speakers today put forward the need for more policing as the mechanism to create more safety. However, we do know that not only has more policing ever reduced crime in the past, but many, many voices who aren't here today, and I would argue because they feel more disenfranchised from how the process has gone and are not bringing their voice, voices forward as strongly anymore, would argue that more social factors are required to address safety. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Laura Cunningham Shepley. Thank you. My apologies. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi, for being here, Community and Public Services Committee, Council Members, and City Manager Andre Corbo. 
We appreciate the opportunity to meet with administration. We recognize the incredible challenge that the city faces with respect to the initiative and to move quickly on this. But we see a gap where the city could leverage their league partners. The EFCL, leagues and the city of Edmonton have just signed the largest land use agreement in Edmonton with a tripartite agreement. And yet we continue to be left out of important work, including this work to create a safer community for all. We believe that providing additional funding and support to leagues to identify the needs of their neighbours and to increase opportunities for programming and events that bring people together is a key factor to the success of this strategy. Next slide, please. People coming together in positive and encouraging ways where they get to know each other, connect, feel a sense of pride in place, will build a safer city. Next slide, please. This is the preventative work that has been discussed by so many speakers today, building strong communities where people feel a sense of belonging and connection helps people to thrive. Community and connection is best built when we are having fun together. Next slide, please. Leagues are exceptionally well positioned as geographic communities to engage with and empower a diversity of residents who can often be divided by many factors within existing systems of engagement and civic participation. Next slide. We believe that we have a significant role to play to create safe and inclusive spaces. There's 162 community leagues across the city supporting 123 halls that have the capacity to house 14,707 people for different events, recreation, animation, and connection. For example, over the past year, many leagues have hosted naloxone training sessions for neighbours, and the EFCL has continued to share opportunities for leagues to host those close to home so that connections can be made to address this in a supportive community context. It's critical that the EFCL is engaged as a stakeholder in this pillar. We have been making strides with our anti-racism work with leagues through our diversity and inclusion coordinator, our new Safe Walk pilot project, and we continue to support leagues in creating inclusive community spaces in all corners of the city and adapting it to the feedback found through this initiative. Next slide, please. As for the pillar of well-being, leagues are made up of Edmontonians. Over the last year, they have provided the opportunity to participate in 3,200 programs and events. Next slide, please. Those programs and events served over 220,000 Edmontonians. With an average operating grant from the city of $16,000 per league, leagues are able to keep halls and amenities open and active. They do that while providing significant programming and events. And this shows that additional investment would allow leagues to create even more high quality, impactful opportunities for engagement and connection. Last year, Edmontonians volunteered 253, 847,000 hours for their community to their leagues. Next slide, please. That has a value of a return on investment of $4.56 million. And that's a Canadian standard measure. This demonstrates that Edmontonians see community leagues as a key gateway to community involvement and engagement. Next slide. This unique system that is based here in Edmonton has been identified as a key stakeholder for this initiative. It is a fundamental partner of the city of Edmonton and as such needs to be identified as a key stakeholder in the strategies for safe and inclusive spaces and well-being. Thank you. You can show the next slide. Thank you. Uh, we've had one more person register to speak, so I'm going to move that uh, we hear from Robert Hool. Uh, please vote to hear from that speaker. We're just missing two votes. Council Wright. Oh, I voted yes in favor. Thank you. And Mayor Sohi. 
Yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That is carried. Uh, please proceed, Mr. Hool. Well, thank you, Council and uh, Committee, for allowing me to speak. I was a little bit conflicted on whether or not I wanted to register, given um, my previous work on the task force and other things that I'm involved with. So some of these comments are taken without prejudice, um, but I felt it necessary to come and speak today because um, after looking at the reports, after looking at all of the data that's been kind of planted online um, at the last minute, it took a little bit of uh, a reading, a lot of analysis to go through it all. Um, but I have a lot of concerns with the, the approach of the report. Um, I have a lot of concerns with overlap. I have um, a lot of concerns having served on the Community Safety and Wellbeing Task Force. Um, a lot of concerns on how the strategy misses the mark on what the task force was recommending. And here we are a year out um, and we have very little um, productivity or completion of the recommendations that me and my fellow colleagues made. Um, so I'm just here to, to voice opposition to this report. There are good things in the report. Um, I'll, I'll give credit where credit is due. The work of COT and other initiatives like that uh, are making headway in terms of community safety. Um, but I think overall, over the last number of years, there's been this ongoing theme of doing things differently. And what we're seeing today in today's report and today's presentations uh, is a return to doing things the same old way that we've always done them. We have friends of the city, people that receive funding directly from the city come to the table to continue to tout work that the city administration is doing without really giving it a critical purview. And any time any criticism does come off, it's seen as kind of fringe and, and we really miss the point in those, um, those comments. And I, and I echo the chair of the uh, ARAC, uh, Shalini, who did work with the task force very closely and, and had a lot of fantastic input. Um, I think her comments are, are of critical concern and that the work that was brought forward on this strategy is really lacking in the key areas that it is required and it really needs to be improved before it is recommended and carried forward because it misses the mark um, and it really manipulates some of the recommendations brought forward by the task force. The task force called for a dashboard to cover the completion of the task force activities and recommendations. I don't see any indication of that in this report at all. There's verbiage around it being carried forward. There are things happening, training happening, diversification hires happening, things like that. But what we were looking for is a temperature gauge and a completion chart on what the task force recommendations were being carried forward and how they were being completed. Because as we said in our presentations to this council, to the previous council, um, it wasn't a piecemeal approach. You had to complete all of these things. And if you did all of these things, we would have a safer community for all. Um, so I'm not seeing that in this strategy. Um, it's, it's, it shouldn't be an approach of one strategy to rule over, over them all. That is a very centrist kind of um, colonial approach to, to doing things and, and, and very power grabbing. Um, I see a lot of overlap with End Poverty Edmonton, who City Council just donated or gave money to $2.1 million from police initiatives. Um, a lot of overlap with initiatives like Recover. Um, so again, there needs to be a delineation on exactly what body is doing what, because administration and the city created some of these entities to carry that work forward because they were a better place to do that. And now it seems like we're bringing it, the city of Edmonton is bringing it all back to the center and trying to control how the work is carried forward and how it is unrolled. Um, there's also a lot of, of question and concern around um, some of the language in the report. I, I take particular concern with the use of uh, Cree paradigms and Cree languages and Cree words with, and the attempt to try to pass them off as being indigenous in nature. There is reference to a concept called Pamatsuin in the report. Uh, it is usually paired with Nihial Pumatsuin, which is the Cree good life. Um, you cannot take a Cree word and say that it is an indigenous paradigm and apply it to all different indigenous communities because we are very diverse. I don't think um, Stony or Blackfoot people would appreciate a Cree word being applied to the way that they see and view the world. Um, and just, I, I hope that there is a fulsome conversation on this. There are, are 
definitely a need for increased resources, but the resources have to be placed strategically so that they create the impact that we need. And I hope there are questions to follow after this. Thank you. Uh, that concludes uh, our speakers. Uh, next, we'll be moving to questions of our speakers. Um, however, I want to undertake some agenda management here. So first of all, I'm going to move that we make item 6.5 time specific for 345 this afternoon. Happy to take any comments on that, but that will be to at least hear from speakers. Okay, please vote. Just with missing one vote, Mayor Sohi. I just had one question, so I wasn't able to click in time. Is that to finish the item at 3.45 or just to listen to speakers? Well, we'll see where we're at, Mayor Sohi. Depends on how far we get at 1.30 on this item, on this collection. Okay, of got items. it. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, yes. Thank you. Thank you. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. So uh, we are about to uh, stop for lunch. We'll resume at 1.30 with questions from Council to our speakers. So. Uh, as many of you as can, please return to the meeting, and uh, uh, I know there's questions for many of you. Uh, we will uh, get as far as we get with questions to our speakers and then questions to administration on this collection of items. We'll stop at 345 to at least hear from speakers on item 6.5, and then we'll see where we get from there in terms of which we do next uh, at that point. Appreciate all your patience. See you all at 1.30. Thank you.
Well, good evening, every. Well, good afternoon. Boy, I jumped ahead, didn't I? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to call the May 16th, 2022 meeting of Community and Public Services Committee back to order uh, and do a roll call, first of all, of committee members. Councillor Jance. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Oh, that was, I was looking for Councillor Wright. Yes, good afternoon. There we go. Okay, I'm sorry if I got the right one or not. Thank you. Uh, we're joined by several other councillors again this afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Uh, Mayor Sobe, sorry, who's a member of committee. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm here. Uh, Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Salvador. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Councillor Rutherford. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And uh, we, oh, well, we're joined by Councillor Knack in person. Good afternoon. good afternoon. And happy birthday, Councillor Paquette. I think it's his birthday today. Uh, thank you. Councillor Principe. Good afternoon and happy birthday. <laughs> okay. Um, we are now at uh, questions of our guest speakers uh, from Council, so we'll just wait for the list to populate. We'll start with committee members. Councillor Tang. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I just want to first thank everybody for coming down here, uh, for taking your time to share your thoughts, your experiences, and to speak. And also for those in the room who are here to support uh, this really important um, conversation. Um, I'm wondering if this and still the, the EPL folks, either online or available to answer some questions. Uh, yes, we're here. Oh, great, great, perfect. Thank you so much. I guess I just want to clarify one thing. In the report, um, that EPL item was a one-time, but in your presentation, it was annual. Can you just elaborate on the on the thinking there? Yeah, so I think the, the request was through this process that it would be one time and that we would be putting that forward as part of our overall 2023-2026 budget ask because we would see it as an ongoing investment and an ongoing program. What is your current budget right now for Sing Sign Laugh and Learn? I am not sure what that we pulled it out specifically for Sing Sign alone. We, we can definitely get that back to you though, Councillor Tang. We'll do that. I'll get someone to do that right away. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, and to Ms. McBrien, um, I was wondering, um, you talked about the downtown task force. This is the city task force or the provincial task force. Uh, what I was referring was the, referencing was the downtown recovery, now called coalition, um, okay. formerly downtown recovery task force, which is just a collection of business and community leaders. Gotcha, right. There is a few tables. <laughs> just wanted to know which one. Um, and out of this coalition, uh, you have a granting program uh, and one of which is funded to the Boyle Street for the outreach team. Sorry, that one was the downtown vibrancy strategy, um, which is a city program, gotcha. which has city grant funding available, which is what funded the overdose response, yes. Gotcha, and have you exhausted all the funding in that? In that no, there is still some funding remaining in that program. I think there is a few pending um, applications that between everything that comes through in the next few months, it will be exhausted. Um, and then did I hear you right? And sorry, this is a couple hours ago, but the, 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 the safety ambassador program is one of those pending ones? No, well, so that is one application that we will be putting in as the downtown uh, business association. So that would be our program. Um, we're just sort of collecting learnings from our colleagues in downtown Regina, downtown Kelowna, um, and a few districts in the States to, to create what that looks like. And then we are planning to put in an application to the downtown vibrancy strategy as one of our funding sources. Gotcha. And um, are you leveraging anything from the five million from the province? 
for the downtown vibrancy? I don't know anything about how that money is supposed to flow Oh, yet. interesting. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so it sounds like you really want to kind of keep a lot of, um, really put a focus on um, patrol uh, kind of boots on the ground. Patrol and outreach, yeah. Not, and who are not necessarily uniform or necessarily social workers. Yeah, that's the struggle. So we did a social worker version of an outreach program last year as a, as a prototype with REACH and NET uh, and Boyle Street. And the learning through that was that outreach workers, it's similar to what I think the city's learning with COT, if you're doing actual casework, that kind of ends up being a competing priority yeah. with the need for a, a presence. So we're, we're just grappling with that right now. Yeah, I'll be curious to, to hear what you land on in the end. Um, yeah, no, appreciate that. Uh, sorry, I had a whole bunch of questions now. I'm losing track of these. Um, uh, is, is Mr. Hu still online? Yes, I am. Uh, thank you, Rob, for your presentation, um, as always. I'm curious about, uh, sort of at the end there, you mentioned um, we need more increased resource, and I, I and I took it in the context of, um, you know, talking about Cree paradigms and Cree words. Can you just, because we're, there's a whole bunch of reports we're talking about, um, are you talking about more increased resource in general for community safety and well-being, or specifically increased resource in Indigenous Relations Office, which is one of the ten items being recommended? Um, and then you mentioned that those have to be strategically placed. I'm out of time. Sorry. If you can just answer that, and I'll stop. Thank you. Yeah, I think my comment around resourcing was um, around adequately funding, and I know there is an inclusion of uh, supporting the Indigenous Relations Office to an increased degree, which is uh, needed because their work is growing and they are building more relationships. But it's it's also uh, resourcing in a sense of understanding and educating um, leadership and other people around what is uh, cultural appreciation and what is cultural appropriation and that applying Cree terms to other Indigenous communities without their consent and then trying to pass it off as uh, Pamatsuan being this all-encompassing Indigenous term. It is not. It is a Cree term and reflecting a Cree way of life. And more understanding needs to be put towards it before we try to uh, engage the public around uh, living a Pamatsuan way. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council, or pardon me, Mayor Sohi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am at the airport. I, are you able to hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to start, first of all, I want to thank everyone for participating and also acknowledging uh, uh, that long-term strategy is sound, but we have immediate challenges related to uh, to uh, the implications of the social issues that we have and the disorder they cause. So I appreciate everyone's uh, understanding on that. I want to start with uh, uh, Stacey Zeddy. Uh, if she's still there, I if I heard you correctly, did you say that the number of beat officers that were present before, that number has decreased now? So, Mayor Sohi, I don't see Ms. Zaidi in chambers. I'm not sure if she's online. Maybe I'll uh, go to Panita. Maybe she might have that information. Uh, if that has happened, uh, have we seen visible presence of police in the downtown now, or has that presence decreased over the last uh, while. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it, it has decreased. It hasn't decreased from my understanding in the last year and a half. I think it's remained stable, at least since I've been in this role. But my understanding is that since 2018, um, it's, it's decreased dramatically. Okay, well, this is something that we will ask with uh, uh, to the police commission and uh, because they're supposed to allocate resources based on the needs. And if the needs are higher in downtown and Chinatown and business districts, then why are resources not increasing at the same um, uh, same amount, right? So all same time. So I'll ask that question, but I want to want to follow up with uh, uh, the question on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, the uh, EP, EPL program, just to follow up on Councilor Tank's question. Uh, the measuring the success of that program has any analysis been done on that? Um, we do. Lar? 
Uh, Pilar is, is not here. Um, this is Elaine speaking. Uh, okay. Yes, we have we have done some ongoing analysis and we measure that uh, that program frequently. So we, we know it's it's making a difference. OK, That's got it. Mm -hmm. And on to uh, uh, Mr. Haji on um, listening and learning from people's lived experiences. Uh, uh, do you do you feel that uh, the overall framework for this long term strategy uh, allows city administration to continue to engage with the communities and continue to listen and learn from the lived experiences? I don't believe Mr. Haji is here, by the way. Oh, Mr. Haji, uh, uh, Sharif is not there anymore? I don't see him, uh, Mayor Sophie. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, I'll go to my last question to um, uh, Mr. Han Long. Again, same question uh, that I asked uh, the, the, uh, the DBA folks around, uh, have you seen a visible presence of police in Chinatown over the last few years compared to what your experiences were in the past? I think the community feels that the police prison has been very inexistent, not even currently, but in the past as well. Okay, okay. That is concerning, absolutely, and we will follow up with the uh, police commission. One another idea that came out of the DBA uh, letter that we received was the creation of a space where people can be taken to, right? Uh, once they in, come into contact with social workers. Uh, are you, maybe I'll come back to Panita again. Are you envisioning more of a city run space with appropriate service services uh, so people can access those services or just to kind of a drop in place? I think. I think a longer term solution, I'm we're really looking to Boyle Street Community Services new facility as as a really big part of the long term answer okay. here as being that drop in center with services. But the problem is that's not going to be up and running for maybe a year or more. OK, so it's the short term maybe in the interim. Yeah, maybe it has to be city run. I don't know, but there has to be somewhere. Yeah, because do there there are shelter spaces, and unfortunately, those shelter spaces will be decreasing uh, this summer as well, right? So that's a real concern that if you want to connect people to services, they and, need to go somewhere. Right? And they're not open during the day. The vast yes, majority of our shelter yeah. spaces, and that's when yeah. we're having more issues, is during the day yeah. when the shelters aren't even available. Yeah. No, thank you, everyone, for once again for participating. Really, really value your input. Uh, thank you. So I think it's my turn next. Um, and again, thanks to everyone for their presentations today, for, uh, particularly for coming down to Council Chamber and yeah. being here in person. It's, uh, it's great to be able to have these conversations face to face. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Ms. McBrien, and I really want to dig into your presentation a little bit. And I, so I heard you say that what, what is really needed, and, and not, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So I didn't. I did not hear that this is a bad strategy necessarily. That there's a lot of good things in here. What I hear you saying is that's great, but we also need this. We need this immediate response, and that immediate response includes the physical presence of police officers, a visible presence. And I believe you said deterrent. Can you just dig into that a little bit? So we we have you know beat cops, we have police, not quite on every corner, but they're around, they're, you know, you see them regularly. What does that do? When they're around and we see them regularly, which, yeah. which is partly the problem right now that they're just not, um, it, it definitely deters some of the specific activity that we're concerned about. Um, I think we need to separate some of the issues we know exist and are way more complicated and for which police are not a suitable response and that is mental health issues, housing and, and encampment issues, you know, opioid overdoses and all that, that's separate. When we're talking about, you know, physical and ver verbal assault, theft, vandalism, um, that doesn't happen as much from our experience when there's a notable presence of someone who's gonna hold them accountable. So is it simply that there is someone there to remind uh, everyone else you know, in view or in the space that there is a level of accountability that people expect? Is it simply a reminder of, of the need for accountability, for self-accountability? 
it seems that way. Like some of the stories that we're hearing, and, and Pam Brown isn't here anymore, but she, you know, she's been at Edmonton City Centre for a long time. Stories that I've heard from groups like theirs where their security guards no longer feel like they have any authority. Because if they're trying to stop a behavior, if someone's being harmful, um, the response they're getting is like, what are you gonna do? You know it's gonna be two hours before cops show up. Like, so, so even our security guards, who are really our only line of defense right now when we're talking about actual criminal behavior, they don't feel like they have any means to hold anyone accountable right now. So which means that that disorderly behavior uh, is no longer a deterrent. And so in those, the interaction you just described, that interaction might be with somebody that's dealing with a mental health challenge and or a, a, a drug addiction challenge or both. Uh, but that might just as well be a criminal that is essentially hiding amongst those that are vulnerable, knowing that there's going to be no accountability, no feedback, no retribution. Is that, is that your observation or is that the collective anecdotal observations? I mean, personally and subjectively, like I, I would consider anyone who's acting criminally to be vulnerable themselves most of the time from our experience. They almost always are dealing with some sort of substance reliance or, or they're high themselves or they're probably experiencing homelessness as well. But I, I think it's really hard to separate those things. But yes, absolutely. They're acting in a way ultimately that is either harming themselves, harming people around them, harming property. Um, and, and so yes, they're probably also vulnerable in some way, but they still need to be held accountable. And that's why I think the COP model is a great one where you're pairing law enforcement with outreach. And, and it's similar to the EPS's help model where you, you're able to respond to all those different issues. So there is often an element of physical threat, uh, of, of physical harm. I might get hurt. I might be a security officer and I might get hurt if I intervene. Uh, intervention might be the best thing going forward because this person might hurt themselves. Uh, but when you're talking about somebody that has, this is my understanding, tell me if you agree, that if you're talking about somebody that has consumed or just consumed, that might be a harm to themselves, not everyone is capable of intervening physically. And that's why you might need a police officer to defuse that physical threat. Absolutely. And allow someone to address the other underlying issues. Absolutely. And yet we've heard from some here today that the mere presence of police officers is a threat to those people. So how do we square that? Some are saying we need the police to come with those that will offer the help that is needed in, and match the resource to the problem. Others say any presence at all of a uniform is verboten. I think you're asking a very big question about trust in the police and long-term police reform, but all I know is the crisis situation we're in immediately. But in the meantime, what you're telling us is your observation is more police presence diffuses those situations in the moment that right now are not being diffused. Correct. Thank you. Next we have uh, Councillor Jens. Thank you. I um, thank all of the speakers for coming to share today. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start with, um, uh, if I can follow it with Ms. Bryant as well. We've heard from a lot about concerns around taxation. And as it stands, we're looking at an 8.5% property tax increase, nothing changing. Um, according to the Globe and Mail in 2020, when we look at per, uh, per capita police spending per person, um, Edmonton pays the second highest in Canada next to Windsor, Ontario. Uh, there's concerns about the sustainability of if we are to increase police spending that has a commensurate tax burden. I've heard from some businesses that almost a quarter of their tax bill goes towards policing, that there's concerns about affordability broadly, and we all want to feel safe, but we all want to have the right tool, the right time, the right place in response. So it's concerning to hear that you're, you're suggesting that there doesn't seem to be a police presence downtown. I think I saw somewhere, um, well, I, could you elaborate on that a little, a little further? Yeah, I mean, the, the BEATS program, by and large, you heard from Stacy and others, um, the officers that are downtown, um, I think recently have done fantastic work. My personal experiences, many of our business owners' experiences has been that they're um, doing the hard work, that they're trauma-informed, that they're compassionate people, um, 
and they're there to, to do the, the work of intervening when there is actually crime prevention, response to crime, sometimes crisis intervention that needs to happen. They are severely under-resourced. Um, like I think uh, Stacy gave some of the specific numbers. I think in total, the Downtown Beats program has 18 officers, if I'm not mistaken, but that doesn't even, that's not just downtown. That's like Boyle Macaulay, China, I think that's everything in the, in the sort of the core, the downtown division. Um, so it's, it's seriously insufficient for what the community is asking for, which is that human scale on foot, community oriented policing. That's interesting because we're spending, if we're spending the second highest per person in Canada, but they're not downtown, then they're somewhere else. And this I think gets into that whole conversation about detasking duties, etc. What do we truly need somebody a badge and a gun for like that, like the beats, the beats work. What do we need some? What can we civilianize? What can we do elsewhere? So I um, probably will have a couple questions for administration later around um, the civilian dispatch, et cetera. I was hoping to hear from Mr. Hool. Mr. Hool, you were on the Safer for All task force. You were one of the, the committee. Is, is that correct? That is correct, yes. And I was curious, um, I, I, I mean, personally, I've, I found it a bit problematic that there was a joint response from the Edmonton Police Association and the, the Edmonton Police Service given the concerns around accountability and questions, but I was just interested to hear from you. I mean, your your report made many recommendations around right service, right time, right place, and um, I believe police were a part of your, your committee the, throughout the duration until I think the last meeting. Um, I, was, I would like to hear from you what your response is to the response that we've received from the EPA and the EPS, or sorry, the EPC and EPS. Yeah, I think um, it it covers a lot of the same kind of rhetoric and conversations that we heard throughout the process, even having police officers being involved in the task force work that a lot of the work uh, that EPS was doing was already kind of covering a lot of these issues that we were bringing forward, but we see uh, with a lack of change in the city um, that, that doesn't really reflect in on the ground and that um, these highfalutin ideals aren't really making a change in the day-to-day -day and it misses the point on the task force report. They had another year to analyze it and um, what I read in the, the joint submission was a little bit problematic and felt well short. And then I also take issue with them even in the administration's report, they cons them consulting select members of the task force. We don't know who these select members were. How were they selected? Were they the people that were in favor of the, the Edmonton Police Service or were they people that were against the task force? I don't know because I wasn't one of the select individuals. Thank you. If, if I can go to Mr. Ali, um, the mayor stated the city had, he, he talked at length about how we as Edmonton have been shortchanged by the provincial government in a number of different areas that have had implications on our ability to deliver service. And so um, I was interested in hearing, I, I, I saw you were extolling the COTS program. Uh, I was interested in, in hearing a little more about, you know, how do we as with, with a, a shrinking tax tolerance, how do, how do we, oh, I'm over time. Uh, <laughs> quick, jump in. <laughs> Well, I think what's called the reality is that the provincial government needs to step up and do their job, which is funding these type of programs to give support to community members and to really ensure that people actually have that support available because the reality is, and as we know, a city budget can't do this. It needs to be a provincial budget in partnership with the city, and I hope to see something from the province. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you. I'll, I'll stay with Mr. Ali since he's there. Um, you, you talked about sort of the benefits of the COT program. Um, I, I'm just wondering, the peace officers are still in uniform. So how, how are they perceived differently than um, the EPS uh, uniformed officers? Yeah, absolutely. Well, in my eyes, what I would say, and I would say they're a little perceived differently is because they have a community worker with them. You know, I mean, the reality is that the members of the community have concerns with the behavior that EPS has exhibited and that pl police officers across the country and across the continent have exhibited. So having a social worker there who can kind of understand there and actually has the proper training in, in what they need to do 
can help alleviate that concern for some people. And I think the COTS program is is a phenomenal program and that we should be looking at expanding that program onto the streets rather than the beach program. Okay. Okay. So they, they are, they are viewed differently than not, they, they don't, I guess maybe not as intimidating to some, some people. Is that right? The peace officers? Yeah, I would agree. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and, and Ms. McBrien, um, I'm just wondering then with, would the presence of peace officers be as impactful as, as police officers? It's hard to say. Um, I think our challenge in the past with peace officers has been um, they don't seem to really know what to do a lot of times with, with folks that are in, in a crisis situation or dealing with things like drug-induced psychosis, which I've learned a lot about um, with meth use. And so I, I, I tend to see, and our business owners tend to see, a little bit more hesitancy to act and, and a little bit more sort of just walking by. Um, when it's a peace officer, but I think that started to change recently. Um, we've seen some positive changes in um, what peace officers are willing to, to take on. I think they're under, undergoing some really powerful training right now, power, um, trauma-informed training, and uh, the, the COT program certainly seems to make a big difference in making them more willing to engage. Because I'm just wondering, if, you want, if we want to have more boots on the ground, isn't it sort of more cost-effective um, to have sort of bigger bang for our buck, we would get more peace officers on the ground than we would uh, EPS officers. But if it, but then you want the effectiveness of, of when they are on the ground, I guess. Um, okay. Um, and then my next question is for Ms. Uh, Cunning Cunningham Shipley from EFCL. Is she Hello. Hello. Um, so, I mean, community leagues are great. I've been involved with them, um, but it's it's not all the way. It's it's not how all Edmontonians engage with one another. And I'm and I'm wondering what community leagues are doing to maybe engage those multicultural groups, those faith groups. Um, how how do we connect everyone? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good question and one that we're also really interested in as well. So we did see in the operating grant uh, submission that we got this past year from leagues that there was over 600 connections between leagues and other organizations in the city. And so often that looks like programs or that looks like rentals. And I think what we want to really work towards is how can we move that to partnerships? How can we move that to programs that animate spaces that are open to everybody in the community. So I think there is a lot of work to do, um, Councillor Wright, and I, and I think the opportunity is there, but we know that we are doing this on the backs of people who are volunteers, who are giving their time to their community, who are also trying to run facilities, make sure repairs are done to facilities, and they don't always have the time to do that sort of meaningful partnership work, but that's why EFCL is here to help to build those relationships and to promote some different opportunities in the neighborhood. Yeah, and I think based on the figures that you gave today, those that spent the morning here um, as on a volunteer basis has spent over $50. So we owe them. <laughs> so thank you very much. And um, my next question is for Dr. Francis Cuddy, if he's on the line, not attending to patients. Yep, I'm here. Okay, awesome. Um, you, you talked about the, the uh, a 12 unit complex on one city block. That's currently in existence? Uh, well, these are three buildings at uh, 100th Avenue and 162nd Street. And it's one, uh, each building can fit on a typical city lot. And the beauty of that is they can be distributed throughout the city. And the number 12 units is magical because the literature shows that that's how you can create a sense of a community and that clients actually start helping each other as well. Okay, and are those wraparound supports in place? I'm out of time, but you can answer. Yes, they are, and Jasper Place Wellness will provide them. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you so much. Is EPL still on the line? Edmonton, or sorry, yeah, Edmonton. Yes, Public we are, Library? sorry. Just I'm just do you We're here. Yeah. Do you receive FCSS funding? Um, I, I, I don't believe we do directly. 
Um, no, we're not. We don't think so. But, but we can double double check that. That's part. okay. And then Alberta Health Services is who's originally funded the Sing Sign Laugh and Learn. They're the ones who developed the program. Yeah. Yes, and, and they the funding. yeah they don't fund it. They support us through um, through training uh -huh. and ongoing mentorship just to make sure the program integrity re retain is retained. And yeah. the current um, and the current uh, cost of the program is about four hundred thirty seven thousand. Um, with about 99 percent of that being direct staffing costs yeah i'm going to be quite frank with you i i really struggle with this one as a line item in the context of the discussion we're having and and the the immediate needs that even your executive director highlighted can you speak to how we could be you know for example allocating twenty five thousand to the opioid crisis but 200,000 to, to this. And I, and I worked in early childhood development. I worked with FCSS. I'm a huge fan of preventative stuff. I just am really struggling with why this isn't just part of the 2023 to 2026 budget cycle debate and why this is here as a line item under this one with the immediate needs we're hearing from community. I, I think we see both needs for sure. Um, you know, I just think if you want to invest in children and, and if you, you know, with, with the background, you'll know this, that you have to start, you have to start today in order to, um, influence, you know, 15, 16 years down the road yeah. when the, when the crisis is really happening. So, you know, we just think that there is enough need that, um, and it is something that we can do. It's something positive. Uh -huh. um, and it does support the community as a whole, and it will help bring families back into the community, which also um, makes things a little safe. Okay, and so why, with the stats on the Milner Library, was there no request for any kind of um, additional, you know, p like peace officer or social workers at the Milner Library? Because those stats are pretty staggering. So again, I'm just really trying to square that with the request for Sing, Sign, Laugh and Learn. Well, I think we're, again, we're always trying to balance that. And, um, you know, we see, we see downtown recovery, a part of that as bringing families back. Um, and we know that, yes, the sometimes seeing more, more security doesn't make families feel safer. It makes them feel um, more unsafe. So, but having more programs and bringing people into the space is is really help, helpful. Okay. Um, I think the, my next question. I, I is, I'm just trying to see if they're still on the line. Is is it the wave representative? Is she still here? Fun me. Yes, I am. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I wanted to dig into your, your piece around safe and inclusive spaces for women and gender diverse folks. Um, and I guess just when you see the report in front of us today, do you see that being reflected in, in, any, ac in, in any current actions? So we haven't seen you know, impactful, effectual things being done for that. There are programs that help women um, that are geared towards women, but there are no programs towards gender diverse folks in our city. Um, and it's becoming more and more of an issue. Uh, gender diverse folks fleeing violence, experiencing houselessness, uh, they don't have any specific places to go. Uh, they don't really fit in any current uh, housing um, programs that it, that exist. So that is something that we're looking to engage the the uh, to engage an administration on, and to work that further into this this uh, strategy. Uh, I think this clock is wrong because I do believe I was close yeah, to out of. It's jumping all over the place. So. 
I'll just yield the rest of my time at this point so that we, because okay. I know there's a lot of other speakers. So yeah, I'll thank keep you, track Mr. of it myself. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, Councillor Salvador. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I just have a few questions for Dr. Francis Cuddy as well. Um, but first, thanks to all of our speakers for being with us today. Uh, so yeah, I was quite excited to see the inclusion of bridge healing as one of the, the business cases. Um, I do think it holds a fair amount of potential for having that kind of direct tie to reducing calls for service, um, diversion, and reducing demands on policing, but also um, other entities within the social safety ecosystem. Uh, so I was just wondering, you know, it's presented as a pilot right now, um, but you kind of mentioned this is, you know, can, can fit on a single lot. Is there an intention to have a scalable model? Yeah, uh, sorry, it says low battery. I hope I don't run out. But the, uh, the important thing about this, Councillor Salvador, is that it's a proof of concept to show that there should be a new way to do this. And we also have a pilot that's going to be going through the University Hospital, and the University Hospital Foundation is helping us raise funds there as well. So what the beauty about this project is the building is ready, and we're going to be able to start showing uh, not only the healthcare system, but the community that there's a better way of helping folks that are sort of in need of help. And by the time they reach our emergency department, you know, they've pretty well said that they're willing to come through that door into this environment that at times is not very friendly and to try something different. So you're absolutely correct. This is scalable. It can be reproduced in many different parts of the city. And the reason we chose uh, the 12 units, as I mentioned to the other councillor, is because there's been a lot of proof in the literature to show that you can create that sense of community and that you could interact with the community that it's located in and they become, I won't say protectors, but they, they've got a vested interest in making sure that the clients that come through are very successful. So they're only there for a short period of time. And then Jasper Place Wellness will help us find permanent supportive housing. And they also have, for example, a mattress recycling facility, and they have a, uh, you know, a junk collecting agency where they try and give people the opportunity to actually enhance their skills. And we've been fortunate to partner with Nate, and Nate said that they'd be willing to help us, um, you know, impart some skills on individuals so that they can get involved in the actual construction. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a program in place right now for Indigenous women that are learning the trades that are actually helping to build these buildings. And these buildings don't have gas lines going into them. They're net zero and they're very, very energy efficient. So uh, this is a great opportunity for the city and the healthcare system and the community to step up and say, hey, let's try something differently that's a proof of concept so that we can then do things moving forward and scaling up as well. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that answer. And just to, to dig in a little bit further, I guess the, the unique thing about ERs in particular, functioning as kind of that, that point for, for intervention and diversion, um, I'm trying to think of other other scenarios where there's that level of opportunity, I guess. Um, and obviously, you've been in this space for a really long time. Um, is there something unique about our emergency rooms that can can function as that um, sort of immediate diversion? Yeah, and the beauty is that we're able to do a really good, important needs assessment for that individual and then hand that off, whether it's developing a strategy for harm reduction, whether it's making sure a diagnosed or, or undiagnosed a mental illness is properly diagnosed and treated appropriately, making sure basic conditions like hypertension, asthma, diabetes are well cared for. But more importantly, to say to the patient, listen, you know, uh, thanks for coming today and we're going to help you really get your life back on track. And for those individuals that, for a variety of reasons, are not able to get their life on track, we can identify them early and create an environment that's safe for them as well. So, you know, it's such a simple concept, but it's taken us three years to get here. And so uh, seeing the city take an interest in this, uh, I can tell you it's, it's, it's so reassuring to know that, uh, you know, councillors like yourself and others and the mayor are interested in at least discussing this. And with the support that we've had from, you know, a lot of uh, members of city administration, uh, I think that this proof of concept will revolutionize how patients that are in uh, distress in our emergency departments are handled and not just turned back onto the street because it's causing a lot of moral distress 
for healthcare workers, knowing we should be doing a lot more. So I can't tell you how encouraging it is to just have this conversation. Absolutely. Well, I, I appreciate you being here for this conversation and um, yeah, excited about the potential that this concept holds. So I'm, I'm out of time, but I'll come back for another round. Thanks so much. Okay. And I apologize, but I, I've, I've really got to go play doctor here. I'm getting some dirty looks. Okay. <laughs> Bye-bye. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. I have a number of questions, but um, this is a bit of a point of order for you, Mr. Chair. I understand that one of the speakers today may be in the employ of a member of council, and I want to give uh, that councillor the opportunity to just give, like, reiterate whether or not that individual is speaking on behalf of their office or not. I'm not quite sure how to handle that. I just, I'm concerned about a code of conduct here and I just wanna make sure that that employee is protected uh, and that administration understands that that, um, that that perspective is not necessarily the perspective of the counselor's office and hasn't been, you know, and, and that person retains their, their individuality and their independence. So I have encouraged that counselor to make that employee of that person known or for that employee to self-declare and, and that advice was not taken yet anyway. So I can I can yield the floor to Councillor Stevenson or... Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, and thank you, Councillor Hamilton, for the opportunity. So um, uh, happy, happy to share that uh, uh, Mr. Hool, who presented earlier, uh, works as a strategic advisor for me. Um, he's speaking on his own behalf. Uh, I would never want uh, his, his work with me to affect his ability to speak for our community and to share his opinion. So uh, happy to answer any questions if councillors have questions to that. Um, but he is speaking, speaking his own voice and I encourage him to do so. Thank you for that. I just wanted to, to make sure that uh, I think everything was transparently understood for, especially from administration's perspective. Um, I had a question for uh, uh, the members from REACH. Um, I think, it, Lisa, are you still present in the meeting? I, I think she may have had to depart. I, I don't know, Councillor Cartmel, if that's in fact the case. Yeah, I don't uh, see her on the videos, video windows, I'm sorry. All right, that's that's too bad. Um, I guess I'll reserve my questions about potential collaborations with REACH for um, administration. I guess uh, to Ms. Uh, McBrien, um, you're, you're quite on the spot today. Um, something I think that has been an ongoing tension in these discussions is um, the investment that council and administration has made in, um, uh, I'm going to say alter alternate responses and what we're hearing today, which is, uh, I'm going to say alternate responses other than Edmonton Police Service. So it could be uh, caught community uh, led responses all the way up to TPOs. Um, and my question, uh, I guess, to you is that that is a bit different than what we're hearing from members of community today. Um, are you, I, I want some I guess some clarification is, is the strategy that we've talked about that tiered response effective? And are you talking about a gap or in, in the sort of our collective response or are you talking about a reallocation of existing resources? Thank you, Councillor. It's, it's a really good question and one that we've grappled with and struggled with. And um, at times I think as community members, we feel like we're we're having to try to make decisions like that or understand that without having enough information to be able to do that. So what I can say is we, we fully support the strategy because we've all learned, I think any of us who've spoken, how complicated and, and how far back in individuals' lives the trauma goes that often results in, in whatever point they're in today. Um, so we fully get it and fully support this much bigger um, more comprehensive long-term approach to, to solving, in air quotes, uh, community safety and well-being. Um, but what the problem is, is that we know we won't see the outcomes of that work for upwards of a year. Um, and so being in a state of crisis, as, as you've heard, many are feeling like they're in today and not seeing 
again, this maybe is just perception, but not seeing any efforts in the short term to address the reality on the ground. So I think it's a both and. I don't think it's, from our perspective, saying this is the wrong way to spend the money, but it's just a really big concern that there's not actions in the business plans presented that will make a difference in the next 90 to 120 days. All right. Um, this is a little bit of a whimsical question, so my apology. Um, what, is, what is the thing that isn't here, or maybe is here, that if you could wave your magic wand, um, what, like, and, and make that thing that would make a difference in the 90 to 120 days happen, what would that be? Because I, I, I've had this question as well from people. It's like, what's the thing we can do? Um, so I guess maybe it's my challenge to you. What's the, the bold idea um, that may be unfeasible? Yeah, I think a big one is the daytime drop-in um, capacity, facility, something, because I know there was an attempt to do that last year um, with 105 mm -hmm. and 105 that kind of fell apart. And we were, I know there were concerns for the neighbors immediately surrounding that site, but we were incredibly hopeful about that because that is exactly the kind of service provision and spaces made available that at least will give outreach workers, law enforcement, whoever it is, somewhere to take people who clearly just ca cannot be in the public realm in the state that they're in. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you. Maybe just following on that that thread with um, with Ms. McBrien. Um, so yeah, hearing that the daytime drop in would be would make the biggest difference. You had mentioned sort of uh, you know one hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollar sort of ramp up of the Yeg Ambassador program. Just wondering if that's funding that you think you could get out the door you know this summer in the, in that next you know ninety to one hundred and twenty days. Yeah, absolutely. And and we're trying to figure out if it is just, un, if it's under the banner of YEG Ambassadors Through Reach or if it's a separate program that is just run by us. So we're, we're working through that right now, but absolutely we plan to have that up and running in the summer. But I just want to reiterate, we're really nervous about sending those people out without being matched by uh, law enforcement support the way that the COT teams are. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks for being here today. I'm, I'm going to bounce around fairly quickly, but thank you again for representing the downtown. Um, well, actually, before we leave the downtown, Ms. Brown, I just wanted to turn to you um, and, you know, really just to applaud the journey that you and your team have been on in terms of the, the approach that you take at City Centre. I really value uh, what you've done in our community. Um, but just wanted to maybe... Um, you know, maybe echo what was what Miss McBrien was mentioning is that would would you also really be looking for that day shelter capacity so that people end up having an alternative to to being in city center mall, for example? I think that's a, a big part of the problem is there is nowhere to go. Uh, downtown is the is a, a transit hub. Um, city center is right on that hub, and it's uh, it's it's seen as uh, somewhat of a community center, and and so it it is the only place to go. Um, for fear of being ridiculed, I think uh, the city could hand out amenity passes to people who are um, registered with different social services agencies as well. Give them something to look forward to. During COVID, I mean, I got to watch Netflix. What did they get to do, right? It, it, it imbalanced their mental health even worse than it, it was for many of them because uh, they had nothing. They had nothing to to take their mind off uh, their, their frustration. So I, they need um, something better than the sidewalks. Great, thank you so much for that. And again, thank you to you and your team. Um, maybe going to, to another facility that does end up being being one of the places that are available for downtown. So back, back to our EPL partners uh, with Ms. Jones and Ms. Rhodes. <laughs> Um, so, so there was some excellent questioning from my colleagues earlier, but I did just want to dig in just to, to confirm that the additional funding for the uh, Sing, Sign, Laugh and Learn program, that that would be sort of intentionally targeted at, for at-risk families rather than just sort of expanding the project more broadly uh, for, for all Edmontonians. Not that all, all Edmontonians don't need access, but just wanted to make sure that we're being very intentional with how we're targeting that funding. Well, we were intending actually that it wouldn't be specifically targeted, that we would, we would use it just to expand the program across the board. 
Um, however, we are looking at areas of need constantly and constantly in, in conversation with our, you know, with our community led team just to, to see where the need is greatest. So, so not intentional, but you know, that is a factor in what we do. Okay, and then just a consideration about some of the other programs that I know EPL runs that are more targeted for at-risk families. Is there any consideration of diverting additional funds to those programs? Um, well, not not under this. We were specifically thinking sing sign for this, but um, yes, we, we are always looking at changing where we put our money. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, and we are doing some strategic planning with the board. Um, in May, and so after having been part of this discussion today, we'll make sure that that's factored into some of those discussions as well. Great, thank you very much. Uh, turning now, uh, Mr. Shu and Ms. Irfan. So, you know, as, as evidenced by Sing Sign, Laugh and Learn, I, I fully agree about the importance of early intervention uh, and also that youth component. So, uh, you know, I really appreciate you, you sharing the work that um, the Youth Council has done in that regard. Just wondering if you think there there needs to be uh, some more specific strategies and policies around youth interventions and youth programming as part of this, this strategy work. If either of you are still on the line, sorry, I couldn't check. Okay, I'll go and then I'll pass it off to Hanson to um, also say his piece. But yeah, totally. I think that starts off with first having youth present in here at the table. Like within this meeting right now, um, uh, I can, the amount of youth in this meeting is less than the number of five, which, which says a lot, especially in the context of that most of these policies pertaining to community safety and well-being directly impact our future and us currently here in the present. So the main, like, the main facet or the main step that I see as of right now that can be done to kind of move towards um, youth implementation within these strategies or to get youth perspective is to find a way to have youth have a seat at the table and not just youth from organizations that you know are <laughs> sponsored by the city of Edmonton or are funded by the city of Edmonton which we're so grateful for but having youth from all across Edmonton who experience some of the more um, some of the more super effects of what community and safety can look like and now I'm going to pass it on to Hanson. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Aisha. For I, I think you know those are all really, really strong points that you brought up, and I don't really have too much to add. But I um, also do want to emphasize that I think um, in working with like really any group for municipal policy work, I think that it's important to have um, to be receptive um, and to at least like give punctual and timely updates. Um, I think that this is something that we really would have appreciated during um, our own initiative when. We did indeed receive updates um, a year, um, you know, after we had put out all of our recommendations. But I think um, it also comes down to um, really just taking an active approach and reaching out to youth um, instead of also kind of relying on this one way street of communication, because I think that it's really important to recognize that there are a lot of barriers that youth face um, and really just being within these discussions. Um, so um, yeah, I, I think that just firstly um, being punctual and uh, you know maintaining consistent communication is definitely something that's really important to collaborative decision making. And secondly, just um, taking on an active approach in reaching out to youth. Um, but other than that, uh, yeah, nothing else to add. That's great. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Principe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Sinha, are you still online? Yes, I'm here. Oh, hi. Uh, so when you were speaking, you, um, you had said that you did hear that a lot of people were in support of seeing more policing. That's what you heard today. That's also what I heard today. But uh, ERAC does not necessarily agree with that. So I was just wondering, who did you consult to come to this conclusion? Did you consult with the Chinatown Business Association or Mr. Leong at, uh, with Chinatown Transformation Collaborative Society? 
Actually, Mr. Liang's presentation was the one I enjoyed the most, I'd say. Sorry for us, but it was such an excellent presentation. And thank you for asking the question. So I, I'd like to re, I'd like to strongly say that it's not my individual opinion, and it's also not Eric's opinion, that in the work that Eric has been doing over the last year and a half and almost two years, especially around community safety, especially on attacks um, against Black Muslim women and then working on the anti-racism strategy, for the people who've been involved there, and I would say, for example, Sisters Dialogue, ASEC, the African Council for Civic Engagement, um, I, and I don't want to speak on behalf of these folks, but a lot of grassroots BIPOC organizations, um, th their, their response for community safety isn't more policing. It's more investment in social programming and solutions that will help heal in society and help bridge those fa factors and reduce um, risk factors. And so I am also noticing that a lot of these uh, people aren't speaking here today. And I would suggest that there is a level of disenfranchisement and disappointment because they have been working on safety for a year and four years and weren't engaged with in this process. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Um, and Ms. Oborowski, you had discussed a, AI tech as being an avenue for us to explore, you know, to help uh, assist, but that's more, I'm imagining for more longer term that's goals, correct. correct? That's correct, yes. So uh, we, yeah, obviously we're aligned with the CWSS, but also we have our own initiatives with long-term solutions in place mm -hmm. Okay. and great. getting to root cause. That's great, I thank think you. that's fantastic. Thank you. And, Mr. Leong, um, so as you know, Ms. Oborowski was saying, you know, that's good for a long-term goal, but for short-term, what do you want to see in the short-term? What do we need? <clears throat> Thank you for, for that question, Councillor. Um, I think even before coronavirus, uh, Chinatown was on its knees. Um, the past budget, I, I know that there was a discussion about having an interdisciplinary program in Chinatown that would combine some EPS, fire, similar to a program that you have with COT, because these are complicated problems and they, they, they need feedback from all places. So I think what we're looking for is, you know, an allocation um, of this, some of this long-term funding for short-term purposes. The truth is our businesses need a bit of reprieve. They need a breath. Um, coronavirus has kicked them in the mouth and they need some time to build their business back. And that's what they're asking for is a short-term before some of those long-term benefits are realized that we can have a bit of breathing room. So absolutely, I think uh, if, if there was a short-term ask, it'd be to set up an interdisciplinary program, so we'd have caught for specifically Chinatown and downtown and area. And so you were mentioning police and fire. Yeah, so uh, prior to, um, I think there was uh, another budgetary uh, meeting before, um, there was a discussion with the EPS and with fire and and other EMS and, and everyone involved um, to have a coordinated approach to deal with some of these problems that we have here with encampments and you know broken windows and what you have you. <clears throat> and then that was pulled um, because of some funding that uh, the city had, had pulled from the EPS. Um, and that was extremely disappointing to the community. It's something that, again, um, we put a lot of faith and hope and time into developing these relationships for not. Yeah, thank you very much for that answer. Thank you. That's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, is uh, Ms. McBride still on the line? I'm sorry, who's that, Councillor Paquette? Ms. McBride? Yeah. Can you hear me clearly? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Ms. McBride is with us in chambers. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, this is a very frustrating uh, issue to talk about for so many reasons. Um, but one thing I was curious about is um, just from your experience and uh, the experience of your organization in watching this unfold in our streets, have you like what is what have you noticed as the trend, and and to what do you attribute the trend of uh, uh, as far as uh, perhaps more uh, need? occurring on our streets than ever before. 
Thank you, Councillor. It's a it, it's another very big question. Um, yeah. We've certainly noted a lot more aggression um, and actual. So when I started in this role about a year and a half ago, um, often when when the term safety was used, it was really more referring to discomfort. We were seeing um, a lot of our most vulnerable on our on our streets and sidewalks and, and overdoses and. Um, it has changed in the last three to six months, I would say, and we're seeing a lot more aggression, people acting erratically, uh, violent incidents, um, verbal outbursts. Um, I wish I had an answer as to what I would attribute that to, um, but I'm sure it's a very, very complicated set of factors. Yeah, I think, I suppose it's safe to say that it's likely um mental health issues and addictions, which are sort of interrelated? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. So this is one of the frustrations that we have on the city level, is that uh, this is on our doorstep, this is on our streets, and we have to deal with it. There's no two ways about it. But at the same time, what we're dealing with are the branches of a tree whose roots are uh, issues that are very difficult for a municipality to uh, address. So I'm just wondering, do you feel in your conversations with other orders of government that everyone is on the same page in understanding what each governmental responsibility actually is when we're talking about uh, the issues that we're seeing on our streets? Because this is not just um, contained in Edmonton. Obviously, we see this happening in Calgary and Vancouver and Winnipeg and Ottawa and Montreal, like across Canada and across Alberta. So. Do you feel like uh, in these conversations that everyone understands and is on the same page as far as what the legislated responsibilities and fiscal responsibilities are of each level of government? No, we don't. We feel like a political football in every one of those conversations, no matter which level of government we're talking to. It's like we're trapped in a never-ending Spider-Man meme. With everyone yeah, no, this is exactly my experience as well, which is why I asked. <laughs> I love that imagery, though. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so... Um, I, I, I'm working on a uh, on a motion that would ask for that clarity and to ask federal and provincial uh, leaders back to the table once that report is ready so that we can just lay it all out on the table and so that the public has something and so that your organization has something uh, to hold different levels of government accountable so we can actually finally get on the same page and move in the same direction. Do you feel that would be helpful? It would if it could be done tomorrow. <laughs> Frankly. I'm pretty sure it could be done in pretty short order. I mean, it's not, it's not as if we don't have this information. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's about it. So, Mr. Chair, I'll be working on something. And if it's possible, and maybe I'll just send it over to you if, if you feel so inclined to make such a motion. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Thank uh, you. Happy to do that on your behalf. Uh, moving to the second round then. Uh, and I'll take one more turn just quickly. And I'm sorry, uh, Panita. <laughs> you become the spokesperson here. Um, both Councillor Jans and Councillor Hamilton touched on something that I just want to touch on very briefly. Councillor Jans offered some perspective about, you know, uh, percentage of police budgets and, you know, maybe if I might just add a bit more uh, in the chart that's referred to in uh, this news report, Edmonton is middle of the road. And so I guess maybe not to repeat the question, but, but in a slightly nuanced way, um, do you think that there should be I heard you say we need more police resources downtown. Part of the report we have, first of all, speaks to putting uh, $415,000 into training of peace officers, which are essentially bylaw officers, euphemistically. Do you think that's a worthwhile investment? And should that money be redirected? Or if there is a redirection required, should dollars be put to more police resources? I do think there's an opportunity for peace officers to be more effective in these areas, like I mentioned, um, to be more, feel more empowered and capable of intervening. So I don't think it's not a worthwhile investment from my experience. Um, but the, the reallocation question is a really, really difficult one because we do know that we want to see a better resource downtown beats program. And when we say that to EPS, as we have many times over the past year, year and a half, at least for me personally, every time we're told um, they're they are not able to do that with the resources they have. We have no means... Of testing that. Of testing that. Yeah. And so... 
and that's a question I, that is that needs to be asked. It's not a question for today, and and you know the we've had uh, discussions and interactions between council and the police commission to talk about these things. So maybe that's for a further conversation. But I, I just wonder about the effectiveness. Going back to your comments, that there's there's a number of even private enterprises, private shops that have gone the route of hiring their own security police or security officers as you said, to no particular positive effect. Should we be doing the same thing if, if they're not police officers? Do our peace officers run the same risk of intimidation and, and ineffectiveness and, and essentially a, a, you know, not recognized as people as a, of authority? Yeah, it is, it is helpful to have them around, certainly. And again, I think we see a lot more effectiveness when they're paired with social workers, a lot, a lot, a lot. But it, uh, it's a massive investment to do that at the scale that needs to be done. And EPS is actually doing a similar uh, type of work with the HELP program, which we're very supportive of. I wish they were out patrolling instead of just responding to officer um, calls. Um, but that sort of a model is really the only way that we can see the effectiveness we need to see. Can I, is it fair to say that what we're talking about today, you and I, is, is trying to solve the, the security and safety concerns that the average ordinary citizen is expressing. Uh, we've heard a lot about how much we need to invest in the supports for vulnerable populations and vulnerable persons. But the, there seems to be a perspective that's been lost, and that is the perspective of the average ordinary person that would otherwise come downtown and visit and support the enterprises that is here, that are here. Yeah, absolutely. For the average person, whether they're feeling uncomfortable or whether they're feeling unsafe, they're, it's probably coming out the same way. But the reality is it's influencing their ability to move freely about our downtown. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Sohi is next. Uh, you're on mute, Mayor Sohi. All right, so sorry about that. Uh, just to follow up on that, uh, the $5 million that has been allocated by the province to downtown recovery, I know portion of that will go to DPA and portion of that will go to city. Uh, maybe that could be a source of funding to expand uh, programs like HELP and EAG Ambassador. Just want to get your thoughts on that, uh, uh, Benita. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I would love to have that conversation with the province, but as I mentioned uh, to Councillor Tang, I don't know anything about when or how. Yeah, or, or, yeah we absolutely have to work with them to find out the parameters. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the the $1 million that the strategy is uh, allocating for uh, Indigenous-led shelter, uh, you know, that could be something that could be expended with that $5 million to have a day program or day drop-in with the Indigenous-led initiatives, not by just regular uh, uh, people who run the shelters now, right? But uh, Indigenous-led day, day drop-in shelter along with uh, the 24-hour uh, shelter, uh, 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 out of this strategy, right? So I think just want to get your thoughts on that. Maybe I'll think of uh, making, making a subsequent motion once we have dealt with the report that how we use that $5 million more effectively to improve safety and wellness in, in, in the downtown and Chinatown area. Yeah, well, I, I can speak for us for the, the $1 million that's, that's marked for us. We're very supportive of that money going entirely to community safety initiatives. When we okay, good. That, 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 that is good to know. Yeah. That's good to know because that gives us some money to work with the EPS. If they are willing to allocate their existing resources, we can supplement that with the, uh, 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 the, this $4 million from city and five, $1 million from DBA to maybe hire more social workers and supplement the uh, ambassador program and the, uh, or recreate that because that doesn't exist anymore and uh, maybe create more uh, social workers for the, uh, for the health program. Okay, that's the only question I had, uh, you know, Mr. Chair. I will uh, think of making a subsequent motion uh, uh, related to getting more information on that $5 million and supplementing that with some of the programs that already exist. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, next, we have Councillor Jans. Thank you. Is Mr. Houle still online? Uh, I am, yes. Yeah, th thank you. So I've been listening to the conversation today, and, and uh, we all, like, I'm hearing from a lot of people, we want a well-resourced police force. And then I look at the data here, uh, and Edmonton pays the second highest per capita next to Windsor 
Uh, that's an August 2020 article. I'm, I'm not sure if I could share it with my colleagues. We know that we pay the highest wages for police in Alberta. We know that almost a quarter of our taxes go to police. We know that the Edmonton police have an airplane, that they're buying a second airplane for $4.5 million, that they're buying, they have two helicopters at $6 million each, that over the last three years, they spent $24 million on cars. And we, there's still all these unknowns about like, how much do we spend on policing for overtime? And I guess what's, what's frustrating for me is that, you know, we want a well-resourced police force. We want the police force doing things that only police can do. Yet we're hearing from a no number of folks here that we're not getting the police where we need them. And I, you know, I, I see just the other day on online, uh, um, there's seven police officers clearing an encampment. There's, uh, whenever I have a, a traffic incident and I have to turn in paperwork, I'm handing over paperwork to a high trained, high paid, educated police officer with a badge and a gun pushing paper. Uh, there's a number of these other areas. And I thought to myself, gee, we should have a, like a task force or something about this to look into. How do we all be, you know, how, how, how do we get to safer for all? And, and I guess, um, it feels like we're spinning our wheels here today. And I just wanted to hear from you as you were on the committee for a year looking into these questions. What, what do you think, what do you think we're missing? Um, to be blunt, it sounds like a lot of people haven't read the Saver for All report and don't know the recommendations that are within it because it speaks to having police do the right role in the right place. That could be doing more beats. That could be doing things and moving the resources they have, which have been escalating year after year, regardless of a freeze, and using them more appropriately. That means maybe not duplicating work with an animal control unit, maybe not having a plane and a helicopter team, maybe not having... Um, commercial vehicles, uh, inspection units, when that, a lot of that work is done with the sheriffs and other people like that, there's a little bit of overlap happening. Maybe that some of those officers can be redirected to patrolling downtown. And I've listened to some talk about a drop-in center or something like that. The task force did recommend and ask the city to explore a 24-7 crisis diversion center that would work with crisis diversion teams to keep people from being re-traumatized and re-institutionalized and just being placed back under the streets. All of that stuff is in the Safer for All report. And another piece that's missing, I think, is the petty theft that's being driven by addiction. When I see the recommendation here of 25 grand for um, opioids, um, I'm, I'm wondering if, if the Safer for All Commission made any recommendations around safe consumption sites, safe supply, decriminalization, harm reduction, pieces like that. There was some conversation around safe supply, around the need to look at decriminalizing and definitely looking at de-escalation of fines um, and things like that, which we know is creating the crises that we're in now. We're not looking at a crisis down the road. We are in a crisis state right now with the relationship between BIPOC individuals and the police, and it's troubling that we can't seem to connect with that and see, keep going around in circles around more police is the answer when we have more than an adequately funded police force right now. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Tang. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I guess very quickly to Ms. McBrien. Uh, just follow up on what the mayor said that if necessary, uh, you know, you'll be open to hiring potentially other personnel, including social workers. But you also mentioned that some of the challenge with initiatives like COT is the scaling and the expanding due to the capacity issue. How confident are you in deploying that kind of fund to hire people for this year? For if, 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 say, if you do get that fund in the end. Yeah, thank you for that. It's, it's a, it's a primary concern for sure, um, which is why we're trying to learn from our colleagues who have done it successfully. Um, and working with REACH to perhaps use the framework that already exists with the Egg Ambassadors and some of the job descriptions and training and all that that already exists so that we can do that as quickly as possible. Yeah, and I'm hearing capacity issues mentioned by, you know, Ms. Brown in terms of the, some of the security and, um, and I'm hearing this from other sectors as well. It's, um, and I guess just one last, uh, just one some last thing I want to check with you. You mentioned that the the B officer numbers have remained steady in the last a year and a half or so. Of course, it's questions I'll ask later on um, for Wednesday's meeting with the police as well. But you mentioned that the decrease has been happening since 2018. So this is prior to COVID, prior to the 2020 public hearing, et cetera. Correct. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure to be honest. Okay. I've been trying to track down the specific information on yep. that for 
a year and a half, and I'm not Happy totally to. sure. And yeah. we'll ask administration that too. Um, I saw Reach just joined, if they're online. A very quick question about your methodology on social return on investment. Well, maybe not, they're not. I'm here. Oh, Hi. great. Um, you know, SROI um, has its flaws as well, uh, particularly when it comes to systems change. Um, but you have referenced it, and I'm aware, very much aware of uh, some pretty, I think, incredible evaluation work that Reach is doing. But can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, there's there's no doubt that SRI does have flaws. There's some evaluator evaluators who, um, if you speak to them, they they are a little more critical of it. But I think that it's a really good um, indicator of of like a sort of about number because like the problem is is that with the problem with SROI is that when you especially when you look at well when you look at everything it's you have to make some assumptions and so and you're you can't account for everything that's going to happen in in something like a child's life so say you have a um after school program and a kid attends it um you're, you're saying that they if they attend it five days a week um, they probably get um, they probably get uh, value from mentoring and leadership, and that stuff is going to help them later on in life. And um, but we don't know what other things have interacted with their life necessarily. And so um, maybe they had a mentor or a neighbor who or some sort of natural support that we're not accounting for. Yeah. Um, and so that that value isn't isn't a, in SROI, but um, so it's a little bit harder to track. So it's Fair definitely enough. not perfect, uh, but it gives us a good approximation. Great. No, I'm glad you mentioned assumptions because I think that I have lots of questions on that for administration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure who to address this question to because I, I recognize that the the concentration and immediate need, I think, is, is for the downtown core. Um, but... If we're speaking of safer for all, how do we make the rest of our community um, outside the core safe? Like, will, and again, I don't know who to ask because it seems to be focused more on downtown core, the, the people that are presenting here today. I'm just wondering, Ms. Cunningham Shipley from EFCL, sort of, you have a, a wider outlook, I guess, maybe? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Wright. It is a really good question, and I think the downtown definitely has some really specific urgent needs that I think are it's really important that we address here today. But I do think around the city we are seeing changes in our demographics, changes in our neighbourhoods, you know, changes that a lot of people are facing. And so I think it is important that we look at how we can address those ongoing. So, you know, my proposal here today was to really look at that investment across the city is how can we support all leagues to do more investment in terms of doing those collaborative partnerships with other organizations, cultural groups to animate spaces in their local neighborhoods so that people feel connected, that they feel like they belong, that they feel like they're getting at that preventative piece that I think we've talked about a fair bit today as well. I hope that helps, but yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a tough conversation. Do you feel there's any specifics in the, the recommended actions or funding requests that would address a, a, a broader range of, of Edmontonians? Uh, you know, not off the top of my head, Councillor Wright. No, I, it, seems, it seems very specific and I think it's all really needed. I don't see anything really in here that would address the wider range of the City of Edmonton at this point. All right, thank you very much, and I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Councillor Salvador. Oh, thank you. So just a question for uh, maybe Mr. Mr. Hool. Um, you know, it was mentioned a few times by, by a few of our speakers, just the importance of making sure we're sending the right people to the right calls. And I've been thinking a fair amount about the integrated call evaluation and dispatch center. And, and I guess one thing that stuck out to me um, in the police commission's response to the safer for all report was that uh, they, they didn't really support the inter or sorry, the independence of the uh, integrated call evaluation dispatch center. They still wanted to um, sort of retain 
a bit of a backbone role. Um, wondering if you can speak to that, because I, I guess my understanding was that the independence part was pretty important. Yes, thank you, Council Salvador. The independence and the independent aspect of an integrated call center is paramount because that is where we ensure that biases that anyone may hold does not enter into the call center from the get-go. It doesn't uh, influence how calls are addressed. We saw that there are a number of um, the work that EPS does, a number of them do not require police officer responses whatsoever, yet they send an officer sometimes anyways. And and then we see things like mental health crises being escalated because officers show up. And that is because the call center is policed by, programmed by, trained by police officers and former police officers. So they come in with this policing mentality where the first point of response should always be an officer in uniform with a gun and a badge. And we know from evidence in our communities that is not always the case. So that's why independence is paramount because while we start hiring the civilians and other people like that to take the calls, to administer the calls, maybe we'll see more social service agencies getting used. Maybe we'll see more ambulances instead of uh, an officer responding all of the time. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And I'll, I'll follow up uh, some questions to administration on that. But um, I was also curious, you know, when we're talking about uh, sort of the, the intention to um, relieve some of that pressure on policing by by maybe not necessarily having police show up to low risk or low acuity calls. Um, I picked up on the Denver model where they're actually using, you know, mental health clinicians paired with a paramedic to, to respond. Um, do you know if those types of models have been explored locally? I don't believe they've been explored locally. The The clearest example that we know works and is working and is having good good results is the 24-7 crisis diversion operated through the Bissell Center, which, again, we, we make reference to it about being this fantastic resource, yet we're seeing a lack of in investment in that resource. Maybe instead of hiring more caught officers and, and social workers, maybe if we invest into the 24 seven crisis diversion, maybe it'll have a little bit better outcome. And I'm, I'm a little bit troubled that that hasn't been explored uh, in the report either. Great, thank you. Thank you. I believe that concludes questions of our speakers. Uh, the speaker, our, our request list was changing a little bit back and forth, so just double checking. Very good. Thank you all very much for spending your time with us today. We very much appreciate it. Appreciate your insights and your advice. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about. And we will now turn to questions of administration. Thank you, Mr. Kerbold. So we have our uh, administration team reassembled, except for our guest. Is our guest available online? Yes? Okay. Very good. Uh, we'll start then with Mayor Sohi. You're on mute, uh, Mayor Sohi. I turn my camera off here because I'm kind of upside down here. Uh, all right, I'll, uh, is is a, a, a commission chair uh, part of the delegation, Mr. Chair? Uh, no, uh, he's not, Mayor Sohi. Oh, I see. Okay. 
uh, and so we don't have the ability to ask questions to, uh, to EP, e EPS or Commission. Uh, I would just just give me a second, Mayor Sohi, if you could. Yeah, our our understanding. Well, our our understanding is questions can be asked uh, of EPS and the Commission because they submitted documents for the Safer for All uh, appendix. Okay. Do you want to confirm that? Clerk? I yeah, just so I would, it might yeah. be it might be helpful just because some people can't see what's going on in the room and we might not have the best camera angles. So it might be possible um, either the clerk or the chair could introduce the complete delegation. So there's a delegation before you today on these items from both administration and the police. And if it would be okay with the, the chair, perhaps there could be an introduction made. That way, everybody's aware of who they can direct their questions to. Okay, I did not realize we had members of the commission and the service as part of the delegation. So maybe we could do that. Go through everyone who's here. Who's yeah, sorry, position. Chair. I, we they weren't doing presentation, but they are available to answer questions. Okay, let's just go through a round of in, of introductions so the people online that can't see the whole room know who's here. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Uh, from the Commission today, we have uh, myself, John McDougall, the Chair of the Commission. We have Commission Member Jody Callahoo Stonehouse, and we have our Executive Director, Mark uh, Matt Baker. Matt Barker. And from the service, Chief McPhee. Yeah, thanks. Uh, myself, uh, Dale McPhee, Chief of Police, uh, Chief of Staff, Justin Crickler, uh, Lori. Uh, Lorenz from our Value and Impact Division and Michelle Greening, uh, Staff Sergeant of the Chief's Office. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Mayor Sohi. Uh, I was not aware of any of that, so uh, I cut you off inadvertently. We'll start your time again, uh, and over to you, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much, and no worries about that. Uh, so uh, to Commission Chair and uh, through Commission Chair to uh, Chief, uh, you heard from... Um, community members from downtown as well from Chinatown that uh, there has not been significant increase in the resources, uh, uh, policing resources uh, in those communities uh, and crime has and disorder has significantly increased. So I just want to know uh, uh, but how do you how you determine reallocation or allocation of resources? Why would more resources not go toward where crime is more prevalent? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor, and I'll, I'll take a stab at that uh, question. So first of all, we are uh, chatting with uh, downtown as well as the Chinese business community, including 118th and uh, Arts on the App. And not going to get into the past decisions because they are what they are, but uh, yeah. we did put it in before you before. This was our prediction in relation to this. We have to remember only 19.1% of our calls are from the downtown. The reality is we totally agree with uh, the downtown that visibility needs to increase, but with the inability to actually put additional resources, what that means is we're going to have to take from another area to do that. We're currently undergoing that process right now. Okay. In relation to uh, the beats, there are 21 officers assigned to beats downtown currently, which is higher than any other particular area. There's also 98 patrol constables assigned, but that's obviously a larger jurisdiction, as well as we have 34 suppression and 33 disruption uh, folks that are working in this as well. We are working on an ops plan to figure out how we can move resources. As we've said, we've had significant reduction in crime, but we also said earlier on several months ago that the predictor was downtown, 118th, Chinese business community are the areas, including the LRT, that are seeing yeah. upticks, but again, we have to pull them from somewhere else. So they're going absolutely. To I think that's that's the case with the, every other organization, chief, right? Where uh, have to allocate resources based on need, right? And you, you need to pull the resources from somewhere else. So I appreciate that, right? So uh, and one might another question is related to uh, uh, if we were to if city were to work with DBA and look at the possibility of using that five million dollar for immediate needs of the downtown and the Chinatown and supplement some of the work that you're doing, would you be able to have additional resources reallocated to help supplement some of the, help help 
uh, uh, teams work or some of the other proactive initiatives that you have under, uh, underway? That's a currently what we're looking at in relation to the SOP, and hopefully that will help. But just to, just to bring some light to that, 19.1% uh, of the calls are coming to the downtown, or uh, calls are coming to the downtown. But we also have 279 people off of work right now on some type of disability or abilities. Oh, I see. So yeah. we're uh, down 190 sworn officers. So we're going to make this happen, but it's going to be collapsing, whether it's White Avenue, whether it's things that are also high need. We are going to focus on this because we are committed to helping our uh, folks in need in relation to our business community and other citizens down there. But ideally, why this is so important and where the city manager and I have been talking, this calls for everybody going in the same direction. And I yes. think that plan that's here, no more in relation to blaming whether it's the police or blaming whether the CSOs, we need to be going in the same direction. And police absolutely I'm in full agreement with you need to be in this space in a big way, regardless of what some might think. No, thank you, Chief. I, I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, we should never be looking at uh, uh, pointing fingers. We should always be looking for collaboration and better ways of finding uh, to work together because these are community challenges and our people are hurting. Uh, there's a lot of pain out there and there's a lot of disorder and crime that is scaring away people from downtown and China and hurting business. So we need to find ways to... Uh, work better i i appreciate that uh, that commitment but i have other uh, questions maybe i'll come back to uh, later in a second round mr chair uh, thank you mr sohi next we have yeah. councillor tang uh thank you mr chair um and thank you for the delegation here today um uh, you know I, this has been a pretty hefty report um I appreciate your commentary, Mr. Corbell, at the beginning around the timeline of release. Uh, it wasn't a lot of time to process, um, but I also see that there's a ton of work that went into this, so I want to recognize that. Um, I have several layers of questions, but I want to start by following up on some of the pieces that our speakers spoke on. Um, I guess, number one, for the provincial funding, any update on that? Because it sounds like from the community end, there there isn't a whole lot. Yeah, we're working on a number of recommendations uh, in collaboration with the province on all the things we could use that funding for. Now, one million of it is meant to be dedicated to the DBA, so yeah. we'll continue to work with that. Uh, but we've got a couple of, uh, you know, well, quite a few lists of options to be considered. We just haven't refined that list yet and haven't confirmed with the province. Um, you know, whether the list we have in mind, which is in line with some of the things we heard today, it will be, um, will work within their program. Um, but I think we'll get that done in the coming weeks here. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've, we've heard a lot of ur urgency um, today. Uh, um, <coughs> just a question to follow up on Mr. Leon's um, question about, you know, one of the businesses being um, given a notice around clearing off encampment. Can you just clarify that for me? Why is it the business responsibility because it's private property? Yeah, I, I, I don't think it is in this case. And so uh, when I heard that, that was the first I'd heard that. And I've got uh, our chief of staff, Salim, is sort of we looking do. that down. We'd yeah. like to see that letter uh, because it's certainly not in keeping with what we would expect. So yeah, I'm not sure what happened there, but we're following up. Great, thank you. Um, and I am wondering, just back to um, the mayor's question about the B officers, what was the number for downtown for the same geographic region in 2018? I recognize this may be prior to when you started. No, it uh, was 60. Um, so it was 60. Okay. It was reduced to, uh, sorry, the approved number was 60. It got up to hiring 40. Uh, right now, we currently have 21 in the downtown, plus we have uh, the 34 suppression and the 33 disp or, uh, disruption that are working there part time. Yeah. So. Uh, so that 60 number never did get to fruition. That I is, see. I'm not sure where that number came from. Uh, you're not sure where that number came from within the department, you mean? Well, just overall, there was, it was when the entertainment district was being built, there okay, was a I number see. that came out several years ago, but it never did get to that number. It got to 40. Right now, currently in the downtown, there's 21, uh -huh. uh, which are two, which is more than... Yeah, 
Absolutely, uh, more more than other areas. I've I've uh, I recognize that as well. Um, and a number of speakers spoke to, you know, we we would have gotten more foot on the ground um, with the funding that we're discussing today. But jog my memory because I feel like when you know back in the fall when we had this discussion. That was not part of that final slide when we talked about you know some of the deficit issues, some of the enterprise um, software that was needed. I guess I'm just wondering is is that an assumption, uh, or um, our resources that we didn't go forward with year one? Just to go back through it, year one was basically focusing on our data and our stats. Year two was focusing on restructuring our police service. Year three was focusing on our partnerships. Year four was focusing on those hotspot areas, downtown, LRT, Chinatown, 118, of course, Macaulay is in there as well. Those were the dedicated resources of growth, which growth, I'm not saying, were taken away that we weren't able to do. Right. So that's what we're trying to figure out. How do we accommodate to get some of that back in relation to redeployment? Mm -hmm. Right. Um and I certainly, I think I've, I, I've heard a lot of expectation too today, um, you know, from the community about what we wouldn't got gotten. And I, I just wanted to check if that had any basis. Those discussions between the city manager, and myself, the fire chief, absolutely were taking place as well as EMS uh, in and amongst that before this all kind of, let's just say unraveled, but we still have to find a way to do it. Absolutely. So. Um, I'm gonna yield my time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Thank you very much, and thank you for administration for their very thorough report. Um, excellent reading. Um, I just maybe, I guess maybe if I can get some clarity on who operates the the nine one one dispatch right now, and how it is operated. The 911 dispatch comes through police. Uh, there's obviously a triage in relation to fire as well as the city services. Um, what we were discussing way before even the, the task force took place with the city is how do we put a joint governance over top of this to actually meet the needs of all of us and can we actually reduce or shrink the footprint to have better services? Can we put mental health workers in there as well? So that particular part is rather than governing all these individually can we put an operational governance committee made up of myself the city manager and the fire chief who have the entities here to be in control as a collective governance body so yeah. if somebody calls in um and it's an overdose how how is it directed we'll go over to ems okay and then do do police attend as well uh, not very often if there's something else that has going on like it starts out with a roughly 800,000 calls it goes down to 300,000 calls through sorting and and we respond to about 160 to 170,000 calls there's a lot of sorting in those calls now I think what we're seeing in the synergies are there's a whole bunch of different things it's not the same salary uh, there's some things in relation to being able to put a mental health worker right in there to do some of that triage to get our pack teams out more full time. So there's ability to further blend this, which I believe uh, is on the table and we're still in discussions to try to make this happen. I, I, I firmly believe as I, I, I don't want to put words in the city manager's uh, mouth or the fire chief, but I, we're all on the same page of getting this done. Yeah, and if I could just add, Councillor Wright, on the governance side, we also include the social sector in, in the governance of this joint dispatch. And one of the reasons that this funding in this fiscal year that's being proposed as part of the strategy is so, is so important so we can get to this immediately and not have to wait for additional resources in 23 to 26. The other thing I would say is quite often, more often than not, the first to respond are fire because of their proximity and distribution throughout the city. And quite often they hand over directly to EMS when they arrive on the scene for medical issues. So with the Denver Star program, they have, you know, they say, you know, police, fire, I guess ambulance and crisis diversion. I mean, is, 
can that be added into the call tree and the scripting for, for whoever's responding to those 911 calls? Yeah, I can answer that because I've presented with the Denver program on our program as well as the CAHOOTS program on Eugene. And actually, we're just in the process of figuring out if we could have a conference together, perhaps at Edmonton. We're ahead of them in some things. Uh, Denver's ahead of us in some things. And CAHOOTS has some unique things too, and that's out of Eugene, Oregon. Reality is, yes, it can have that. And that's exactly what we're talking about part of that in relation to how that response is something to remember why that joint is really important is because just take the police service alone we dispatched over 5,000 of those calls and they got there and they staged and they called and waited for us to come there so that evaluation collectively together hopefully can actually get some efficiencies in that prompt response as well and just one thing to add counselor is quite often when the call is made, we don't know what the reality on the ground is, and that can change very differently from the initial call. Of course, yeah. yeah. And I just have one more question, um, just sort of in regards to the, the training. Um, so I think the, the report uh, or the response that, e, that uh, EPS had, had put forward is, you know, the, the training is really great in that, but there still seems to be a lot of um, training that needs, that is required. Um, so how, how good is it, the existing training right now and and yeah and and how much more do you need for those for those answering those calls I would say that we're always trying to improve training on behalf of the police service I would assume that's probably the same in relation to fire um, what we do have is an audit mechanism in relation to that and I think as Andre uh, basically said adding the social agency in the middle of that executive team will also allow us to look at it from other lenses as well. I would ever, uh, I'd hate to say that we're ever at the top of training. I think this is constantly, you got to have to be doing more and more to meet the needs of your community. So I would say it's a critical piece for sure. Okay, my time is up. I did have some other follow-ups, but I'll come back around. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Councillor Neck. Thank you, Councillor Carmel. Uh, thanks, thanks for everyone coming today and, and to all the speakers. I didn't have any questions for the speakers, but just wanted to offer my thanks. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on the on the the past numbers, but I think where it came from, Chief McPhee, and, and maybe you can dig into it for a later time, because I remember in the it was late 2014 that Council approved a funding package um, that substantially increased the amount of uh, officers for the downtown as part of the arena piece, and I think. Uh, Going into 2016, there were as many as 66 beat officers, at least that's what the previous chief had said at one time. It may have changed for very valid reasons because the needs change, but I think that's that's some of the history. So I'm wanting to make sure that, does that, does that sound familiar or do you not have that information? We, so. we certainly can try to find that. I, I think one of the, you hit on a thing though, uh, uh, Councillor Knack, that's really changed in the last three years where we have a lot of resources. Uh, and we talked about this last time we were together. We went from 158 protests to 456 a year. Uh, so we've got a full group, which I mean, in essence, that's basically a beat because it's all in the downtown area. But we have a tremendous amount of resources actually focusing on a lot of these uh, uh, protests that we have and they're oh. often in a concentrated area they don't then get to be spending time wandering the other streets they're sort yeah. of stuck where the, the protest is, is that yeah they're de definitely uh focused between the ledge and city hall and a few other spots for sure and uh and we just had this meeting at over association of chiefs of police it's not expected that they're going to decrease in the next several months yeah, yeah, that's fair. Okay, yeah, that's how. And again, I, I you know, it's it's not expected that you know, even though because when I was on my first term, we approved that many. You have the right and the ability based off need to adjust. So they were there. They've been moved around over time. So um, that's just part of the history I remember about on that. So um, a few questions more about the report, maybe just to, to administration on this. Uh, appreciating some of what we've heard today uh, for the feedback and, and some different perspectives on different issues process wise it wouldn't actually and I, I just want to make sure maybe it's almost to the clerks more but if you wanted to do something like uh, changing the help team it would have to come out of that five million because you couldn't it wouldn't be in order to you to talk about adjusting your recommendations based off council's past decision at budget 
is that fair? Uh, yeah, if you're talking about the 8.5 million that yeah. is left in, yeah, that is not, uh, as I understand it, where we we would be talking about. It would be coming from the provincial funds That's right. that have been allocated to the city since that decision. Because even though help is made up of a variety of people, since it does include some, some element of, of policing, that would essentially likely conflict with the past direction of the of the previous budget cycle where council had made a decision to redirect to, to other priorities is that uh, correct but having said that one of our recommendations here does include money going back to eps for the joint dispatch which correct. is in line with the safer for all so yes. yeah i think uh, i think what's clear to me is council wants to know what money if any goes back to police and what for and that's what we've tried to do for in this sure. case um I don't I think council could uh, adjust that if they have a new need to but uh, but all I understand is we're looking at the the new additional provincial funding um, of five million one million which is assigned to DBA yeah. all that could be used to support help teams for sure yeah and that, that, that would still be that's not ongoing right that's that's not the provincial money no, that's a that's a one-time yeah resource so it would limit exactly how you'd form it, but okay, something to something for us to think about. Uh, minute left. Some of the conversation we had, and I know one of the recommendations, and it's in the business case about the indigenous-led shelter, and I wanted to just get a sense of how we heard that need and that demand for sort of twenty-four-seven space. I appreciate the messiness that shelter operations isn't really municipal jurisdiction and I know people don't love to hear but I, I'm just trying to grapple with what the right approach is um, this recommendation doesn't necessarily get us a an immediate solution this is the beginning of, of a step for another I think it's what 30 to 50 spaces um, so I guess I'm curious about has there been any additional progress made or conversations? I know the province, you know, sort of removed some funding to, that closed down some of the spaces, but more about the shelter standards that have been approved. Is there a desire to sort of put those into implementation more quickly so we can activate more daytime spaces in the immediate term? Um, I, well, I, I don't know what the province is thinking yeah. in terms of adopting this, this shelter standard. I can say we have had some of these discussions in the provincial task force discussions, which I alluded to last time. and. Uh, you know, we haven't finalized those recommendations. It's certainly one that I would like to see in our advocacy to the province. Uh, and I know that's supported by, um, again, EPS and others that have helped develop mm -hmm. those minimum shelter standards. So we'll continue to push on that, but I, I can't, I'm not aware of if and when the, the province will take up. They are li I feel like they are listening and examining and we're comparing a lot of notes and answering a lot of questions about what's in the shelter standard. And that shows you know, good positive perspective to me. Okay. Thank you. I'm out of if time. If I may also oh. contribute, uh, Councillor Knack, it's Commissioner Kelly who's Stonehouse. Hi. <laughs> I think in dealing with sort of the homelessness, addictions, and mental health issue, we also need to be speaking to the federal government mm -hmm. because as First Nations, we know it's uh, the truth and reconciliation calls to action. We're adhering. We know that there are dispossessions of lands, that housing is a crisis on First Nations reserves. Folks are coming to the city because they have nowhere else to live. There needs to be a tri-part agreement. This needs to be all three levels of government and including First Nations level of government. Today, I didn't see any First Nations level of governance here at all, speaking, talking. And, and in fact, what I see is the opposite, non-Indigenous uh, people and governance speaking about and for uh, creating solutions. And so this is very problematic. And so I would highly urge all of you to figure out a strategy of including First Nations governance, the Treaty 6 chiefs, uh, the Grand Chief of Treaty 6, along with the provincial and federal government, because these issues are not gonna be solved simply with the city of Edmonton. They need to be partnerships with the First Nations, with the federal government and the provincial government. Thank you. Um, thank you, I'm well out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Thank you very much. Um, something I'm conscientious of, um, Mr. Corbold, is that when, like, so we had a representative from REACH here today. I didn't get a chance to ask my questions about um, sort of REACH's integration into this work, but I think maybe I turn to you. When REACH was set up, it's Edmonton's Council on Crime Prevention. 
Um, and their job is to work on some of that general generational crime prevention work and, and that public safety work. And uh, I'm sort of wondering um, how your work is integrating in the long term with that mandate. Um, and to be honest, I think one of my concerns is that I think they were set up so that we wouldn't have a bunch of social agencies who are fighting for limited amounts of money. And I'm concerned that we're now, um, I think this is a really good strategy, but I guess maybe the, the other question here is how are we making sure that all of the agencies um, that are working in Edmonton don't end up scrapping for small amounts of money and working uh, at odds with each other? Yeah, thanks, Councillor Hamilton. And I do believe Reach is on the call, but maybe I'll just start by, by saying that what's different with this strategy is the, the direct tie to deliverable outcomes, which then everyone everyone working within the strategy will be accountable for. So um, that we have a clearer path to that now, uh, and I think uh, much better coordination as well. But I'll just see if Reach wants to add anything. They were there, yeah. I am here. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, it, it's a good question. Uh, that is one of the reasons REACH was created so that there's less competition. But the reality is, is REACH only has so much money. Um, and, you know, it's going towards our initiatives that we work with others in collaboration with. So, um, you know, there's just there's just not enough resources to go around at this point. If, you know, we're happy to um, help and, and bring people together and be the backbone organization anywhere we can. Um, there's, there's, there, there is a limited amount of resources. I, I appreciate that. And I guess to, to Mr. Corbold, what, what's your sort of, um, I'd say your, um, boundary for when something maybe should go to a backbone organization? How are you determining what is within the purview of the city to do this work and, and when maybe you should engage a partner agency? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I think um, we often engage the partner agencies based on other successes we're having with them and I would say, you know, uh, potential for success. So I think we have to continue to be open to working with different partnering agencies and, you know, I'll just speak to Jasper Place Wellness, for example, today. That, that, that would be a, uh, and particularly the program which um, uh, our Dr. Louis spoke to, that is a, a new promising partner for the city of Edmonton, one that we think has great hope and which is why we're confident in recommending that to council. So, but I also think we have to evaluate uh, these all the time and decide um, based on different criteria what, what's best for us to deliver and what's best for them to deliver. Thank you. Um, and I think one of the chief critiques uh, that, that we will hear of this strategy is the the sort of lack of metrics. Um, but your intention is to bring those sort of after we've had an iterative discussion about this um, strategy, sort of how, how those metrics will um, uh, produce or how you're gonna measure, sorry, I've got foggy brain, um, but how, how we're gonna measure those metrics going forward. Um, is that correct? Yeah, the key is here, Councillor, is that we have at best a disaggregated uh, group of data all over the place. It's not coordinated and not coordinated or relevant to a particular strategy. So now with this strategy and intended outcomes, we can identify clearly what we have to address, uh, what we have to measure in each of the uh, pillars and, uh, and work to then collect that data and make sure we're getting it so that we can evaluate our responses. I appreciate that. And another critique that I heard over the weekend was that um, the dedication to building a safer city and, and focusing on um, uh, these seven pillars that you've identified actually has little to no bearing on the economic um, sort of uh, indicators for Edmonton. And I'm wondering if you can speak to, because you, you have a long sort of history in the public service, which I mean as a compliment, if you can speak to some of those economic uh, how that ties into our economic strategy. Yeah, I would say there's a, a direct correlation to success in this community and safety well-being strategy and our economic success for sure. Uh, I think we hear that from businesses all the time. And if we execute this right, if we do it in the right way, 
we will get uh, good economic outcomes because we're going to provide a space where there's freedom of action for to achieve those economic uh, outcomes, which right now in some cases is limited because of safety in our city. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hamilton. So um, I'm just going to pause the proceedings at this point uh, and do some agenda management work here. So first of all, I'm going to move uh, that orders of this meeting be extended to resume uh, tomorrow morning at 9.30 uh, and conclude at 5 p.m. with a uh, lunch break at from noon to 1.30 and recess 3.30 to 3.45. That just allows this meeting to continue tomorrow as we've more or less discussed. Uh, seeing no questions, please vote on that first of all. I'm um, yes. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That's carried. Uh, and then I'm going to secondly move that uh, item 6.5 uh, be made time specific for 9.30 a.m. tomorrow morning. I've, uh, and then just speaking to that, I've had a quick chance to speak with the speakers that are coming to that meeting, so they're okay with this change. So we'll <laughs> pick item 6.5 up first thing tomorrow morning and uh, then resume with whatever's left on the agenda. Please vote. Yes. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. That is carried. Uh, I will go to Councillor Jans next and then we'll break. Thank you. On behalf of the committee, I would like to just move item 6.2 to put it on the floor so then we can receive amendments and debate it. Am I required to receive the other information, the other reports first? No, we'll just take them one at a time. So you're okay. moving the, the recommendation in item 6.2, and yep. if you don't mind just reading that in. I move recommendation 6.2, that Community and Public Services Committee recommend to City Council that the Community Safety and Wellbeing Strategy, as outlined in the May 16th, 2022 Office of the City Manager Report, um, OCM 00991, be approved. And I move number two, that adjustments to the 2022 and 2023 operating budget as outlined in attachment one of the May 16, 2022 Office of the City Manager Report, OCM 00991, be approved with funding from the Edmonton Police Services Funds within financial strategies. Thank you. So that motion is on the floor. Um, any introductory comments? Or I understand my colleagues have amendments. I wanted to do this to allow that to proceed. Very good. Any questions of administration? None at this time. Then we will stop there. Uh, it's 3.28. We'll commence again at 3.43-ish. We are in recess. Thank you.
going to begin again uh, the May 16th, 2022 meeting of the Community and Public Services Committee. I'm just going to do a very quick roll call for process purposes of members only. Uh, Councillor Jantz. Good afternoon. Councillor Tang. Hello. Uh, Councillor Wright. I'm here. Uh, Mayor Sohi, still with us? I'm here. Great, thank you. Uh, we have, we're joined by very many other councillors, but in the interest of brevity, we're going to continue. So uh, if we can just repopulate the list. Uh, so we'll continue with the first round of questions, and then uh, I'll have some more comments about how to manage our way through. So uh, Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to follow up on some of the questions I had of our speakers uh, related to the Integrated Call Evaluation and Dispatch Center. Um, I know initially in the Safer for All report, uh, the, the independent piece was quite important, um, but having read over the Police Commission's response to the task force report, uh, it was identified that the, the independence was actually not supported by the police or commission. So I, I guess I'm just looking for a little bit more information on that um, and what that might look like. Yeah, Councillor, maybe I'll just start, Sandra, here, just to say that um, I, I think, you know, it, I guess it kind of depends on what we mean by independence. There, there's got to be a connection between the dispatchers and those being dispatched. There's got to be a connection, a trust, an understanding of where you're going and who's sending you there. And so from that perspective, you know, we don't see it as independent. But I understand, my, my understanding of what the task force wanted in terms of independence, that it was not a traditional police dis dispatching center, it would be a new center, uh, new infrastructure, it would obviously have um, civilianized dispatchers in there, fire would be there, EMS would be there, uh, social agencies would be there, and it would not be run out of a police uh, facility, for example, or a city administration facility. We would find an independent facility for all those people to coordinate and partner on. But there has to be a connection between those being dispatched and the, the folks who are dispatching them. They need to work together as a team. They need to talk to each other. Need, they need to communicate during the deployments. And, and so I see it, uh, so I, I can't see how a dispatch would be. But I don't, I'm not, I don't think that was the intent. Uh, I think the idea of being independent was that it's, it's a new system. It's, it's not tied to the old um, dispatch system. Now that, that is true to police dispatchers uh, and a civilianized dispatch system in there. Same is true of firefighter dispatchers. What we're adding to it is the social sector and, and EMS in a way that we've not done before. So that's, so yeah. I kind of, de it depends on what you define as independent, but that's yeah. how you see it working. Yeah, and that, that helps a lot actually. Um, so I really appreciate a, a bit of a better picture of what that's gonna look like. Um, and I think that makes sense. Um, I guess the other part of that, you know, thinking about even the Denver model, where low risk, low QD calls um, do get responses from, uh, again, I think it was a combination of mental health clinician and paramedic. Would that be possible under, under the new dispatch model? Yes, I absolutely think it yeah. would be possible. I think there's a capacity issue right now with, with EMS, as we've, we've seen in public discussion as well. But, but I think the possibility of that is there for sure. Okay. Great. Well, thank you for those answers. Um, I also had, I, I guess, a larger question um, just around, I guess, honing in on the, the conversation around diversion and detasking. Um, I'm thinking a lot about, you know, our ability to measure and evaluate actions uh, or, or initiatives based on their contribution towards that kind of detasking, diversion, uh, reducing calls for service, and really alleviating pressure on other social safety systems. Um, and I recognize it's really challenging to say, you know, if we invest X amount into a certain initiative, then we'll see like X percentage reduction in calls for service. But I'm trying to contemplate, you know, if we're considering or comparing two potential actions or initiatives, how do we evaluate and compare outcomes uh, in terms of their magnitude or even timelines to see results? Because I think that will really be important for thinking about the prioritization of some of these actions. Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I think um, I think you're right. It's going to be difficult to do, but I think I'm confident we can do it. I think it'll take a bit of time, and maybe the best way I can illustrate this is using the example of Ambrose Place. And you know, we were able to recently uh, collect and share some data from Ambrose Place that that showed um, over a period of time 
by adding these kind of special supports into the facility, we were able to reduce the number of times a, a given resident would have to go to emerge. So from eight to three times a year, for example. So there was, now that took about two years to show it all, show it, show that kind of data, but we are going to need some time to try these things out and then uh, collect the data and then compare data. But that is how, how I hope we will be able to do this. I think you're right, it's a bit of a circuitous route between some of the actions we're going to do and, and how they would um, relieve stress on the community and policing and other uh, agencies, but, but some will be clearer than others. So for example, the, uh, the healing centre ja as part of the Jasper Park uh, Lodge, I think that we could get some really clear data on because we will know for a fact how many people are, instead of being discharged into homeless, are being discharged into uh, a great place where they can move on and we'll be able to track, you know, the success rate of those patients. And just to that, uh, Councillor, just in addition to what the City Manager said, things like our health team, they've got a really robust uh, set of stats, very similar to Denver and Cahoots. Uh, we're looking at about a 34% reduction in violations. These are the lower violations getting them out of the system. So our whole CSWB branch is made and it's designed to take patrol investigative services out of business through measurement. So trying to get the right people in the justice system versus everybody in the justice system. And that's where we rely on our partners for that relentless follow-up. So those navigators, those recovery coaches as the city manager, uh, in these integrated teams, that's where we can actually start to reduce the second, the fifth, and the 15th, and the 20th, and sometimes a lot larger than that calls. That's been a focus, and that one-year evaluation is uh, extremely positive, and that's why we're adding similar uh, and, and more resources to that space, including our diversion program, our youth program, etc., because Ideally, uh, if we can keep people out of the justice system, and you heard some things in relation to the accelerator as well, then that's, uh, that's a double count, right? So we've got to hit it on both ends, but we also can't forget that the city has a significant crime problem and downtown gun violence and stuff is disproportionate to others. So it's to put that balance, which means we got to do it all. Great, well, thank you for those responses. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you so much. I, I guess um, just a high level question for the commission. When you read the, the community safety and well being framework, what are your initial thoughts on it? Sorry about that. Thank you, Councillor. So I think, um, you know, what was really exciting for the Commission is that we took an innovative approach to work in consolidation with our police service as, you know, for the governance, public oversight of our police service, the biggest concern of our Commission is community safety and well-being. And, you know, when we read the report and we spent multiple days, um, what are the ways that we align? What are the ways that we can look at outcomes and measurements to ensure that there is systemic transformation, not only at the service level, but also at the commission level? We can't be expecting one set of expectations of one body of governance and not the other. So it was very much a collaborative piece of work between the commissioners. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we want to do our part to ensure that Edmontonians have the safest city possible. Great, thank you. And um, I guess I, I've missed a lot of the conversations on this integrated call and dispatch center, so I do have a, a follow-up question because, um, and I understand that there might be some you know, capital costs, it sounds like, if we're building a new, like, actual physical space. But would there not be cost savings through amalgamation if we're talking about, you know, the diagram in the report that shows all the different calls that come through? Or is it even possible to amalgamate all of those? Um, or I've, which ones are we talking about amalgamating, I guess, is what I'm trying to understand. I would say we're trying to amalgamate as much as we can, Councillor, and we're not sure. I don't, I don't think capital is the way to go at this point. I think... 
quite frankly, we might have to lease for a short time, but I'm also looking at resources within the city that we own and operate and perhaps we can find. Um, so, and as you know, with our hybrid work model, we're taking a hard look at our spaces. So we're, we will find a good efficient way of doing that. We want to obviously consolidate as much as we can and, and there may be efficiencies. I don't think that's the primary point, but, uh, but I think we'll have to do a cost analysis and pre present that to council before we make a final decision. So, uh, but I, I think some of the other, the more difficult is, you know, we have to be very careful with EMS, for example. They've, they've had, as you would see publicly, quite a lot of chats about 911. And so we have to be uh, careful about how they're dispatched and I, I want to collaborate with them on what will work. So the degree that which we'll be able to amalgamate is unsure at this point, I would yeah, say. Yeah, and 211 is federally funded. Correct. Or not federally, sorry, provincially funded. Yeah, so there's a lot of jurisdictional issues we've got to work through, but what this funding will do is allow us to do that project and do the work to bring back. Okay. And I wanted to get um, some, some sense from from you, Mr. Mr. Corbold, on specifically some of these on the, some of these budget items, and I think one of the key things is we're talking about we're, we are talking about systemic change, but there's a tension, and I've noted in my work for years in community building, of the immediate needs and then the systemic change, and so I just wanted to get your sense because I, I was pretty clear that I, I was I was having trouble seeing the link with the sing sign laugh and learn. And, and so I wanted to get your sense as to why, you know, what kind of thought, like why that one of all the things preventative, are we putting that in here? Yeah, thanks. I, I would say part of it is timing. We, we, you know, we felt that council wanted us to go out with uh, and, and consult uh, with a whole bunch of people on this. This idea came up. It was, it was one we saw that was a uh, part of the, that we thought fit well into the sort of diversity of solutions that we wanted to present to council. Um, and I also would say that, you know, the 8.5 million, like I said in my presentation, is a small amount of money compared to how much we spend in this whole ecosystem already. So we were trying to be a little innovative, quite frankly, with this one and the one for the healing center that were new things. Because we had heard from a lot of the community and from council that you didn't want to see the same old things. And so that's one of the reasons we put that in there and we we're trying to show a diversity of options, noting that this is still only for this fiscal year. There's only seven months left in this fiscal year. We wanted to do something, and, and the other thing was how, at what state of readiness were these things ready? We had lots of good ideas that would take another 10 months to, to field and actually become operational. So we said, no, we're gonna put those into the 23 to 26 uh, budget bucket because even if I was given the money today, I couldn't actually, have action. EPL is ready to execute this tomorrow and so it was one that makes real sense from that and I really like the preventative early um, sort of child nature of the approach here. So, Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Councillor Paquette. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you to administration for this report and for all of this work. It is an astounding amount of work and sometimes that gets lost uh, in the, between the lines, I suppose. This has been uh, a multi-year process and it is continuing. So thank you very much for that. So I would have a question about, um, well, a couple of questions. First of all, uh, just to I think the councils are sort of digging around in here and I'm not sure if we've gotten a clear answer yet. When I go back to my community um, after today, what do I tell them about what they will see immediately? What is going to change? What will they notice? Because uh, you know we understand that this is a large work and th there are processes here and it's going to, and we need a lot of cooperation from all orders of government and all sorts of different uh, folks and, and organizations. But as Councillor Rutherford was saying, in the short term, there are needs. So what do we say to the folks in our communities tomorrow after this passes? Yeah, thanks, Councillor. I would start by saying that uh, all the, the recommended um, uh, actions on, on how we spend this 8.5 million are all executable within this fiscal year. And they'll start to see 
you know, availability, for example, of, of micro grants to do actions in, in their areas, you know, specific extreme weather protocol supports, which is an issue for all communities, and, and we'll be able to see action on that right away. The other thing I would say is that, um, you know, we're coming to council again on the next week with specific update on transit safety, for example, which many are interested in hearing. So while this is focused on the strategy, the immediate change that people should see on the ground is really related to the 10 items that we are recommending funding on because some of those will start as early as next week if approved by council. Some will take a little longer, but they will be this fiscal year uh, expenditures. I think the other thing I would say, and probably one of the most important, is immediate levels of coordinate, coordination and the ability to talk within the strategy and, and put everybody on the same page so we all know what we're talking about with the seven pillars. That has already helped us in, in some circles when the federal government approached us after budget with their, their new program for community safety. We said, here's our strategy. We think it applies to your program and we, we saw immediate support for, for helping put funding in there. So having an integrated coordinated strategy itself can help us leverage more dollars from other orders of government. And we saw the same with the province when they looked at this. Okay, and that's if other orders of government and the people we meet, everyone has the same base understanding of uh, where our responsibilities and legislative ability to respond uh, where those lie, correct? Correct, and for example, when we shared this with AHS, they were immediately able to identify, oh, we're working in that space, that action, that pillar, and we want to collaborate more on how we're doing that. Okay. Thank you. Um, and, and maybe uh, to, to uh, uh, Chief McPhee, so there's a lot of concern I've heard from folks saying like, okay, well, why doesn't the police just put, or why doesn't the city just make sure police are over here or police are over there? Obviously we can't direct that. And so the question that the public will have is if you, if you know where the need is, then why aren't we anticipating that and, and being proactive? I think you are, but I think the public probably would probably needs to hear that. Yeah, don't disagree, and uh, we have been. Uh, keep in mind, 19.1% uh, of our calls for service are in the downtown. So uh, that said is we've got a business community that's struggling. Uh, we've got an over uh, amount of resources in a particular area on the social side, and we've got some people that are taking advantage of our vulnerable and the criminal aspects. So we are currently in... Um, trying to build an SOP on how we can mobilize and move some resources, whether it's a period of three months to get some increased visibility in this and get the skill sets and the authorities aligned. So we know fire has, you know, uh, some authorities on structures, on derelict properties. You know, that's a partnership we need to get with them and we're talking to the fire chief. We know EMS has the best response when it comes to responding to overdoses, which we all do, but that's another thing. We know there's some bylaws in with the city and the CSOs and the TPOs. And then we also know that the safety and the gangs, the overrepresentation is, is amount of us, but then it's also that third parties for that relentless help, help. So the help teams, the caught teams and all that stuff. What we're trying to focus on is this SOP is how do we build something in the next three months that actually could show us what we're looking for and the results and hopefully not hurt other areas of our city too much at the same time, because I think we would be miff if we didn't think that we got some serious issues in other parts of our city as well. But we've heard our business community, we've heard the people that have long been struggling here, and we just got to try something different, but it can't be just one entity has been discussed in the past. It has to be all hands on deck, as you've alluded to. And I think your other point of finding out where the money in the system that you mentioned earlier is absolutely critical in this space going forward. Uh, so that's what we're doing currently. I saw the first draft of it today from our side, pushed it back, asked for more work on it. So hopefully in the coming days, we should see that and what we can do in the short term as well as managing, as you know, we've got the, we're in the playoffs, we've got a whole other thing going on there, as well as we've got uh, uh, some things happening with protests as well, but we're trying to tie it all in, if that makes sense. It does, thank you, I'm out of time. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, thank you so much.
Um, really, really appreciate all the work that's gone into this report. It has obviously just been such a considerable amount of work and, and really want to thank everyone who, who was involved in that. So fair warning, I do, do have lots of questions. Um, and I, you know, they kind of go in both directions. I see this report maybe being at the 5,000 foot level and I have some questions that go up to the 10,000 foot and then also down to the, the ground. And it's really, you know, meant to think about that next iteration, which I appreciated it, you, you flagging. So, you know, something again, just sort of stepping back and looking at that, that broader community safety uh, and well-being uh, ecosystem, We've, there's a lot of talk about increasing the social safety net, but not necessarily stitching it together. And I'm just wondering what work we're doing in terms of a community governance structure for all the different agencies that are working uh, in this space. So, so both city associated organizations like REACH and Poverty Edmonton, uh, but also you know all of the community-based uh, initiatives that are underway. Yeah, thanks, Councillor. I, I, I think first step, having the strategy really does help us with coordination because what it's helping, we've seen already people are starting to use similar language, knowing that we've got these seven pillars now if Council approves them, and that's helping with the coordination dialogue. I, th I think the next level of work needs to be how do we coordinate all that? You know, should we have one homeless commission, for example, which is an idea that has come up in the in in the uh, in the community? Um, so we haven't sort of that I see as the next step. If we can get all on the f same page though with the seven pillars and the actions within them, and especially the intended outcome, so we're all moving towards a, a common outcome. I think that's really going to help. We I think. We will find along the way, though, that we may come up with specific organizational structure considerations to help even cement that further and coordinate um, and integrate uh, better. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. And I think I think it really speaks to me. And so that was really helpful to to sort of hear what you want us to be approving today. Because again, when I when I look at this, I'm not I'm not seeing a roadmap in the same way that let's say the infill action plan was a roadmap in terms of very specific, uh, discrete pieces of work that we would do. So, so for example, this, this discussion about a governance model or even just mapping gaps and overlaps within in the sector. That to me is a, is a roadmap action. So just wondering if that will be subsequent work that will, will happen following the approval of the overall framework. Yeah, I think it absolutely needs to, to be subsequent work for sure. Yeah, and I think maybe to that as well, I think, um, and, and it's a very challenging tension, but just, you know, is it capital C city or small C city? And I, you know, I think the energy transition strategy did a really good job of mapping out what we as an entire community need to do and also what the city as an organization is, is doing within that. Yeah, I would agree entirely, and that's the pros that's what we want to follow in this case. Yeah. Great. Maybe just going to to sort of the methodologies piece as well, and that being that next piece of work coming back in Q4. So really excited for that. What are the thoughts? I mean, for me, the most important data we need to be collecting is like individual longitudinal data. So what are the outcomes for the individuals who have been involved in different programs and had different input? Um, and I know that longitudinal data in and of itself is challenging to track. And then we have the additional challenge of wanting to add outcome tracking, uh, long-term tracking to organizations receiving funding without then burdening them with a, with a ton of reporting, which can take a lot of resources. So just maybe some preliminary thoughts around that. Yeah, mostly I would say I, I agree that that's what bothers me most about our current state is I can't see everything. So I know how many people are on the named list. I don't know how many of those people are repeat customers because they were on the name list three years ago. They were successful graduates of Housing First, for example, but then something happened to get them back on the list. I also don't know where people are from. And while we welcome everybody to Edmonton for sure, part of uh, some of the solutions we've heard is about reuniting people with family and community um, in a positive way, if that makes sense in their particular circumstance. But I don't know how to do that because I don't know where, where everybody is from. Uh, which is another sort of, uh, you know, missing piece of data. So, so I agree on the, on the need for that. It's, it's a huge challenge. Um, and so I think what this strategy says is we need that data. Um, there are lots of people willing to work with us on the, on the data. And I think, again, it's about coordinating that. 
And maybe just with that report coming back in Q4, just those strategies for supporting uh, organi community-based organizations to collect that data too. But I'll leave it there for this round. Thank you. Yeah, correct. And I would say that um, a lot of the data won't be us collecting it. It'll be a collaboration with those partners. Thank you. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a lot of questions, but I, I really want to get to the question then in five minutes. Um, thank you for all the work because this community safety and well-being and it will ensure the quality of life for Edmontonians and also ensure the fundamental factor for our city's economy development and recovery. So my course, first question, and then because we're dealing with at least 6.1 to 4 together, so my question uh, will be cross-reference check. Uh, so we had that strategy, safer for all strategy two years ago, and with 14 actions attached. So right now we have this new strategy and with 10 actions attached. So what's the real difference between those two strategies? I would say, Councillor, that we, we've honoured the recommendations, or we believe we have. I know that others disagree. But we will continue to try to honour the recommendations of the, the 14 recommendations from the, the Safer for All Task Force. This strategy, I would say, is much larger and more comprehensive than those initial recommendations, which are you know, which we're trying to build into the strategy. So this is a, a bigger piece of work that has more in it is how I would answer. So for the seven pillars, and then is, uh, because we have separate anti-racism strategy, and then for the seven pairs, we have one pair specific talk about anti-racism strategy. Is that overlap work? Or is totally different. It's overlap. So the the uh, our answer in this report to uh, anti racism is is essentially the anti racism strategy and actions that were already approved by council. But then we added some some details that we've added in the other pillars, uh, such as um, you know uh, detailed outcomes, definition of outcomes, and those kinds of things. So all the actions that council already approved in February for anti-racism strategy, the independent body, the high level office in city administration and, uh, and operational funding uh, would all be uh, implemented under this strategy as well. Uh, for the last strategy, safer for all strategy and how much cost we already spend it. I don't have that number, but I can get it for you councillor. And then specifically, how much uh, EPA's fund we used to implement the last strategy and then two years ago? Uh, again, I don't have a number. I don't know if the Chief, um, Chief McPhee wants to try, but. Uh, that's okay. And so okay. I'm mindful of my time. And if we don't have yeah. a number and I do uh, looking for that information and later I'm be provided to my office. We can do that. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you very much. And specifically, and then for the first strategy, safer for all strategy implemented or developed uh, two years ago, right now two years. If we look at the change for the safety, how our public feeling about our city's safety is getting worse or getting better. And with the strategy, with the 14 actions, and is attached with that strategy implementation. So I would like to say what I heard and from the public and what I heard from today's speakers and also what I heard from all the public comments and based on the newsletters and videos and then over 90% the voice we heard our safety is getting worse. But by looking at the funding we used, we used the uh, EPA's funding and try to use some new approach to increase our safety safety. But however, the two years passed, our safety concerns, even our public fear for our safety safety is, get, is getting worse. And so what does that mean to us? I really want to look at and to think about if it's getting worse and is, is anything we are repeatedly doing is worse our energy and worse our savings investment 
And is there any way we can look at it something from different angle? And so I, I just want to get this question out of there. Uh, but I really appreciate uh, the great intention here because the safety is a fundamental factor, as I mentioned earlier. And for our city's economy development, for our city, for our Edmontonian's quality of life. Uh, but is that just the way how I how we do it? Um, so I still have other three questions. I will come back the second round. Thank you. Thank you. So that completes uh, our first round of questions. Um, the uh, clerk has advised that we need to revise the uh, phrasing of the motion. Uh, so I'll just ask that um, the suggested revised wording be put up first of all. So moved. You may want to see it first. I thought you okay. rescinded. We're just getting that on the board for you. Sure. Now the motion is, uh, when we see it, is essentially in two parts. And um, the first part is the framework that administration has put together and is uh, seeking approval on. Uh, and the second part is the budget adjustments that would go with supporting the framework. So uh, just to sort of keep the meeting going in an early fashion, I'd ask that we ask questions on part one first, uh, which is the strategy uh, and the attachments that support that strategy. And once we've exhausted questions that way, then we'll move to uh, questions and amendments uh, as they might come on the uh, budget adjustments that are suggested in attachment two to the report. Pardon me, attachment one to the report, as noted in, in item two. So first of all, I'll go to you, Councillor Jans. Are you comfortable making this motion as we crafted? So moved. So that's on the floor. Thank you. And uh, on the second round then, Councillor Jans for questions. Thank you. May I still ask questions of the Commission and Administration? Yes, everyone that's on the, uh, on the um, delegation. And uh, just to the clerk, uh, Councillor Jans uh, just moved the motion as first round, so he should get the full five minutes if we could. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question would be to uh, Chair McDougall. Um, I've heard a lot about us marching in the same direction and working working together as 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 organizations. And I can't help but think about the 700 Edmontonians who have died, uh, almost 700 last year due to opioid poisoning. And I think about the catalytic converters, the bicycle thefts, the petty garage thefts, the the yard thefts, all that, all that little stuff that you know we're chasing. That again, by by Chief McPhee's um, comment, is is driven by addiction, and it feels like we spent a whole day today talking about um, an allocation of eight million dollars. Yet, the war on drugs and the challenges that we're facing everywhere for demands on police service, people using opioids on transit because uh, um, the provincial government has closed safe consumption sites. Um, really, the, all of this is. I mean, it 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 feels like conservatively, at least a third of our work is together dealing with a failed war on drugs. And when I, 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 I asked you this at our last meeting and I was wondering if you had a chance to reconsider if the commission had had a chance to, conversation, to have a conversation about would the commission consider taking, taking a position in support of safe supply, decriminalization, harm reduction and other evidence-based public health measures that would help all of us save time and money in in the this failed drug policy that we're dealing with ahead of us. Thank you, Councillor Jans. I agree. It's a catastrophic situation we're in. Absolutely. Has the commission sat and talked about this? No. Uh, we have our uh, our monthly meeting coming up this week, uh, and I'm not sure. I haven't had a look at the agenda yet. I'm not sure if it's on our agenda. If it's not, uh, I suspect there would be no difficulty uh, in adding that to our agenda in the future. I think that'd be really helpful. Thank you. And. Um, Secondly, just wondering going forward to, um, has the commission thought about, because we, we, want, we want to maximize the number of badge and gun on the street, and have we, have we talked about other measures? I see that kind of with the dispatch suggestion here today, but other areas that could be reallocated from current um, police operations to um, the city or another provider, I'm thinking, uh, some of the mental health work, some of the work around homelessness, uh, uh, gendered violence and youth crime, 911 center call-ups, we're talking about animal welfare. I saw, like last year around November, the police had uh, opened a new animal control unit 
And when I think about the complaints I get related to that versus downtown, um, it's a puzzling decision for me. So I'm wondering about how do we, would the commission consider bringing forward something for our fall budget that we can have a conversation so all of us can have the confidence that we know when we're allocating funding to the police, it's truly going to that best use police work and these other functions, maybe we as the city need to step up and own better like problem properties or something. I think that's a great point, Councillor Jans, and um, where definitely the commission is keeping a close eye as the innovative practices of the police service with the PAC team, the crisis team, along with the health team. And so when you talk about allocating services differently, uh, we're certainly seeing officers doing their work differently. This is transforming that work with folks who are struggling with mental health and addictions. And so it's going to take some partnership building. It's going to take some mentorship. And I can say that the service with confidence is doing that with those services. And I highly suggest that you go down, see the incubator, go see the help service so you can see for yourself the transformation of services and how we might work in partners to build on these innovative approaches to policing. Appreciate that. And one question, I'm not sure if, if the chair could answer it or if I'll ask our administration. Um, the funding, I believe the provincial government had reduced $5 million two years ago for diagnostics to the police ongoing. And recently we received a report related to traffic enforcement without photo radar now. The automated enforcement revenue, I think is, is it a 17 million or $22 million hit to the police budget? Is that correct? And and if so, because we're we're picking away here, but but we're also going to have these other items to look at too. And I'm just trying to see how they how they nest together. Yeah. I can answer the twenty two million dollar portion. So of traffic safety and automated enforcement revenue, twenty two point three million dollars a year is used to fund EPS. So effectively by by that decision the last two provincial governments have cut the police defunded the police whatever term you want 22.5 million and now we at budget time may be asked to make up that that difference no i'm not sure that's an uh, an accurate characterization traffic safety and automated enforcement has gone down they've taken a larger share of it the 22.3 million dollars is simply the amount of funding that goes to police from the traffic safety and automated enforcement reserve thank you for the clarification thank you i'm going to go to mayor sohi he has a time constraint so mayor sohi thank you so much mr chair uh, Mr. Corbold, first of all, uh, thank you for all the hard work you and your team did in developing this strategy. I have two questions. One on the, uh, uh, I, I saw the dashboard uh, 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 illustration and that will be populated, I understand, by the end of this year, right? And, uh, and how often would you provide a progress report on this? Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I, I, that's exactly, we wanted to show an illustrative example of what a dashboard could look like. And the point was we, we measure the pillars and we try to measure an aggregate. I, I think as we collect data, um, at how often we change that would will be important to consider. I'm, I'm thinking at this point once a quarter at minimum, but maybe there's opportunities to do it. Uh, and, but it really does depend a bit on what partners collect data and what, what, sh what they share data. So I'm hoping that we can do it once a quarter, but I, I, you know, we'll have to do a lot of work to confirm that. Got it. And uh, also, there, there are many reasons that why our communities aren't safe, and there's many solutions that we haven't explored that yet. One of the solutions is working with the First Nations and Métis communities within the community, but also beyond Edmonton. Uh, what what are our plans? When would we start having conversations with uh, uh, with say Treaty Six and Treaty Eight uh, nations to get them involved in this strategy? Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. So we have started very just recently, very uh, ha started to have some of those early conversations, but we we want to make sure that those conversations are done in the context of our memorandums of understanding, and that yeah. they be direct directly driven at a very high level by the leadership of those communities. So while I've had some conversations with administration in Treaty Six and in some administration in some of the uh, First Nations in Treaty Six, uh, you know we want to respect. 
uh, the MOUs and the leadership. And so there, there's really a whole other level of discussion that has only been initiated that uh, we think we can, can best be done through the city's MOU and, and with you as the mayor and council. Uh, directly with uh, the Grand Chief in, in the case okay. of Treaty 6 and 8 and other chiefs within. Okay, that, that, that's great. Looking forward to uh, to that and knowing the uh, further more refined timelines on that. So what we are seeing in our downtown, in our Chinatown, in our BIAs is, is the pain, pain of colonialism. It is the pain of trauma. It's the pain of uh, opiate crisis. It's the pain of houselessness. And all these areas are obviously provincial responsibility, but there are a large number of players uh, following up to Councillor Stevenson's question, all the social service agencies and providers, whose role is it to coordinate, make sure that all those different functions are actually efficient and playing the proper role and resources are being optimized? Is it, uh, can we play that role or we have to work with the province to make sure that coordination is happening? I think the answer kind of depends on specific programs in the area, which is part of the difficulty. So, uh, and I think a better answer, quite frankly, is that we can and, and should play a leadership role in coordinating, even, even if we're not necessarily responsible for all those actions, because I think we're closest to it, we're dealing with it, and, and we have the capacity of doing some coordination with, with this strategy. What was particularly helpful to me is when I presented this strategy to five deputy ministers, they were able to easily identify how and where they wanted to work within the strategy from a provincial perspective. And I'm about to present this to the federal government in some circles Good. and big city managers to have a similar discussion, especially, for example, on the housing file with, with the Department of Infrastructure at the federal level. Got it. They are, they are, those are the two areas that I'll be... Uh, and are seeking more information in, like particularly on the Indigenous engagement, the First Nations engagement, Treaty 6 and Treaty 8, as well as engage with the province and the community, because there's a lot of money in the system. We hear all the time that there's uh, not just a resource issue. Yes, we need more, absolutely, on housing and uh, addictions crisis, but are we using what we have efficiently as effectively as possible? So uh, uh, if that requires some direction from council, uh, or would that some work that you will be undertaking on your own? Uh, or you feel enough, enough uh, uh, empowerment at this time to carry on that work? Yeah, I believe I've got the guidance from council to do that very work. And, and as you indicated, like every order of government is putting money into this strategy in one shape or form. I think the question is we have to follow all that money and figure yeah. out if it's having the greatest impact to the outcomes we want to achieve. What's particularly important to me is that council approve the strategy or change it if they want so that we can be clear on those outcomes and stay super focused on that work. Yeah, I think that's very important. So now I'm running out of time. I really appreciate uh, Mr. Chair for uh, letting me go uh, uh, early. I can just uh, have a time constraint. So thank you so much. See you tomorrow. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, Councillor okay. Tang. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think this is my second round. I don't, are we still on three minutes? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just start with the framework itself. Um, and I want to test a bit of my assumption about how this would came about. So we have a grand vision of the safest city in 2030. Do we work backwards for, from there and towards, you know, the pillars and, and then ultimately the recommendations? Uh, I wouldn't say so, Councillor. I would say that uh, we, we certainly went back to that motion because uh, it gave us a timeline to follow. So we really okay. thought that was a good motion to anchor the timeline of 2030. But I would say the development of the strategy was, was more of a root cause analysis to all the issues we had. And we did a lot of whiteboarding exercise where we worked with a, a lot of different agencies to, to try to define the problems and then come up with the right solutions, which, which is why, you know, at one point we had lots of pillars right. uh, and narrowed them down to these seven as the most meaningful. And, and in that process, because um, I didn't necessarily see this in the jurisdictional scan, but did you look at some of the other measurement and outcomes framework from other cities? Uh, some of the good ones that I've seen, you know, include Waterloo, which is re just released earlier this year, as well as Toronto. We did, Councillor Tang. We also took into consideration Edmonton's context. So, so some of the perfect. things worked really well for us and some sure. of them didn't. So that's why it's a bit of a ed made in Edmonton methodology. Yeah. And as we kind of get down from from the pillars to then the recommendations, uh, do you have do you have assumptions for each of those recommendations? 
for example, for the microgrants, you know, um, what are some of the assumptions that, that led to that recommendation? Yeah, I can speak to the microgrants one specifically. I would say in the past year, we've had many community members and organizations come to us that required uh, kind of just-in-time funding, bridge funding, uh, funding to kind of try some innovative programming. And it was hard to be able to find sources of funding for some of that. There were a lot more no's. Um, and so that's when we thought, why don't we put together a micro grants to be able to let community test some of the great ideas that they had, but there was no source of funding that they could access. For right, this. so I, I guess the, the assumption is that one time micro grants are proven to be an effective lever for improving community and wellness and safety outcome. And, we, and, and you have, this is kind of based on some of you know past granting programs with those results? Yeah, I would say it's based on past and also just conversations with other um, individuals in other cities. And also, again, just hearing from our community saying that they, you know, this isn't meant to take the place for ongoing funding, sure. but it is meant to potentially kickstart something that's, um, that's, that's required from a community perspective. Right. Um, yeah, I think the assumptions are actually quite important. Um, and I would love to see the assumptions made for all of these, uh, whether it's in a memo or something, happy to. I don't necessarily want to make a motion on that, um, but that is something I will be looking for um, at some point in the next few, I don't know, whenever is appropriate. We can do that, We, can, we can chat yeah. offline. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, okay, I'm out of time again. Um, I guess I just want to say, echoing uh, Councillor Rutherford and Councillor Paquette's comment about sort of immediate return, that was kind of the whole point of, you know, why I made that motion for 6.3. And I felt the linkage was a bit missing because it was responding specifically. Sorry, Councillor okay, Tang. Okay, okay, it's okay. <laughs> There's many, many rounds left to go. Uh, Councillor Wright. Okay, we'll move, to, we'll come back to you, Councillor Wright. Um, Councillor Salvador. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll just kind of dig into some of the immediate, um, immediate concerns and potential actions. Uh, and I know we heard from a number of our speakers about the COT model in particular, and I guess the promise that that holds for um, having kind of a, an on the ground version um, instead of just transit. So. I guess I'm wondering, like the potential actions that were identified within the business case. Um, I think the report mentioned that that was informed by, you know, emerging priorities from council and community, but what would be the process to, I guess, initiate that conversation around um, additional actions that could could help in the immediate term? Yeah, thanks, Councillor. I, I think we're, we're going to be routinely coming back to Council with um, uh, updates on the immediate actions we're doing in all areas of safety. Um, Chief McPhee mentioned about some collaborative work we're doing now to, to coordinate uh, better, so we're coming back to Council on that. We're coming back on transit safety. I would say what would be important for us administration to get from Councillor is, is Councillor, sorry, is more guidance for the 23 to 26. So this is... This is now, we're six months almost into the fiscal year and we need to get some decisions on this so we can get going. The next five months, we need to work towards a, a four-year budget uh, proposition to support this strategy from 23 to 26. Uh, and, and that, uh, you know, I, I would say that I, while I agree that everybody's focused on the actions required now, um, you know, we, we're, we're ex exhausting all the all the resources we have to do that work. We're, we're going to be reporting to council on a routine basis and we're always open to ideas, but I also want to make sure we've got time to, to do the four-year budget layout for 23 to 26. Okay, yeah, and I, I appreciate that. And I think um, just one one more thing I wanted to clarify. Obviously, a lot of the conversation today was, was about downtown, and absolutely, that's a major need right now. Um, I also know that... Uh, some of the BIAs I'm thinking, Albert Ave uh, or even Beverly, have very similar concerns and, and similar interests in um, some of those immediate actions. I guess when, when we have that larger conversation, um, will there be opportunity to, to, I guess, apply a bit of a, 
a broader lens um, to some of the other communities and business districts that are facing similar challenges? Absolutely for the long term, but also for the short term. So in the area of micro grants, for example, we're happy to have those conversations with those uh, communities you mentioned immediately uh, if Council approves this strategy and th those uh, grants because it is not just downtown focused. Um, it, it is citywide focused. So um, if this strategy is approved, I would say anybody listening that it's not a downtown strategy, it's an all city strategy. And just on that, Councillor Salvador from the Police Service, the SOP we're working on absolutely includes 118th Arts on the Ave, Chinese business community, Macaulay, and the downtown because there's obviously a correlation in how the people are uh, mobilized through those areas. So that's absolutely on our radar. I don't think we can do one without the other, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, since the lightning round. So, um, you know, one thing I really want to drill into, one area I'm most excited about, or I think is most um, possible to have some really transformative change is in our crisis response. So uh, we did hear from speakers, and I've heard about this before, about some of those critical infrastructure pieces in terms of a, um, a day center, a sobering center, even safe consumption sites. And again, didn't, didn't see those um, considered in, in the funding. So just wanted to, to circle back and see if there might be some opportunities there to advance those really critical uh, infrastructure pieces that we need. Yeah, I would say, Councillor Stevenson, the reason you didn't see them in this list is because we got recent approval from Council for um, funding wraparound services during the day uh, to the two, I can't remember the, the tune of that, of how much money that was. So, um, you know, and council has funded quite a bit of those in base budgeting and other programs. And I think we'll need to con consider more of those, um, especially going into summer and winter. Um, and there may be other resources to do that. So. Well, maybe that's just so, so you're, are you speaking about the Bissell Center operating funds that we had approved? Yeah, that, yeah, that's one example, for example, recently. But, but I also think that as we further evaluate our encampment response and as we further get ready for uh, next winter, we're going to be having to to consider those things, and we have we can either come back to council. We can look at uh, uh, COVID um, funding that's set aside in financial strategies as well. So, bottom line is yes, I think we're going to need to consider more of that. But we didn't. We could have consumed the entire 8.5 million on that. We thought it better, given our wanting to support the strategy, that we diversify it a bit. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, I I think in some ways that 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 is such a critical need, but but appreciate the response. Um, you know, another key need that I've heard from, from EPS, from others in the sector, is just the need for, uh, you know, for doing alternative responses. We need those responses to be available 24 seven. So again, wondering how the strategy will build out um, an approach to, to expanding the hours of operation for our social service and, and community-based organizations. Yeah, I mean, I, it's a matter of resources, so we, we have recommended that in the past. That's why we keep on recommending those kind of additional supports. Um, but again, this gets back to, the I think, the more meaningful uh, piece on this is if the province would adopt our minimum shelter standard because then there would be some forced requirement to support those kind of systems as well. Well, when I think I'm, I'm thinking specifically about uh, crisis diversion teams or mental health uh, response teams. So, you know, for example, right now, I think the availability of social workers after, you know, 4 p.m., 5 p.m. is very limited. And if we are wanting them to intervene in more of these situations, how do we start to build that, that infrastructure, that service infrastructure? So, for example, do we have an RFP where we invite community-based organizations to, to come up with a 24-7 model that they might want to roll out? Yeah, I, I think it's about um, assigning more resources to that, and then we can do all that work for sure, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Councillor Wright. Hello, thank you. I think the mic's working again now. Um, so, uh, Mr. Corbold, with your framework um, where you indicate the, the, the full housing spectrum, I'm assuming that's going to be the bulk of that's going to be the affordable housing strategy, including the women's shelters. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe that would be in that continuum for sure. Okay. Okay. And then um, also still with the framework um, and, and uh, I think it was uh, Shalini had talked about the anti-racism racism and indigenous, indigenous not being sort of overarching over the pillars, but their own separate pillars. Uh, I'm just wondering, 
again, why, why, it, why it isn't an, an overarching consideration against the other five pillars. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a we we kind of went back and forth on that a bit as well, and uh, we had not received that that uh, thought until today. So, um, but but we had considered, um, you know, whether some of these things should be like we had with the GBA plus sort of cross cutting themes, if you will, across everything. But we also thought that giving those two uh, very important aspects of this. Um, really needed some focus and council had already pr approved, for example, an anti-racism strategy that made a really helpful pillar. And then uh, we've already gotten guidance from council to, to do work with uh, truth and reconciliation and come up with a, a truth and reconciliation action plan of responding to all the calls to action as well as the calls to action and the work that council's uh, approved to go forward on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. And so given all that process and guidance that we gotten from council on those two issues we felt the best way to implement it was through a pillar like this to make it very focused and tied to a specific outcome and the last thing okay, i'd say is i think i have a few more questions though and i'm that three minutes is going fast um uh, the indigenous framework framework impl implementation um are there any uh, federal dollars maybe tied to trc or anything that could be accessed we're always looking for federal dollars in all these areas. I think the answer is yes, but it's about creatively looking for, for opportunities. And the most recent one we're working on is, is working with the federal government on indigenous owned and operated housing, for example, as a, as a place that they could really uh, add value. Okay, and one other question in regards to the integrated call center. Um, what, what happens with the existing staff uh, in the existing call center? Are they just going to be um, transferred over to the new call center? That would depend on each agency involved in the, the joint uh, dispatch. So I, I would speak for city administration, fire, for example, and some of our social development folks. We would roll many of them over, um, many of which are all already civilianized. Um, and I think each entity would have to discuss and decide what to do with those folks. So it could just be duplicating a service within, within a new center? No, I don't believe so. I believe it would be uh, not duplicating, but um, coordinating better. Police, police are also in support of moving all this together, including ours. But I just don't understand what the difference is going to be then. Well, the difference is going to be in line with the task force recommendations, which is to, to make sure the focus is on having the right people in the call center who can answer all the different issues, not not just having it led by police or fire, but having all the right people in the center so we can dispatch the right folks to the right type of incident. Okay, my time is more than up. The, the technology piece here is a big one too, like connecting our systems together just allows us a much better response, a lot quicker. We have access to everything we need in real time versus actually having to phone four different people to actually figure out what we're trying to accomplish. Well, that's why I'm wondering if this is just a way to get the technology upgraded. But anyhow, thank you. My time is up. Thank you. Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you. And I was going to ask the same question as Councillor Wright, but she asked it so I can have my three minutes for other things. Um, one of the things I kind of see missing in this, and I I don't want to start to conflate issues, but I do see that, like, you know, we talk about anti-racism, we talk about reconciliation, so I do think it does fit in this puzzle somewhere, is a, around our approach to re COVID recovery. Because I know when we did the jurisdictional scan in the report, it discussed how some municipalities have interwoven some of that community well-being into a COVID recovery. And I, on, I wondered if we've considered flipping that and, and making sure, like, under the well-being pillar, for example, we've considered COVID recovery in that? I, I think we definitely are looking at this through a COVID recovery lens, Councillor, and uh, while we haven't articulated it clearly in the strategy, and, and I would say the reason we haven't put COVID in the strategy is because I hope the strategy will far outlive COVID, um, and so we didn't want to have a base in that, but I, we are definitely looking at it from uh, through that lens and the, the additional challenges that COVID caused. But yeah, and I would say by no means do I want it to be a pillar, but I would imagine that, like, for example, the motions and the example actions would be dynamic and change over time. So I would imagine, for example, if, 
if there was something around a COVID, like do we have a comprehensive COVID strategy as a city? I guess is the, the moral of my question right now. We definitely have a COVID recovery strategy and a COVID, COVID plan. And, and I think you're right. I, I think we'll, we'll continue to sort of look at the needs of, of COVID recovery through yeah. this. Um, and I think we're going to need to do the same with the war in Europe and th things like yeah. that. That will also have impact this. But, I, but I'm struck by, you know, often when people are saying, oh, well, there's so much more, the problem's gotten so much more worse. But when we actually think about from a systems perspective, we're really dealing with the residual of the pandemic, I would contend. I would say that's true, yeah. And um, not that we can't strategically, when we hear about the businesses, we hear about the security issues. But even in the report, you talk about, you know, suicide, domestic violence, all of those other things. And what we've learned is that the, the pandemic has actually exacerbated many of those issues, which is what we're seeing today, really. Absolutely, yeah. Right? So uh, that was just a piece of feedback in terms of somehow how we, how we reflect that and how, and, and even for me, I guess, can you tell me what that strategy highlights in terms of, does it include business? Does it include social? Like, I, I haven't seen that strategy for COVID. Can, can I just, uh, uh, I think you make a really good point there, uh, Councillor Rutherford. I just like to say, when we're analyzing our data with some of our health experts and data modelers and stuff, there appears to be a direct correlation with the uptake in overdoses with the shutdown of services, to your point. So as that opens up, I think we got to be mindful of what we actually need going forward. So I think you're on to something there that we actually need to ensure that we're paying attention to. Great. I appreciate that, that addition, uh, Chief McPhee. And we can get that strategy to you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chair. Uh, Mr. Koval, uh, can you confirm, uh, when I say that, and this is too normal, uh, can you confirm and uh, there's three strategies and a surfer for all strategy and anti-racism strategy and also this new strategy presented today and um, will be three and then we will implement it at the same time? Yes, but I would, I would say that we've... Uh, dovetailed the two f former ones that you mentioned into this latter strategy and that's because council had directed to move forward at a quicker pace on things like anti-racism and reconciliation than than on this strategy and so we've we've put them together now uh, so uh, in terms of the funding approach and it's my understanding and all those three strategies will use the same EPA's fund and from our financial strategies, right? Uh, I would say that some money um, funding these strategies is coming from that money set aside in the fall, but the bulk of the money is coming from our base budgets and or other orders of government. Uh, so in terms of this new strategy and present today, and as I understand this $8.4 million from EPA's funding and specific, specific stay in our financial strategy. But for the 2023-26, for that four-year budget, ongoing request is from EPS funding. Uh, that's that not been determined at this point. I think okay. that would be dependent on what other decisions council makes about police funding, which we'll start to discuss on Wednesday. Oh, that's wonderful. I, and then also what I heard today from speakers, some speakers have mentioned that they really want increase EPA's presence uh, in a certain community. And some speakers really emphasize increase some funding for our social services. But how we can balance in this strategy and to look at it from that funding perspective? Well, I, I think having a strategy at all allows us to better balance and coordinate those needs. And I think uh, we'll, we'll keep on doing that going forward. And then of course, follow the guidance we get from council. Uh, so our previous discussion regarding the 8.5% uh, possible property increase and the plus 2.5% increase and total already 11%. But by looking at the allocation uh, portion, um, I didn't see any increase and it is reflected in to increase our EPA's presence of services and in that tax increase. Can you explain a little bit more about that? I just try, I just try to understand how that uh, tax increase and could impact the EPA's funding increase. 
Um, I really think that depends on other decisions council makes with respect to EPS funding that will to start later on this week. Okay, my time's out. And even though I have a larger question, I cannot get an answer. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, starting the third round, uh, Councillor Jans. Thank you. I will try and be very quick. Um, to Chair McDougall, does the commission have a position if uh, the legalization and decriminalization of most marijuana was a mistake, or is the commission in support of decrim and legalization now? Thank you, Councillor Jens. We've not discussed that yet, so we don't have an opinion that we're ready to render right now. Thank you. I, I note in the uh, 2017 four-year budget, a lot of the police funding conversation was a trepidation about the legalization of marijuana, and I know there was more funding allocated for that. Um, I'm not sure if, if the chair can answer or somebody else. Has the Edmonton Police Service ever s had layoffs? I'm sorry, I don't have the background to answer that. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know if the service is able to field that. Not that I'm aware of. So uh, to the city manager, I believe through COVID, the city laid off over or close to, for different times, uh, was over a 1,000 employees, wasn't it? We had uh, temporary layoffs related to uh, services, mostly in the recreation area because recreation centers were closed, so we, we could not pay employees to be there. So there were mostly temporary layoffs um, on the COVID side. There were also some other efficiencies done through uh, the zero budget we had from council in uh, the previous fiscal year that did require us to lay off some staff, but that was not COVID related. That was budgetary related to the zero percent is my understanding, but I, that was before I got here. And so. just on that note, we did a bunch of efficiencies as well, offering packages and have managed our budget through vacancies as well. Uh, thank you. I uh, was wondering in the co composition of the items we had today, was a safe consumption site considered? Uh, I don't believe it was considered but I'll just ask if Ms. Ibrahim knows if it was in your, at some discussions. No, it wasn't considered, Councillor Jens. Okay, and finally, if my math is correct, of a $385 million police budget, this dispatch centre is only 0 0.03, like a third of a percent of the operation. And I'm just wondering how many efficiencies did the city have to find over the last couple of years by comparison, 0.03%, 5%? I don't have that answer. Okay, that, but yeah, I can, I can ask probably later. have it for Wednesday's discussion. Sure. Um, and then finally, I I heard Miss McBrien, Bryant, McBrien, Bryant, the, the uh, uh, our lead with the Downtown Business Association, talking about the need for a day shelter, sober center, etc. Um, had hearing hearing so such vocal support for that. If that was something to be considered. Um, what what sort of do we have a ballpark price range? Has that even come up? Has has uh, was this also something that we could look at? Yeah, we we definitely have lots of options for those kind of services. Uh, it's it's another piece we're working on, uh, both for the in support of the encampment strategy and getting ready for next winter. Um, and as I've indicated previously, I'm, I'm really working closely with the province on the data pieces for that to see if we can have a bit more progress on finding more spaces. Um, and I'm, those are good, productive discussions right now with the province, I would say. Excellent. Thank you so much. I think that's my time. Thank you. Councillor Tang. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, cause just to continue the thread earlier, um, you know, if I look at the, the motion I made back in the fall, it was really about, you know, the, the logic of the recommended budget items, uh, whereas I felt like when I re read the report, it's really about the pillars. Um, and I, you know, there's reference to the business cases, but I just feeling similar to how Councillor Peckham and Councillor Rutherford had mentioned that, you know, how does this, how do these investments in those 10 items solve immediate um, challenges? And one thing I'll also note, you know, I appreciate short term, moderate, and transformational change. Those are time horizons to me of when they will be implemented rather than the impact. Um, I guess I'm just wondering if you can speak to a little bit of thought process there. 
I think, Councillor Tang, the, the way that we approached it, it was from a very much like a root cause focus. Um, and so the 10 business cases that you see today were really in relation to the root causes, to, uh, not to solve all of them, but to solve, to at least help impact some of them uh, right now. And then as the city manager mentioned, we're also looking at things that are currently just underway that we can fund very quickly, knowing that we only have like seven or eight months left in, in this current budget, or sorry, in this fiscal year. Yeah, and I just add like things like the integrated call evaluation and dispatch center. Those are things that we've been tasked to do by council by by accepting the safer for all report. So we felt it would be it was important to be included in this. Yeah, no, I appreciate your responses. I think I'm just and Councillor Tang, if I can uh, add, I, I think, you know, one of the things you might not see in this strategy, but we're going to prepare for you so you can see it actually at, on Tuesday at Council, is there is so much work that's currently being done right now in this space um, that's just funded through our day-to-day -day operations. And we're pulling together the kind of immediate stuff that we've been doing since 2022 that is, that is ongoing, that Council has been funding, not as part of the, not part of the 8.4. Um, but that you've been funding throughout the course of the year that do help to solve some of those immediate concerns. Yeah, and I can see a, a, a system map would be really helpful to, to, to lay that out, which I think is also missing for me here. Um, I mean, just to say, you know, I struggle with that piece too, like some of my colleagues, uh, to, for making that connection and also communicating it back to the public. I think that's really critical. Um, I, I've, last 30 seconds, I do want to bring forward an amendment to this motion. I've seen no other feedback from the clerk, so I'm just going to read it out. No, don't, no, don't do that. I, I, sorry, okay. we had talked about uh, pleading all the questions and then going oh, to right. amendments, okay, right? Sorry. And I, I would do that, I would do that after. Yeah, so Perfect. I, <laughs> so it's maybe okay. we can it's start okay. fresh tomorrow. Oh, good. Okay, uh, thank you, Councillor Tang. That takes us to the end of our day, so we'll resume again tomorrow morning at 9.30, uh, starting with item 6.5, hearing from speakers on that item, and probably working through that to its completion, because I don't think it'll take very long, and then we'll pick this item up after that. Thanks, everyone, we'll see you tomorrow morning. <laughs>